Honorable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Mr President, committees have lodged proposals <coughs> as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The question is that the committees be authorised to meet during the sittings of the Senate today. Assuming that's agreed. <clears throat> I'll now move to the presentation of the uh, first annual report by the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force for tabling, and I hand the document to the clerk. First, I want to acknowledge and reiterate the Set the Standard report findings that an unacceptably high rate of people, particularly women, in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces experienced bullying, sexual harassment or actual or attempted sexual assault whilst at work. This misconduct is unacceptable and we acknowledge the grave impact it had or continues to have on current and former staff. Whilst we commend the progress this parliament has made, we note that there is still much more work to be done to achieve the goals we all set 12 months ago. We want to uphold the highest standards of workplace behaviour in line with what is expected of us by the Australian public. Since the Set the Standard report was adopted by this parliament one year ago, the composition of the parliament has changed. In the 2022 election, we saw the numbers of women increase as well as the numbers of those parliamentarians elected as independents without the support of traditional political parties. These changes to the composition of parliament have no doubt brought their own cultural change. However, 
the report's findings remain as relevant as ever to all parliamentarians and their staff. The Set the Standard report provided a roadmap for the parliament to implement systemic and cultural changes in a range of areas to make Parliament House and Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces safe and respectful places to work. Over the past 12 months, leaders from across the parliament and departments have responded to the report's approach to progress, the 28 recommendations. The Set the Standard report categorised 28 recommendations by just five outcomes. Leadership diversity, equality and inclusion, systems to support performance, standards, reporting and accountability, and safety and wellbeing. Of the 28 recommendations, six have already been implemented, four have been partially implemented and 17 are in progress, noting that many of those are ongoing measures. Implementing the 28 recommendations is a shared responsibility across Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces, including government, presiding officers, parliamentary departments, political parties and parliamentarians. Change will come with the continuous commitment and goodwill of members and senators. Today, we all recommit ourselves with concerted effort and attention to the recommendations of the set the standard review. Over the next 12 months, we should see the expansion of the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service to be established as an independent statutory human resource entity providing advice and training to parliamentarians and staff. The endorsement of codes of conduct for all Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces the introduction of improved health and wellbeing services, including GP services, pharmaceutical and mental health supports. The consideration of amendments to standing orders and conventions to improve levels of safety of respect and respect in the chamber, and the modernisation of the Members of Parliament Staff Act 1984 MOPS Act. I acknowledge the leadership and commitment of many people for the work completed to date, including the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force, as well as the Prime Minister, the Opposition Leader and other party leaders. The nation is looking to this parliament to show leadership in this space, and the, expe and the expectation is that we will deliver. I call Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the Senate endorses the draft behaviour standard and codes as presented in the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards final report pending the establishment of the advisory and enforcement regime and the final enactment of behaviour standards and codes of parliamentarians, parliamentarian staff and Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces and recognises the contribution of the parliamentary workplace support service to improving the culture at Parliament House and its role in supporting parliamentarians and their staff. And I thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak today on this important motion. Uh, it does a number of things uh, in terms of progressing the Set the Standard report, in terms of endorsing the draft behaviour standards and codes as recommended by the Joint Select Committee report, whilst um, the <coughs> formal and final enforcement and advisory regime are put in place. We also have the annual report of the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force. We acknowledge the PWSS. And it also meets the recommendation of Set the Standard to have an annual discussion about uh, behaviour and standards in Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces as recommended by Set the Standard. Twelve months ago, uh, this parliament committed to implementing the Set the Standard report and set out a roadmap for how we could lead the nation in workplace standards rather than lagging behind. On this day last year, the parliament acknowledged that we had a problem. We did not meet the expectations of the community, the staff who worked here and the parliamentary parliamentarians who called this place their home away from home. It was a tough day for a lot of people, but an important one. The reason we could have that conversation was due to the bravery of a number of current and former staff in particular who were willing to speak about their experiences in this place. 
The problems the report identified brought into light what had been a lived experience for too many for too long. Gender inequality with a lack of women in senior roles, a lack of accountability in systems for those who wanted to report misconduct, including appropriate redress. The work hard, play hard culture at Parliament House that had left some, particularly young women, vulnerable to exploitation and sexual assault, and high levels of power and discretion in relation to employment combined with insecure employment. There were 28 recommendations in the report, and we adopted all of them, as did the former coalition government. The, the Labor government has continued the approach that began this time last year to work across the parliament to put in place the changes that are needed and to improve the experience of all who work here and across Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces. We have achieved some significant progress implementing the reforms. Six recommendations have been implemented, four have been partially implemented and 17 are in progress and ongoing. The completed work includes the establishment of the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force, and I acknowledge those senators who work with me on that, Senator Farrell, Senator Hume, Senator Birmingham, um, who has also played a significant role. We've tried to agree on issues across the parliament, which isn't always easy, but I want to thank my colleagues for engaging in good faith, sorry, Senator Waters as well, uh, for this process. This work included support for the creation of the new HR entity and enhanced parliamentary workplace support service. The Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards has delivered a roadmap for the behavioural codes and standards, which we will consider as part of this motion. Government has completed a review of the MOPS Act and accepted in principle Law 15 recommendations. We have passed protections against age and disability discrimination, and Parliament has changed its standing orders to try and facilitate more family-friendly hours. Can I also at this point thank Kerry Hartland, who, chair, who was the ind independent chair of the inaugural Parliamentary Leadership Task Force, but who has moved on to other roles. Uh, but took, the, took on the job of chairing the PLT, which <laughs> is a significant challenge, I think, to kind of corral parliamentarians from all walks of, and parties across this place. Uh, but the PL, and the PLT is in the final process of appointing a, an independent chair to fill the vacancy left by Kerry Hartland, but I acknowledge the work that she put in place. Over the next 12 months, the government will progress in consultation across the parliament two of the most significant reforms in the review. The passage of legislation to enshrine the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service as the independent HR entity, and this will ensure that parliamentarians and staff can access arm's length and fit-for-purpose advice and training in relation to workplace matters. And this motion today appropriately acknowledges the role the PWS is already playing across our workplaces, and thank you to Meg Brighton and her team for establishing such a professional and respected service. We've also got uh, ahead of us the establishment of the Independent Parliamentary Standards Commission to support an investigation and compliance regime for the codes of conduct. Getting this structure right will be very important, as it will be an enduring feature of the parliament um, for many you know, parliaments ahead of us. And working across the parliament to get this right is an ambition. Uh, I think of the government and I think shared by all, all members of the PLT. Parliament House is a unique workplace. We want to attract the best and brightest here and we want them to have an enriching and fulfilling experience. So thank you to our staff for your involvement in this work and for all that you do. I truly hope that you have seen improvements in your workplace over the past 12 months. We want to ensure that staff don't work in a grey zone where they have no clear guidance about standards and expectations. It can be, a hard, uh, it can be hard in this place to work in our offices here but also across electorate offices. It can be an isolating experience for some. We have a shared responsibility to make sure people who work in this building and in other political offices are able to do their job in a safe way and where they are confident that the systems and supports are there when and if they need them. This remains our ongoing task to guide us and ensure that we deliver on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Senator um, Gallagher. I was going to put the question and then continue the debate. Um, so the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hume. 
Thank you, Madam President. And I also rise to speak on this very important motion. But before I do, can I acknowledge uh, uh, not just the good work of my colleagues and the, the entire parliament, but um, in the gallery we have the uh, chair of UN Women Australia, Georgina Williams. Can I acknowledge the extraordinary work that her organisation does in progressing the causes of women and girls around the country, indeed around the world? One year ago, this parliament made an acknowledgement that it could do better not in an area of particular public policy or in the way that we consider laws, but as a workplace. We acknowledge that we have not always done enough and in many instances that we've failed, but we've also committed to change. Everyone deserves to have a safe and respectful workplaces and all parties have a role in improving the parliament's culture. There have been challenges in our workplace, there is no doubt of that. We take the necessary changes very seriously. And in acknowledging the annual report on the implementation of the Jenkins Review today, I am pleased to say that the Senate is making uh, pleased to say to the Senate that we are making steady progress. This progress was started under the former government with bipartisanship, and the coalition is committed to making sure that this work remains about making our Commonwealth parliamentary workplace models a model workplace for Australia. And it's why we accepted and implemented the recommendations of the Foster Review, including an independent complaints mechanism, workplace training, and improved independent support services. It's why the former government accepts the Jenkins Re Review and committed to working towards all 28 of the recommendations. There have been concrete changes. Thanks to the last parliament, we now have in place an independent and confidential complaints mechanism for current and former parliamentarians and staff. We have a confidential 24-hour support service for current and former parliamentarians and staff. And we have new training and education programs for all of our staff and parliamentarians to keep our workplaces safe and respectful. The parliament made a statement of acknowledgement. The parliament has established the parliamentary leadership task force with representatives from all sides. We passed legislation that ensures that all staff and parliamentarians are covered by Age and Disability Discrimination Act. And thanks to this parliament, a review of the Members of Parliament Staff Act of 1984 has been completed and we have accepted in principle all of the recommendations. The Joint Committee on the Parliamentary Standards has delivered draft codes of conduct for our workplaces. Now, the work to implement these changes is being led by the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force, which represents parties and parliamentarians from across the parliament. And we are encouraged by the progress that has occurred in the time since the Jenkins Review. This work has been done in consultation with all parts of our workplaces, parliamentarians, staff, members of parliamentary departments and government departments, the press gallery and external stakeholders. We know that no matter what part of our workplace, no matter what office or in what role, you should feel safe, you should feel respected. It is encouraging that all of these groups are contributing and recognising their roles in promoting the needed change. As Commissioner Jenkins said at the National Press Club on the anniversary of her presenting the review to the former government, the parliament committed to all 28 recommendations and I am inspired by the real action I see there. What I hear when I visit Parliament House, quiet comments made in passing before and after meetings, in lifts and in corridors, from political staffers, journalists and departmental staff. Thank you for the work you are doing. It is making this a better place. The work of change is hard, and we need to remember it's painful for those with lived experience. However, with continued action and vigilance against complacency, I believe our parliament is well placed to become the safe, respectful and diverse workplace it needs to be. There is more work to be done, but the coalition is committed to working with all parties, independents and staff, to continue to make our workplaces safer and more respectful for everyone. This parliament should serve as a model workplace for our nation. And only by creating the best workplace will this parliament attract the best people that our country has to offer. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak in reply to the tabling of the first parliamentary leadership task force annual report and the commitment across the chamber to implement codes of conduct for parliamentarians and for staff. One year ago, we stood in this place and acknowledged all those who had been harmed, abused, raped, harassed, bullied, 
discriminated against or otherwise made to feel unsafe in this place. We recognised the hurt that had occurred, the toxic culture that had allowed it, and the bravery of those who had spoken out and forced a change. I said at the time that the acknowledgement was important, but words were not enough. I'm very pleased to be able to stand here one year on and report on the progress that has been made and to restate the Greens' commitment to implement the Set the Standards recommendations in their entirety. There is still a long way to go, but the momentum is with this change, and I am hopeful that parliamentary workplaces can be safe, diverse, inclusive and respectful, the model workplaces that the Australian people expect. The Set the Standard report made it clear that two major hurdles to effectively changing the culture in this place were the lack of a robust, enforceable code of conduct and the lack of an independent complaints mechanism that people could trust would take genuine action against bullies and harassers. We know that for First Nations people, people of colour, people with disability, the harassment and the disrespect experienced in this place or even online when working in parliamentary roles, is even worse. Sexism, racism, ableism, homophobia and classism persist and are even more damaging and dangerous when they intersect. Increasing diversity in this place is crucial. But that cannot happen without measures to make this a safe workplace for a more diverse range of people. I'm very pleased that we now have cross-party support for the codes of conduct that I hope uh, and desperately need to improve behavioural standards in this place. And I thank the Joint Committee on Parliamentary Standards, in particular my colleague Senator Faruqi, for their work in developing these codes, and for Senator Faruqi's tireless and successful efforts to strengthen the code, particularly as the only person of colour in the room on that Joint Committee. Senator Faruqi will speak more about the role that those codes will play. We welcome the amendments to the MOPS Act to strengthen staff protections and the independent parliamentary workplace support service that has been providing sensitive, high-quality support to staff and to which the government has committed to continuing. Within our own party, the Greens have taken clear steps to confirm our commitment. We have strengthened our internal codes of conduct and complaints mechanisms. We've ensured that MPs and staff undertake regular training to promote First Nations cultural awareness, anti-racism and accessibility. We remain committed to achieving diversity and gender equality, and this commitment informs our decisions regarding pre-selection of candidates, election to leadership positions and recruitment. I'm proud that we have a party room and a party with strong representation from women and non-binary folk, First Nations and people of colour, LGBTIQ plus uh, community, uh, regional areas, young people and people with disability. Our party is stronger as a result of this diversity, but even we need to do better. Ultimately, the test of our success is not whether I feel confident or safe or respected in this workplace, it's whether our staff feel safe and whether parliament is a place that people want to work. It's critical that staff continue to be involved in the reforms to implement to set the standard recommendations and feel supported to tell us when we're not doing enough. Staff consultation mechanisms are an outstanding issue that all parties need to come to the table on and that the Greens are committed to progressing. I want to finish by again thanking Commissioner Jenkins for the incredible work that she and her small team did to set out the roadmap for us to follow. She'll be wrapping up her role as Sex Discrimination Commissioner in just a few months, and she deserves to feel deep pride and the gratitude of all of us and all of the folk that work in this place for her role in catalysing the changes that we're seeing. Let's continue to clean up what has been a really toxic and damaging workplace, and let's aspire to actually set the standard for the rest of the nation. Senator Hanson. No, it's not here. Senator Pocock, we'll go to you. Thank you, Deputy President. I warmly welcome today's debate on the Set the Standard report. This clearly can't be something that is a set and forget exercise. This needs to be an ongoing conversation that we revisit. Uh, cultural change uh, is hard. It, it takes time and, and continued effort. 
12 months on, uh, it's clear that there is, there's been some progress, but there's a lot more work to be done in this area. As the President noted, only six of the 28 recommendations have been implemented in full. So we can continue to crack on with it. Uh, as a new parliamentarian, I welcome and reflect on the strong focus on safety that was part of my induction process uh, as a new senator in this place. And note that the review benefited from 1,723 individual contributions. It was wide-ranging and robust. And we need those contributions to continue. We need to continually evaluate how we're progressing on this. And as Senator Waters pointed out, I think the, the, the test is not how parliamentarians feel, but, but how uh, staff and, and everyone else in this, this, um, this building feels. I think one of the, the really important um, parts of this sort of cultural change when we're talking about sexual harassment um, is that men need to really step up and be part of this and be advocating. Uh, and I think that ties into the broader conversations that we are having uh, in Australia where it com when it comes to family and domestic violence. Men must stand up. At the end of the day, much of this, not all, but much of this is a men's problem. It is some of the deeply ingrained uh, cultural attitudes and uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't serve us. I think we, we all recognise the need to move beyond them and to have these hard conversations. So I really welcome uh, this place uh, beginning to lead on this and to set the standard and to show uh, the country that this is something that is being taken seriously. And I really believe that that leadership role will have flow-on effects through our communities. Members of my team were pleased to engage constructively and provide a comprehensive submission to the review of the MOPS Act last year. Uh, it was disappointing that the findings of that review did not have more ambition when it comes to addressing fundamental issues affecting the well-being of our teams in this place. Things like ensuring that staffing levels are set independently and through evidence-based decision making processes. Uh, when you look at the risk factors identified in the Set the Standard report, many are still prevalent here today. Power imbalances, gender inequality, lack of accountability, entitlement and ex exclusion. And the Set the Standard report's findings around the incidence of sexual harassment were particularly shocking. 54 per cent of the most recent sexual harassment incidents occurred at Parliament House or in the parliamentary precincts. 26 per cent of people sexually harassed um, in uh, uh, workplaces by a uh, single harasser were harassed by a parliamentarian. Uh, so while it's really encouraging to see this debate continue, we need to continue to talk about this, not just in here, uh, in our offices, uh, between parliamentarians with our staff. This is something that has to be an ongoing conversation and, and I really welcome it and I welcome the leadership that has been shown by uh, senators across the political spectrum on this issue. Senator Davey. Thank you very much and I welcome the opportunity to rise and speak on the Set the Standards report on behalf of the Nationals. As the Nationals' representative on the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force, I want to thank my colleagues on that task force for um, coming together and working very constructively uh, to implement the recommendations of the Set the Standards report. I also want to acknowledge the work of the Parliamentary um, PWSS for what they have achieved to date. In a very short time frame, they have established an office processes and protocols and commenced an education campaign so that our staff and our parliamentarians um, understand what their role is and what they're doing. I have already heard good things from people who 
find comfort in knowing that there are now processes in place and a trusted um, confidential complaints handling um, process that they can use if they uh, so need to. It is an unfortunate truth that all too often it takes an unfortunate incident to actually ignite change. But change we all committed to across party lines. And the Nationals sincerely want to work uh, on that change and change for the better for the people who work here, not just here, but also for our staff who work in our electoral offices. We often hear in this place the need for family-friendly work hours, which is to be commended, but we also must acknowledge we work in a highly unusual environment where we have people coming together away from their families for lengthy periods of time. So while nine to five might suit people who live in and around Canberra and its environs, some of us who are travelling hours to get here to work would rather spend the weekends at home with their families. So um, it must be acknowledged. The Nationals are committed, absolutely committed, to respectful workplaces. Indeed, my branch, the New South Wales Nationals, developed a very comprehensive code of conduct and complaints handling process well over five years ago, which we regularly review. And a similar protocol has now been implemented at a federal level. Uh, we didn't wait for this place to tell our party that we needed codes of conduct. We were already there, and we are continue, continue to commit to that. We are also committed to diversity within the Nationals. Indeed, we were the first major political party to ever elect a woman, Mrs Shirley McCarrow, OAM, as the federal president of a political party in Australia. And Mrs McCarrow tells a wonderful anecdote about when she was invited to meet the Queen and she was introduced as the first female president of a political party. And the Queen said, well, why do you think that would be? Well, Mrs McCarrow tells the story that at the time she just sort of shrugged and nodded and hindsight is a wonderful thing because as the Queen moved down the, the line, she actually wished she had have said, because I'm probably the first one to put my hand up. We were also the first federal political party to appoint a female federal director in Cecile Ferguson, who I personally know and admire greatly. But diversity is not just about gender, not just about religion, not just about race. We must also acknowledge that we need to have diversity of socio-economic and geographic backgrounds, a diversity of life experience and professional skills. This fo focus must be nationwide and must apply at local and state levels as well as federally. We always hear about the Canberra bubble. We always hear the accusations of a generic type of person coming into politics, former staffers, former unionists, former lawyers. But it is not true and must not be true. So as we continue to pursue and implement the recommendations of the, sec the standard report, I implore people to recognise that diversity is wide-ranging and must, we must respect all forms of diversity. Uh, I commend the report to the Chamber. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the 2022 annual report from the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force, which provides an update on the implementation of the recommendations by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, for the report titled Set the Standard. And from the outset, I want to thank the Leadership Task Force for, for the important work they're doing, and in particular, my colleague and friend, um, Senator Waters. We can never forget the Jenkins report revealed that a staggering 51 per cent of people working in parliamentary workplaces have experienced at least one incident of bullying, sexual harassment or actual or attempted sexual assault. One in three staffers who participated in the review had been sexually harassed. The highest office in this country, 
should have led the way on workplace safety. Instead, it was revealed to be toxic, cutthroat, and hypermasculine. A place where you're expected to develop a thick, thick skin and act like a man. The so-called rough and tumble of politics has real consequences for those of us who don't conform to these expectations. The report referred directly to discrimination experienced by First Nations people, people of color, people with disability, and LGBTQI plus people. These, these included daily exclusion, microaggressions, bullying, role segregation, and a lack of psychological safety. The underrepresentation of these cohorts is linked to systemic inequality and creates a conducive environment for bullying, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. And that is the reason that I pushed so hard for the behavior codes to explicitly prohibit discrimination, including on the grounds of race, age, sex, sexuality, gender identity, disability, or religion. I'm really pleased with the progress made in implementing Jenkins' recommendations. In November, the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standard Standards Stable Behavior Codes of Conduct, which apply to parliamentary precincts, parliamentarians, and staff. These codes, unanimously agreed by our committee, show that we are serious about stopping unacceptable behavior in this place. And I'm really glad to see that the behavior codes are being endorsed by this chamber and the other one today. The codes will set an expectation of how we behave here. How this place changes, though, for the better will depend on our commitment to changing culture. We must keep an eye on each other and call out unacceptable behavior like racism, sexism, bullying, intimidation, and also all forms of discrimination whenever and wherever it happens. I do urge the government to quickly set up the investigative and enforcement mechanisms to give the codes power to make the change so desperately needed and to hold us all accountable. I am heartened that other recommendations are also progressing, with particular acknowledgement of the excellent work being done by the PWSS, who have already contributed to making Parliament safer and more supportive. But there is still so much to do, particularly on diversity, and it is great to see that the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force has ample female representation. But what about diversity? The task force is not representative of this diversity. There is no person of color or First Nations person on that task force. Recommendation 9 of the Jenkins report called for a review of the physical infrastructure policies and practices within Parliament to increase accessibility and inclusion, and this must be a priority. The mandatory training recommended by the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards, including on anti-racism, disability discrimination, and First Nations cultural awareness, is crucial to challenging an entrenched culture of privilege and power. While the government has reduced the length of sitting days in the interest of well-being, and that's a good thing, we need to get better at sticking to these changes. Rushed hours motions to extend sitting times till late at night became all too common last year at the cost of people's well-being. They are also not in the interest of carefully considered policy making. Our parliament should lead the way in creating a decent workplace, one where everyone feels safe, respected, valued, where people from all walks of life and backgrounds want to come and work here. I want to finish by saying one of the most important things that I feel, to pay tribute to the people who work in this place, current and former, for their courage in speaking up about the broken culture which allowed bullying, harassment, sexual assault and racism to continue. Your courage is causing change for the better. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. Twelve months ago, our parliament faced up to some deeply uncomfortable truths. Truths which I'm sure shocked some people in this building, but for far too many people, women in particular, who work here or who have worked here, caused old wounds to sting. These truths told bravely by staff and former staff, by representatives, sparked change, sparked something significant. And I want to acknowledge their bravery in the work which has led us to this point. This past year has seen a lot of change. And I want to acknowledge the work of our Minister for Women, 
as well as the former government of Senators Water and Faruqi, who have all been working on this change, on changing this place and creating, or working to create the culture that we know we need to see. This progress is significant, with six recommendations implemented, four implemented in part, 17 in progress and ongoing. And I also acknowledge the work of the PWSS, which has also been significant in the short time frame in which they've been operational. The work of the Code of Conducts is momentous. It represents a significant change in this place, and so will the infrastructure that supports them. But cultural change is hard. It is not static. There is no set and forget nature to the work ahead of us. Even once every recommendation is implemented, there is no set and forget nature for this. And as custodians of the culture in this place, it is all of our responsibility to continue to work to improve it beyond the work of set the standard, beyond these, these recommendations to implement. On this anniversary, I want to particularly acknowledge all of our staff still working in the building, working in electorate offices, working across the country working to change our nation for the better, full of passion and hope, who we have so badly failed over many, many years. I first walked into this building as a very junior political staffer at the age of 18. I know, I know, and I participated in this review as well. And I want every single staffer who participated and who was part of creating this change to be proud of what they did to be proud of the contribution they've made to the work that we're acknowledging today and the work that is yet to be done. And I want to assure every single person working in this building as a staff member that there are many people here in this chamber from all political parties and across the hall in the House of Representatives who want to reward your courage and your honesty and your bravery with work, with action and a change to this place and to our culture which will make you proud. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, and uh, I rise to uh, speak on the uh, <coughs> set the, uh, the standard. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the ministers, leaders and senators who have uh, spoken on this uh, very important topic uh, today. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, those who are speaking um, <clears throat> similarly in the, uh, in the other place. Today marks one year since the parliament acknowledged the report by uh, Commissioner Kate Jenkins entitled Set the Standard. And that is what uh, we've been asked to do, set the standard. <clears throat> we serve in this place in positions of influence. Every parliamentarian works incredibly hard, but to be chosen by the electorate is indeed a privilege. It's up to all of us to set the standard for our colleagues, our staff, those who enter our workplaces and those who participate in our democracy. Speaking here today, and I want to address our staff directly, uh, and as I've said before, this is your workplace. You deserve nothing less than a completely safe and respectful workplace. I want to particularly acknowledge uh, the work of my colleagues uh, on the uh, Parliamentary Leadership um, Task Force, um, Senator Gallagher, uh, Senator Hume and Senator Waters, um, who all, uh, in, in this place, who all uh, worked um, very hard <coughs> in that uh, role. I should point out that I was, only, I was the only male on that um, particular <coughs> group. <coughs> Uh, and those on the Joint Standing Committee and those who uh, contributed to uh, the various reviews. I also want to uh, acknowledge the uh, Parliamentary Workplace Support Service for their ongoing work and contribution. We've made progress in this place, and that should be acknowledged, but there's more, much more to do, and this government is committed to continuing this work. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Much. Well, let me say that um, it says under complaints under this code, section 16, any attempt to in intimidate or victimise a reporter, complainant or to lobby, influence or intimidate the IPSC, its office holders, staff or contractors will be treated as a serious and aggregated, aggravated breach of, of this code. Sorry, I've been rushing. Um, I, 
I, I need to raise, and it's very important to raise this, about the James Ashby case that happened under Labor when Gillard was in here. He was sexually harassed by Peter Slipper, and this actually went before the courts. Evidence was proven of this sexual harassment. Under Labor, and uh, Anthony Albanese was up to his neck in it and knew what was happening. They gave Peter Slipper, because they needed his vote and he was actually as Speaker of the House, they gave him an unlimited cheque. They actually funded it and allowed James Ashby, where he couldn't afford it, had to walk away from the case. It was proven there that sexual harassment happened. They shut it down. Oh, his wasn't the only case. They paid out two male staffers prior to this. This is on record. Since then, there's a $4 million debt, dollar debt that James Ashby and his lawyers have accumulated to try and defend himself against a sexual harassment case. That what did happen. Yet, it happens in this place, and I saw the politics play out with Brittany Higgins. You have a prime minister sit there in the chamber, offer her an apology, hadn't even been before the courts. Everyone was accused of it, and nothing has been proven, and still it's denied in the courts. Walked away, but a payout is given to her. For what? Taxpayers' money. This is not fair. And you have not done anything about it. And I will be upfront. I confronted the Liberal Party about paying the expenses of James Ashby, which needs to be done. And I approached the coalition government. They actually have denied, re not denied, refused to. I think I believe my understanding is that the finance department left it up to. to um, Senator Cormann to make the decision. Senator Cormann denied, um, refused. Is it politics? Yet they gave an ex-gracious payment to Peter Slipper, and they have given an ex-gracious payment to Christian Porter. Looking after you, your own, but the fact is that they haven't done. And since then, I have spoken to um, the Labor Party about this. I've seen the Minister Farrell with regards to this. I've put it forward why they should be um, clearing his debt in light of the fact Labor were responsible for this. They allowed it to happen. They kept paying Peter Slipper's bills and allowed this to happen, so justice was not done. The evidence was there, and I'm asking the government be true to your word here in this chamber, and and pay James Ashby's legal costs, which he's entitled to. Sexual harassment, if you're true to yourself, then be upfront and and make that payment to him to clear his name, and give him peace of mind, because he went through hell, absolutely hell. And even to this day, he wears the scars with it. He won't say it himself, but I'm going to say it because I can in this chamber on behalf of James Ashby and the people of Australia. Is it because he's male that you don't do anything about it? Is it because you're a man? It makes no difference. You know, this has to come out in the open. And I'm asking you in good faith, please stand by your word. Please support him. And I'm asking Anthony Albanese, please, as Prime Minister, have some you know, decency and understand what you did to this man at that time, and please make sure that you give him that ex gratia payment. Does any other senator wish to make a statement? Minister. Thank you. I move that the following general business orders of the day be considered this week at the time for Private Senators Bill No. 30, Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023 today and number 19 offshore petroleum and petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment fight for Australia's coastline bill 2022 on Thursday the 9th of February 2023
put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clerk. General Business Order Number 30, Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023, second reading debate. Senator Nampachimba Price. Thank you, Mr. President. The Northern Territory Safe Measures Bill 2023, being introduced into the Senate, is a bill that aims to keep all people in the Northern Territory safe in relation to the consumption of alcohol and exposure to alcohol-related harm and violence. My bill was drafted in response to the calls from vulnerable community members across the Northern Territory and a letter that was dated June 9 representing nine separate Aboriginal organisations seeking urgent support from the Federal Minister for Indigenous Australians after failed attempts at, communication, at communicating these concerns with the Northern Territory Files Government. The Northern Territory Government's response to community cries was followed by neglect and inaction, all justified by accusations that alcohol restrictions were nothing more than race-based policy. It was only until the Prime Minister was shamed by Sydney-based radio programs did this prompt his fly-in, fly-out visit Shame. to my hometown, Shame. 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 which has now resulted in Chief Minister Natasha Files having to take back her race-baiting words and backflip on her vehemently held position, forcing her to create half-baked policy on the run. Senators, I plead with you to help me save the lives of those I love and those I am democratically elected to represent and whose lives we are all responsible for. I seek your bipartisan support to make my hometown community and vulnerable communities throughout the Northern Territory safer. Here, here. If we can save one woman from becoming the next domestic violence homicide statistic, we are winning. Here, here. If we can prevent one child from being sexually abused and left with a venereal disease, internal, physical and psychological scarring for life, then that is one child. But I know we can do better than this. Here, here. The last few months have been distressing and traumatising for so very many, not just within my own family, but throughout families in the Northern Territory. In the lead-up to Christmas, I was grateful to have the opportunity to spend the last few days of my cousin Regina Napodari Francis' life by her side. In the palliative care unit of Alice Springs, my cousin, only one year older than I am, who never bore children of her own, loved and nurtured other children in our family whose own parents could not care for them because they were either dead, incarcerated or suffering from alcohol or substance abuse. My cousin lived her entire life in a town camp and it is my firm belief that this life lived in a hellhole contributed to her bad health. But it was the last few months when alcohol was reintroduced in her town camp that her health took a steep decline, ending in her early death. She was no drinker and nor did she smoke. Before the intervention, she witnessed the early death of my uncle, her father, when one morning he failed to wake up after a long night of drinking. 
My uncle was not violent, but a man who loved us all very deeply. He was, however, an alcoholic. My cousin's brother was the same. He was a quietly spoken man who always carried an affectionate, warm smile. But she witnessed his life end far too early because he too was powerless to the bottle. My cousin's mother, now left with heartbreak and in ill health, regularly undergoing renal dialysis now, has the responsibility of raising the adopted granddaughter left behind. My cousin's adopted daughter, also my niece, had already lost three of her mothers, including her biological mother, before losing my cousin. See, in our Warpri kinship structure, your mother's sisters are also regarded as your own mothers. Her biological mother was killed in her mid-30s when she was mowed down in an alcohol-fuelled domestic violence attack by her father. One of her mother's sisters died of alcohol abuse at the age of 28. She simply drank herself to death in the same town camp before the intervention. Another of her mothers was killed in an alcohol-related car crash as a passenger. The driver crashed the car after her drunken husband punched her in the back of her head while she was driving. My cousin was the only one to die in that crash. My husband accompanied me while I identified her body in the morgue. Our family remember all too clearly the horrific conditions in town camps before alcohol restrictions. So I could understand when my 42-year-old cousin told me on Christmas Day that she was at peace and happy to say goodbye to the world of the living. I could not be angry at her for wanting to leave us all behind. Life in her town camp had become absolutely unbearable again with alcohol flowing back in. So when I speak to this bill, and I stand here as an Indigenous voice in Parliament. I am deeply offended when it is suggested by others in this chamber that my actions are nothing more than political grandstanding. My cousin is now at peace and my family is heartbroken, but my family is not the only family that is. The uncle of Alina Kukla, whose life was taken at the hands of her violent partner, along with her baby, told me he marks the day alcohol was introduced to the same day, the very same day that she was killed. So again, I ask your support in a bipartisan manner, my colleagues, to protect our most vulnerable Australians. The bill will introduce elements specific to reducing alcohol consumption and related harm, applied in the Stronger Futures legislation in the Northern Territory Act 2012. That ceased in 2022. The bill will put in place alcohol restrictions that will include declaration of alcohol protected areas and the development of alcohol management plans which will provide that supply of alcohol is regulated, mitigating illegal alcohol supply and providing a legal framework for prosecution. When dealing with addiction, the first step to management and recovery is acknowledging there is a problem. And those that are subject to the effects of addiction in the Northern Territory, the whole community, have been crying out that we have a problem since the cessation of the measure and lifting of the alcohol restrictions in the Northern Territory Stronger Futures Act. The bill makes provision for equitable consultation to take place in relation to alcohol protection measures to ensure that men, women, consumers of alcohol, non-consumers of alcohol, addiction experts and the Northern Territory Liquor Commission are all involved. 
The introduction of a requirement for an expert committee to support the development of each alcohol management plan will provide that measures designed to reduce alcohol-related harm and to improve quality of life are realised, such as monitoring school attendance and rates of alcohol-related assaults. The need for the introduction of the bill has been demonstrated through increased rates of crime, alcohol-related domestic violence and alcohol-related assaults. Alcohol-related assaults in Alice Springs alone have risen from December 2021 to December 22 by 54.6 per cent, and property damage has increased by 59.6 per cent. The removal of income management measures of the cashless debit card has increased the availability of obtaining alcohol for those that are vulnerable to alcoholism, and there has not been sufficient analysis of the impact of the removal of this important measure, we can see it for our own eyes, through our own eyes. The Australian government has a responsibility to ensure that the Northern Territory has consistency in law and order, and the punitive approaches are not taken by the Northern Territory government that do not address the broader context of addiction and alcohol-related harm. For a decade, the Australian government has intensely invested in the Northern Territory to address significant levels of need, specifically to improve the quality of life for Aboriginal Territorians. The management of alcohol consumption, reduction of alcohol-related harm was not realised within this period of time. This bill was set a framework of accountability for alcohol management plans to be developed with alcohol restrictions in place to protect our vulnerable communities. I have developed this bill over several months in conjunction with community consultation with relevant stakeholders that include drug and alcohol services, Aboriginal health services, legal services, education institutions, business people, community members both remote and in major towns and town camp residents. Despite the Chief Minister Natasha Files' letter sent to me just yesterday claiming I had not consulted her, I reminded her of my letter dated in October outlining my intentions in the draft of this bill and an invitation to sit with me and to understand what this might entail. I've had no response to that correspondence. My bill seeks to establish a federal and territory government par partnership in addressing alcohol-related harm. The territory government, which is predominantly dependent on federal funding, will have a role in overseeing the process of developing alcohol management plans while the federal government will be responsible for approving those management plans, reviewing the measures through the Senate committee process, and will have the power to revoke approvals of alcohol management plans should they demonstrate not to be ensuring the safety of Territorians. It is not good enough that the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory requires the Prime Minister to step in for them to realise they got it dreadfully wrong, at the cost of lives lost, and the devastation that addiction has unleashed on our communities. We are hurting, and it is disingenuous to provide ad hoc approaches and not take full responsibility for the sake of every Territorian. Senate colleagues, I'm asking you to take full responsibility with me. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I thank Senator Nampajimpa Price uh, for bringing on uh, her private senator's bill, but also uh, Mr Acting Deputy President for expressing her own experiences uh, with her families in Central Australia. And I do think it's important that the Senate hears those stories, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I guess in a lot of respects, um, First Nations people across the country have stories of such experiences to share. Uh, mine began when we wanted to uh, put in place in Borroloola uh, a call for an alcohol management plan uh, when I was in my 20s. And I remember uh, trying to call a meeting of all our different language groups 
with the Anua, Garwa, Mara and Guranji peoples and how the women, my aunties, my grandmothers, we called the meeting because we wanted the alcohol to stop and we wanted the destruction of what we could see happening for our children to stop. And so we had that meeting and it went well and people agreed. We talked about it on, on local media to, to see if there were changes in our community and if we could have those changes. But the next night, uh, when alcohol did begin to flow again, uh, we got eaten alive. And there was no doubt the abuse that we experienced is one that I've never forgotten. And so the alcohol didn't stop, but the abuse continued. And certainly the retribution in terms of wanting to stand strong against it continued. I spent the next 10 years looking after my mother, after the domestic violence she experienced from her then partner, uh, before she then went on to renal failure and kidney disease. And then I took on my sister's children, her four children, because of the domestic violence and the alcohol issues she was facing. I remember receiving the phone call in Alice Springs to leave what I was then doing, working with the ABC. And I went back to Darwin to take those children and to look after my sister who needed time to recover. And those kids were aged from 18 months to 10, 11 years of age. And I took them on. And at the time I was uh, reading in Darwin for the ABC News, uh, 6 a.m. in the mornings, getting up at five, getting the kids up, getting someone to help me get them to school, as well as my own two children, and making sure those children would know that there was a better way, that alcohol wasn't the way and domestic violence wasn't the way. And so I'd leave my car with a neighbour so that that neighbour could then drive the six children to school when I was reading the quarter to eight news on ABC radio and the kids would ring me from the car when I got off air. I'd catch the bus or the taxi in on the mornings because it was early mornings at 5am and at about quarter past eight I'd talk to the kids on their way to school and I'd finish around one o'clock, two o'clock and then I'd go get the car, catch the bus to my neighbours, pick up the car and then I'd go and pick up the kids when they finished at school and take them home, pick up my mother and my sister and cook dinner for everyone. And then I just fell into bed to get up again at 5am the next morning and do it all again. But you know, that's what you do because you know that alcohol is a scourge and you also know that domestic violence was rife. But I still had a job as well to try and put food on the table to care for the kids. So we all have our stories. And then my aunties, who was uh, smashed to smithereens by her partner with alcohol. We stood by her bed for the next six months as she lay unconscious, being told that she was never going to come to life again. But as a family, we stood around that bed, just holding her hands, massaging her legs, while she laid in ICU. And I firmly believed she was going to come through, no matter what the doctors said. She and I were born at the same time. She was only a few days older than me. But I was determined to stand by that bed and make sure she got through. And you know what? She did. And today, she lives in Borrelilla with no feet. They had to be amputated. Her elbow, she can't move because of the fractures from what she received from the hits. And her left arm is, is okay, but it's not that good, but it's better than her right arm. But, you know, we talk every day and I'm incredibly grateful that she survived. And we work with her children because her daughter's gone through domestic violence too. And her daughter's daughter has now been relocated with a good family living somewhere else just so that she has a chance. My other sister, cousin sister, 
She struggled with alcohol that her six kids have been taken off her. I've taken three of the children, so we're raising eight-year-olds and nine-year-old twins just because we know they need a bed to be fed, to be loved, so that they have a good education and knowing that they have access to a good school. And so they live with us. And when I fly away, my husband looks after them. And he's a school teacher and he tries his best to look after those three children. And sometimes my auntie comes up from Borrelula on the bus, on the bush bus, just to help him when I'm down here in Canberra. So I know only too well, just like many First Nations people, that we look after our families and we care for them. It does not lessen, however, the importance of process and the importance of governments and the responsibility of governments and oppositions when it comes to policy making. And whilst this private senator's bill has been brought forward by my fellow colleague from the Northern Territory, I have to say to the Senate that the Northern Territory government is doing what we expect it to do. And I have to say to the Senate that there has been enormous pressure applied to ensure that the Northern Territory Government does what we know they are capable of doing within the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly, and that is to make the amendments that are required. Did they do it too late? Have they been real slow? Well, I think we can all answer that, but they're doing it. They're doing it. It's going to be there. Those bans we want, they're going to be in place on Wednesday, right across every area of the Northern Territory that we're talking about. The difference here, Senators, is that we've also, as members of government, had to look at this extremely closely in light of the history of the Northern Territory intervention and the sense of disempowerment that also occurred across the Northern Territory. And I do hear what my colleague's saying about those concerns around the town camps, but there are other things, Senators, you also need to know about that people had concerns about regarding that intervention. And I am such a firm believer in democracy in this country. I'm such a firm believer in the empowerment of people at every level as flawed as we may be in our ability to make and enable others to have the power to stand up for themselves, we've got to always keep trying to get it right. And to step in over the Northern Territory Government a second time with a major intervention, not after what we've gone through, not after what we've gone through after 15 years. Now that the legislation of the Stronger Futures was sunsetting. <coughs> not one word. In April last year, I asked the coalition government, and this is not to blame, this is just to put on the record, I asked the coalition government, what are you doing? You're going to remove, after 15 years, a system where people have been made to live under, rightly or wrongly, <coughs> good or bad, how are you going to prepare them for the exiting? How are you going to prepare people for the fact that this legislation, once it ends, removes all of these things? What are you doing? And there was no response. And then we get into government. And did we move quick enough? Did we do the things that we needed to do? Goodness me, after nearly 10 years in opposition, there was a hell of a lot to learn in a couple of months coming in. And that's not an excuse. That's an explanation of the extraordinary amount of things we had to do. One of the first things that Marion Scringer, Linda Burney and myself did, and Pat Dodson, was to urge the Northern Territory Government in August to please have a look at your legislation to ensure those bans are in place again. We did that. We did that in Gama. We did that on numerous phone calls. And of course, we had so many other things to also do in that time period. Again, that's not an excuse, it's an explanation of timing. 
The Northern Territory government can speak for itself, but I want to explain to the Senate why we have worked the way we have, because there is no way, certainly Marion Scrimger and myself, would ever want to be setting up an intervention like occurred in 2007. But we will hold people accountable, irrespective of who is in government, as to how the process is occurring. To have Darrell Anderson as the regional controller in Central Australia, an incredibly articulate, intelligent woman who's got skills that go beyond all that we could imagine here in regards to those relationships with the language groups of that region is the right person to have there. And it's her report last week that made the Northern Territory government move to where it is today and enabled us as the federal government to provide the $250 million which we have announced uh, for Alice Springs and Central Australia. But we also know, Senators, that it's not about just the alcohol, and it never really is. It's always about what are we doing to enable people in our regional remote areas to step up and stand up. We know that we have issues with health. We know that we have massive issues with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and we must invest in those areas even more so to be able to work with the Alice Springs Hospital, to continue to work with Congress, which is the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation in Alice Springs that is currently working uh, on so many levels, but also with the FASD area. Absolutely vital that part of that $250 million goes to that, because the impact, and this Senate, this Senate did an inquiry into FASD. Please, Senators, I urge you to read that inquiry that we took across the country and the reasons why we see our young people, and not just in Alice Springs, let me tell you, impacts our young people across the country. We talk about the issue of alcohol and other things impacting communities in Western Australia, in Queensland. Have a look at what FASD is doing in those areas. It is not isolated. We're also, as part of this, working with the families, again, on outstations with parental concerns. And so Darrell Anderson is working on a number of the outstations around Alice Springs to ensure we can take the families and work with them, specific families, because they can be identified by the Northern Territory Police as to which of the families that actually need this support. And on a more broader, holistic approach, we know that we have to get the employment program going in those communities surrounding Alice Springs. Yindamu, Hermansburg, Papanya, Santa Teresa, Murujulu, just to name a few. We know that part of this $250 million has to be about ensuring that community development program where we're talking about jobs actually means jobs. And we know now, even more so, that we have to see the runs on the board with that employment. So, Senators, in concluding, I, I ask you to see what the Northern Territory Government is doing. This has been a traumatic time for the people of Alice Springs and the families of Alice Springs and the businesses. But let me tell you, as Senator for the Northern Territory, there is a better way here, and we are doing the best that we can with that way. And I know you'll keep me accountable if that way does not work. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak to the Northern Territory Safety Measures Bill of 2023. <clears throat> now, I'm sure we've all seen and heard about the recent scenes in the Northern Territory, and particularly in Alice Springs. And I, I just want to note that these are also the similar issues that are happening just in Malice Springs, but Queensland, parts of Western Australia. And I want to note that Senator Cash actually brought this to the chamber yesterday about it happening in my own state of Western Australia in the town of Laverton. So it's, it's not an isolated issue. It is a concerning issue, though. And there's an assumption in this place that this has risen as a direct result of the lapse of the measures under the Stronger Futures legislation. And what 
I want to note that whilst it might appear that way, it is actually a much deeper and much complex issue that, in fact, Senator McCarthy has already outlined. Alcohol bans will not address this. They will absolutely not address this. Too many First Nations people carry deep, unresolved and generational trauma. It's multi-layered, multi-dimensional, and it's complex in its manifestation. And alcohol is merely a coping mechanism for this trauma. It's about self-medicating. It's about coping, for which many First Nations people have turned to because they, in fact, have no other option. They either live remotely, they have no services or a lack of services that are available to them, and there's very long wait lists even there if there is a service. And maybe, like many in this country, they simply do not have the money to see a professional to discuss what trauma is. And the trauma that has been passed down to us specifically through generations since colonisation in this country, and it's the truth-telling that I spoke about in this very chamber yesterday. And it's in fact scientifically proven. It's called epigenetics. People need to be informed that this trauma comes and spans over many generations in our communities. Because at its heart, that is exactly what is happening in Alice Springs and in the Northern Territory. It's the impact of colonisation that First Nations people carry with them every single day. It is the pain and it is the heartache that you see on, on the faces of First Nations senators, in fact, in this chamber, all of us. Because let me tell you, that weight gets enormously heavy. And seeing the way our people are treated in this country gets even heavier. And we carry that weight every day. We are constantly dealing with family members, friends, cousins, aunts, uncles that find themselves in vicious and oppressive cycles of incarceration as the end result of that. And let me tell you, that gets enormously heavy. So if you want to talk about how we solve the issue in the long term, because that's what we're here for. We're here for the long game. Progress with all three elements of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Building more public and affordable housing. The state of housing across this country in remote Australia is disastrous. It's atrocious for a G20 country. Address the cost of living crisis. Raise the income support above the poverty line. And my colleague in this chamber, Senator Rice, will tell you more and more about that. Raise the age of criminal responsibility in this country and stop incarcerating our babies. Implement the recommendations from the Bringing Them Home report and the Deaths in Custody's Royal Commission. After 40 years, we are begging you to do this. Improve access to education and make it culturally appropriate. Make it bilingual, for God's sake. In some of the places where English is the third and fourth language, improve mental health care and put it into Medicare. Fix the Medicare system more broadly so that we have access to health services. Invest in justice reinvestment initiatives. And I'm talking about stop funding prisons. I'm not talking about shifting it for coordination. Stop funding the industry that is incarcerating people in this country. Progress on the standalone First Nations plan to end violence against women and children that is designed and implemented by our women, not under a gender equality framework, under our women and by our women. Fund First Nations-led organisations who are on the ground, in communities, creating culturally safe places for our women to escape and be safe and also to commence their healing journey. Basically, this just means ensuring that people have their basic needs met and that their human rights are upheld in this country. The solutions are right here in front of you. It's changing the legislation and the regime that my people have lived in under this country. 
And whilst I hear members of this place talk about how bad the crisis is and the clickbait that's happening, we need to stop talking about the need for bans and interventions. I'm hearing crickets, crickets about long-term solutions to address the real cause behind this crisis. No one's talking about that. Banning alcohol is merely a band-aid solution. And it may work in the short time, but you can't have these bans in place forever. That will not actually address the underlying causes. That will continue to not see primary prevention, will not uh, cease the intergenerational trauma, and this look of intervention 2.0 will not solve these issues in the long term. So stop doing that. This is a humanitarian crisis that began over 200 years ago. This is a crisis that stems from our denial of basic human rights in this country. Housing, employment, education, healthcare, land, country and our self-determination our connection to that country, our culture, our law, our kinship, and being able to practice all of those. This bill's top-down approach basically fundamentally ignores the generational trauma. It's absent from all of that. Dispossession, trauma, and the oppression that are at the heart of this crisis are continue to be the ongoing oppression that First Nations people face each and every day in this country. We need this government to help us commit to long-term solutions that are self-determined, that are holistic, that are created by community, for community, with community and with governments walking beside them. And this place needs to support those solutions. The government needs to invest in growing First Nations health and wellbeing in our workforce in particular. And it's that this capacity building within communities for those prevention and health promotion programs, our mental health services, and most importantly, our healing spaces. Communities are more than capable of taking the lead, but we have to let them. They know what's needed in their communities and we must stop doing the top-down approach and we have to start supporting and empowering them. Our communities need access to culturally appropriate childcare, education and also employment and chances to connect with their mob, to learn about and practice their culture and get back on country learn about their role in the oldest continuing culture in the world. Now, let me just let that sink in for a minute, because I don't think when everybody in this chamber stands every morning, they actually realise that's what they're acknowledging. The oldest continuing living culture in the world. The power, the strength, the resilience that's in our blood. We've survived what's happened in this country. But we also need to heal, and it's not going to happen overnight. I support all three elements of the Uluru Statement of the Heart, treaty, truth-telling and voice, that will progress the healing process in this nation. We need to understand that those long-term solutions have been talked about for generations. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Deaths in Custody we have our own commissioner who's sitting here in the chamber, Senator Dodson. Bring them home report, sat on the shelves of governments, governments, both sides of this chamber, for decades collecting dust. First Nations people in this country, if you haven't looked it up, are hurting. Pain that you see on their faces, but also the strength, because we are strong. And we can't continue to hurt people through developing legislation in this place. And this bill does nothing except provide a band-aid solution that won't address 200 plus years of trauma 
and in fact have led us to this place where we are right now. I want to finish with a final message. There's a wonderful lady from a remote community called Warakuna. Her name is Annie Daisy Ward. Annie Daisy came to see me in my lecture office in Perth and she told me of what is happening on her community, Warakuna, surrounding communities, Blackstone, Jamison and others. Annie Daisy's message to me was she wanted me to come and sit in her country on the law grounds, in the women's law grounds of her country, and not just to speak but to hear, to listen and importantly be heard, and to listen to the stories of what women, children are enduring there, but also the solutions that she has for that, that are long term. And she reached across the table and grabbed my hand and said, I want you to work, walk with me in this journey. I don't want you to go back to parliament, make legislation or laws in this country, she says, that overrides my law, where you can't sit on my country, you can't listen to my story, you can't come and hear pain in my heart and you can't help me to heal because that's what I need you to do. And I need you to take this message back to the parliament, that we want ministers, we want parliamentarians not coming in, telling us what to do, but coming and sitting and listening to our culture, listening to our law, listening to our strengths and our solutions that are for us. And I take that message very seriously from Money Daisy because she's a law woman in her country. She's a survivor of violence. She's a survivor of the stolen generation. But she doesn't see herself as just a survivor. She sees herself as a change maker. She has the ability to come and sit with me and talk to me about what's important. But she also wants to elevate the voices of women in her community. So she wants to take me by the hand and take me back into that community to learn that each community is different. Each person is different. And we can not, in this place, continue to have a top-down approach which oppresses people in this country. And that's what this bill will do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Se Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President and uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I, I am actually I'm very honoured to be able to stand in this place and follow uh, the three preceding uh, senators who have uh, spoken very passionately um, and with, with great empathy. Uh, they understand the issues, uh, they've been deeply committed to them, uh, to improving the lives of Aboriginal people, particularly in their own communities, for a very, very long time. And I've known them all for a very, very long time. Uh, Senator Cox, my fellow West Australian senator, uh, first engaged with Senator Cox probably 10, 12 years ago, I think, uh, when uh, Senator Cox was working in the health department and you know, someone that was really dedicated to working around the health area, uh, dedicated to uh, improving uh, the lives of uh, people um, that, that were obviously suffering significant health issues and needing uh, support. Uh, Senator uh, Jim Price, I've known for, for a long time as well, uh, worked together uh, before I was here in this place to, to see policies such as the cashless debit card and other uh, initiatives, um, key employment initiatives that would drive employment outcomes for Aboriginal people across the country. Uh, and of course followed um, Senator McCarthy and, and her work uh, over a long period of time and now here in this place. So it is, I, I genuinely mean it, it, it's, it is, it's a good debate that we're having here and, and I think a genuine debate and, and the contributions so far have, um, have brought forward some very, very important issues. Uh, but it, uh, it is also, also my honour to stand in support of this bill and supporting uh, this private senator's bill brought 
uh, quite sincerely by uh, Senator Nambajimba Price. Uh, this issue that uh, she's addressing through this bill uh, and the way that she's approached it is something to be commended. Uh, it's not just a bolt out of the blue. It's not just a reaction to the, uh, the, the front and centre issue that we have right now that's been brought about uh, because of the increased media attention that's now uh, on Alice Springs in particular and the town camps that surround it. This is an issue that has been uh, a long time in the making and Senator Nampajimpa Price first uh, raised it when, in her first speech uh, and indicated uh, very early on in, in her term since uh, July uh, that she would be bringing on a, this bill, uh, that she would be working on it. And she consulted and engaged with the community uh, across the Territory to, to bring it forward. Uh, because it was filling a, a gap, and this bill seeks to address that gap, uh, that that has uh, is obvious that uh, needs to be filled, and it's been, as I said, a long time in the making. Because this, uh, the territory government have had ultimately ten years, or successive governments up there have had ten years to uh, be aware and, and be ready for the sunsetting of the legislation that was enabling. Uh, Restrictions of alcohol and other things to to be in place, and so uh, and their their failure to address that and their failure to show any real action on that is what has required this bill to be here today, and while we're debating it. Uh, now, my my first engagement with the the issue of alcohol restrictions uh, is also not just some recent bolt out of the blue. Uh, in fact, in two thousand and eight. I was involved in supporting uh, the towns of Fitzroy Crossing and Halls Creek in, in seeing alcohol restrictions brought in to those communities. Uh, the coroner of Western Australia at the time, Alistair Hope, had delivered a report that where he had looked at the spate of suicides that were occurring across, in particular, the, the, the Western Kimberley, Western parts of the Kimberley. There were 22 suicides. Uh, many young people in particular, uh, many women, uh, people that are very vulnerable. And, uh, and he delivered this over 200 page report that was damning of all levels of government and, uh, and successive governments of many, um, many brands, if you like. And, uh, and there was a, a response that was needed. Now, you had some really powerful, mainly women, I've got to say, uh, and, and grandmothers in particular. Uh, across these communities that, that were standing up and, and said enough is enough, we've got to do something about this. And uh, I think of people like June Oscar, Emily Carter, uh, Maureen Carter, uh, there was, uh, supported by Harry Youngerbun, um, Patrick Davies uh, and many others across the community that, that were desperate to see uh, uh, some controls on alcohol in, in the town of Fitzroy Crossing and they successfully lobbied the, the Liquor Commissioner, the Racing and Gaming Commissioner in Western Australia to impose restrictions on alcohol sales in Fitzroy Crossing. And I remember uh, seeing that through the news. I wasn't uh, involved directly at that time, but I remember seeing it. And, uh, and I went to a conference in Kalgoorlie, and Emily Carter uh, got up and spoke about the success of their campaign. And she, she wore a, a scarf around uh, her head, and I, not knowing her very well, I'd assume that maybe she had been um, had gone through chemotherapy or something because she'd lost a lot of her hair, and I thought maybe she was in remission from cancer or having some sort of treatment. Um, and I, I didn't ask any any questions, but I later learnt that uh, she had lost her hair because of the stress of the fight in that community to see uh, those restrictions brought in. Just the, the, the sheer stress and the pressure that she was under from people in her community and the threats that were, that she said, uh, I, I learnt that uh, she had her own life threatened because of her advocacy for her community to see these restrictions brought in. And so the tremendous pressure that was on her it, it obviously had a material impact uh, upon her life. Now, as a result of those alcohol restrictions, uh, th things started to turn around in that community. School attendance went up, there was safety in the community. Uh, it was by no means a, a panacea to the issues and the problems that were occurring, but it, uh, it, it was delivering tangible results. And this is where I started to get involved because the, 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 the 
people in Halls Creek didn't have that same uh, coordinated leadership across the community. And so uh, I got on board and, and, and worked to help them to get the same, uh, same level of, of restrictions that they had in Fitzroy Crossing. In Fitzroy Crossing, it was limited. You could only buy takeaway alcohol uh, that was capped at, uh, I think it was about 2 per cent uh, alcohol, so anything above that was not permitted to be sold uh, within the town. And so that, of course, significantly limited the um, uh, limited the, the ability to be able to uh, you know, um, for, for the harm to to, for, to continue, and and Halls Creek were, were had were experiencing much the same issues as Fitzroy Crossing, and they were desperate to see uh, that uh, those changes. Now, I remember uh, we arranged for. Uh, the Premier of Western Australia at the time to, to come up and, and witness for himself the, uh, what was going on in the town. And uh, they were planned to be there on a Thursday, which was quite opportune because that's the day after the welfare payments hit. And Thursday was always uh, known as the, the, the big day, the big party day, um, and when it was uh, when you know, the town would really turn. Uh, turn on its head, and I, uh, the, the police commissioner of Western Australia at the time called Halls Creek a, a war zone, and he was criticised uh, much for, for saying that. But it was the, the truth. It was uh, it, um, when the welfare payments hit and the, the, the grog was flowing. Uh, that's when the, there would be the calamity and the, the turmoil in that community. And the uh, unfortunately, the, the, the premier's schedule was changed, and, and we had to. Uh, uh, was disappointed at this because he wouldn't actually be there at the time to be able to witness firsthand what it's like on a Thursday and a Friday, just you know, days after the payments had hit, and uh, he was coming instead on the Sunday. And by that time, uh, you know, it's typical that by Sunday things had already started to quieten down. So I arranged for a, a camera and a um, small little film crew to get up there and actually film it, film it on a Thursday to actually see it. Now, I used to be involved as a youth worker for a long time, and I used to be involved in things like schoolies. And uh, I worked at schoolies on the Gold Coast, and you know, this time of revelry and, and partying, and, and, and obviously the, you know, we've seen over the years some, um, some of the images that, that come out of some of those events, and it's, it can be quite frightening to see. And uh, so I got up there and I arranged with the police to be able to travel with them around on just an ordinary Wednesday or Thursday night. In, in this community, because I wanted to film so that we could show the Premier exactly what it's like, that he wouldn't just see the sanitised version of, of a Sunday or a Monday. And uh, I saw on that night, uh, just an ordinary Wednesday or Thursday night in, in Halls Creek, the devastating impact that alcohol was having. And we saw kids out at one o'clock in the morning just roaming the streets. Uh, they were safer out on the streets than they were back in their homes. Uh, I was with the, the police and we went to this place not far from the, where the pub was called, uh, called Dinner Camp. It's where a lot of the itinerants would come and stay uh, as they were coming you know, when the, they were from out of town and they were there in the pubs at night. And they, uh, 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 one gentleman uh, was, was run over, again, just an ordinary Thursday night, and his leg was like a Z shape, as, the, as his femur had broken, and was taken into hospital. And this was all filmed on camera, and I was able to show the, the Premier when he eventually got up there uh, to see this is just what an ordinary night looks like. And as a result of that, they put in restrictions on, on the sale of alcohol in Halls Creek. And again, it transformed that community. Now, over time, it's demonstrated that alcohol restrictions alone are not the answer, because there's other ways that people can uh, access uh, alcohol, and there's, and there's trade like sly grogging takes form, and so other things are needed. So I, I agree with the, the the presentations by my colleagues who say that you know, these measures alone are not not satisfactory, and not the answer, not the panacea to the issues. And so what Senator Price is is bringing by bringing forward this bill is is are effective measures that go beyond just the obviously the, the obvious thing to do, which would be to bring in the restrictions on alcohol, but to provide governance, to provide some more rigour over the delivery of programs and services in these communities, particularly in the Northern Ter obviously in the Northern Territory, 
uh, that, uh, that are necessary to be able to bring about the change that is necessary. Now, as, as I said, this is a result of 10 years of failure of the Northern Territory governments in, in failing to prepare and plan and put in place the necessary programs, the necessary measures that would ensure that there is a, uh, an ongoing uh, uh, future that, that was providing a future, particularly for the young people across these communities. And unfortunately, all we've seen so far from the federal government, though, is just a you know, bolt out of the blue sort of response. We've got Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister of Australia, who's just, you know, as soon as it gets in the media, as soon as it gets a, a bit of profile, he, he's there and he flies to, to, uh, to Alice Springs. Uh, and has a, has a response. But this has been an issue that Senator Napajupa Price has been uh, calling for and, and are trying to address, uh, not just since she's been he elected here, but I know has been an advocate for change in this area for a very, very long time. And it just seems that this government on this side over here is just focused on doing the things that are uh, uh, maybe popular or are driven by inner cities or uh, elites or driven by you know, academic driven uh, concepts rather than actually listening to the people on the ground. Now, a good example of that is the abolition of the cashless debit card. Just because some inner cities believe that it's a punitive process or it was ineffective, uh, they, they're not listening to the voices of those in the community. Now, since the abolition of the cashless debit card, we're seeing towns across Western Australia, South Australia and in the Queensland where things have gone backwards. We heard yesterday, front page of the Kalgoorlie Minor, uh, the, 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 the president of the Shire of, of Laverton spoke out against and, and said how things have gone backwards in their community and how the liquor store there have had to impose restrictions and close their doors because the increased availability of cash that's driving the consumption of alcohol. I've spoken to people in the East Kimberley and Kununurra, uh, and I've heard that it's going backwards there as well. The early anecdotes, the early stories that are coming out, the, the, the increased number of, uh, of youth that are roaming the streets because of the fact that their, their parents have got extra access to alcohol, their homes are not safe, and so they're safer out in the streets. And kids, of course, left to their own devices in that regard without that supervision are causing trouble in these communities. So I, I encourage, I, I, I thank very much uh, Senator Nampajipa Price for bringing on this bill and I encourage the Senate to support it because enough is enough and we've got to have real action to be able to tackle some of these issues. Senator Krogan. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I'd first like to express my sympathy and my respect to Senator Price, uh, to Senator McCarthy and to others in this chamber who have had horrendous experiences. And I'd like to pay my respects and my sympathy to you and your families and to all the people across this country who have experienced these hideous losses as a result of issues of alcohol abuse, family, domestic violence and broader community violence. There are lived experiences across this chamber akin to Senator Price and Senator McCarthy, Senator Cox, and we all believe that these situations must end. I don't think there's much dissent here for the issue that we need to stop this situation. We need to find the solutions. The difference is how we look at the solution. What we believe the solution to be is the fundamental difference that I'm hearing in this chamber. As Senator McCarthy has laid out quite clearly and concisely this morning, the planning for the sunset date of the previous Stronger Futures legislation was not undertaken. And that's not to apportion blame, but it does shine a light on some of the issues that I've seen firsthand uh, having worked in the Northern Territory for 10 years, including two years in Alice Springs. The structures we have in place are insufficient to address the deep, deep community challenges and the deep 
community loss and pain. But where do we go from here? We can stand and yell at each other across the chamber. We can pick up our own individual interest areas, be that age of criminal responsibility, be that prisons, be that whatever it may be, and they all have value, but they're all symptoms. It's not the root cause, and that's where we need to go. That's what we need to deal with in this situation. We need to heed the stories and the experiences that we've heard across this chamber and the stories and the experiences that we've heard over the last number of weeks, number of years, and I would say number of decades. This crisis is right now, but it is a crisis that keeps rearing its head year after year, decade after decade. We need better solutions because the First Nations people of Alice Springs and across the whole of this country deserve so, so much more. They deserve greater respect. They deserve greater solutions. They deserve a greater say in how issues are dealt with and how solutions are found. We must do better. I stand here as a non-Indigenous person, as a person who heeds the call of the Uluru Statement from the heart to walk alongside. And that is what I seek to do, to walk alongside. I'm an ally, I'm a supporter, and I have some awareness. As I say, I spent a long time living and working in the Northern Territory, including a couple of years in Alice Springs, working at the Central Land Council. I also worked for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Service, and I was the last standing uh, operations manager of CDEP before the federal government got rid of it. And for all the reasons that were given, we hear them time and time again. And I can assure you, when that program ended, yeah, there were some rorts, yeah, there were some challenges, but the vast majority of that program was doing some fantastic things in community, with community, for community. But this is the situation that I have experienced. I'm a I come from a research and policy background, and I see it, and I've been seeing it for decades. The solutions are designed in Canberra or in some glass house somewhere, and guess what? They don't work on the ground because they're not designed in a manner that's going to work on the ground unless you have the input of the people for whom the situation affects directly. So, from my experience, like I say, in research and in policy and in social services programs, I've seen stuff that works and I've seen stuff that doesn't. And the fundamental piece that, in my opinion and in the opinion of many other social science research and policy people, is working with community to start where the problem starts, to start where the issues start, not to look at the symptoms. And that's what we're looking at here. Alcohol is a symptom, abuse isn't a symptom. These things are terrible, terrible symptoms, but that's what they are. And so we need to be mindful that in addressing any issue, that we understand what the root cause of it is. And only then, only then can we chart a pathway to the answer. And in my opinion, legislating alcohol bans by the federal government is not the way. We've seen an intervention in the Northern Territory previously, and I know the pain and the suffering that went on as part of that intervention. Interfering in people's lives, leaping in from a great height to tell people how to live their lives, it's not the answer might help you with some of the symptoms along the way for a short time, but it's not the answer. The answer is to understand the problem, to talk with the local community. That is what we need to do. And as Senator McCarthy spoke so deeply about this morning, it requires a long-term approach with community. 
in my experience, short-term commitments, a couple of years here, a couple of years there. What we need is generational change, generational change of policy, generational change of intervention of a different kind that works with community. So I do appreciate the senator's deep experience and concerns for the Northern Territory and Alice Springs, Alex Springs in particular. I really do. And in everything, we, we need to focus on how those families are coping. We need to stem the violence. We need to stop all of the horrendous situations that we're hearing about. And there, do ne there does need to be a two-pronged approach. There needs to be the here and now, of course. There needs to be a long-term solution. And I agree. We have to keep putting women and children first, their safety first, the family safety first. We have to stop. I do not. I don't disagree with the problems that we're facing. We must fix it. But this bill and federal legislation are not necessary. The Northern Territory is already bringing forward legislation in their parliament so that the town camps and the communities revert to dry zones. The Northern Territory has recently made several announcements regarding alcohol restrictions. They have demonstrated that they are taking responsibility and they do have the power to act because they are the responsible layer of government for this particular intervention of alcohol bans. And some of those bans, you know, it's going back to pretty much how it was before. Um, and even Senator Price told the ABC on Monday that this bill was pretty much a carbon copy of what the Northern Territory is proposing. So it does beg the question, why are we doing it then, if they're already doing it? If it's a carbon coffee, then it's probably not needed. If they are the responsible layer of government, then it is to them to do it. The role of the Commonwealth is surely only when that fails on this particular issue, and that's not the case. The federal parliament overriding the territory's ability to legislate for itself is not the cooperative environment that we want in this country. This is not how we wish to legislate over the top of those bodies that are actually responsible for various issues. Um, I see the department officials shaking their heads, which might be a little inappropriate in this chamber. Um, and I believe that federal legislation will only disempower local people. They need to have their voice heard and they need to be negotiated and, and, and engaged with in a deep and meaningful and understanding way. So this bill from Senator Price is largely the same as the previous Stronger Futures legislation. And apart from modern drafting changes, there are two differences from what we can see. The delegation of power for the minister to an agency secretary or member of the senior executive and the inclusion of a review by the Senate committee at 12 months and then every three years after that. But alcohol is only part of the solution and the Northern Territory and the Australian governments are both working on the underlying causes of this community unrest, which, as I say, we need to get past. Obviously, we need to deal with the consequences. We need to deal with those issues that are bubbling up, but we also need to dig down into the root cause so that we can have a genuine and meaningful response that will not just continue to intervene, will continue to put bans, but will actually start to try and build a stronger community and get a better answer. Senator Price's bill uh, refers to an NT licensing commission, which is a body that doesn't exist, which may well just be a, a, an error in drafting. It makes the minister responsible for approving alcohol management plans that the community develop. And this approach would ultimately mean that the decision making for alcohol management plans are made in Canberra and not in the communities of the Northern Territory. This is in contrast to the approach announced by the Northern Territory, and they are proposing that community alcohol plans are approved by the independent NT Director of Liquor Licensing, which would then be voted on by the communities themselves. And surely having the communities involved is what is critical. To further disempower these communities, only 
leaves us at risk of further disempowerment. So we need community solutions. We need the right people in the right place to find the right answers. And I will say that I believe the voice to parliament will put us on a pathway to those better solutions, to a place where we can look to making amends for the hundreds of years of oppression, to free up the system to enable the voice of First Nations people to be truly heard. Intervention, overseeing, oversighting, all of these words bounce around. Fundamentally, the conversation needs to be had with the community. The conversation needs to be deeper than what just happened yesterday, the day before or in the last 12 months. The conversation needs to go deeper. We need to ask the questions. We need to find the answers. We need to empower the community and we need to walk alongside that community to find the solutions. Thank you. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. clerk. Government business notice of motion number one, standing in the name of the Minister for Finance, exemption of the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentencing Bill 2023 from the cutoff. Minister. Uh, I move the motion standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. There are no contributions. I'm going to put the question. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Minister. Uh, I move that intervening business be postponed till after consideration of the government business order of the day relating to the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023. Uh, Senator Hanson, are you seeking to speak on this motion of rearrangement? Um, sorry, I just I, I missed the um, first motion that you put forward, and I just would like to clarify. That, uh, that I was, was the one on the uh, government minister for finance uh, exemption of migration amendment aggregate sentence. Yeah, bill. Um, I, I would actually I, I just want it recorded that the Greens oppose uh, that. That motion. motion. Yes. Um, I, I obviously I'm not going to call a division, but I would like it on the record that no. the Greens are very strongly in opposition uh, to the uh, cut-off order for that bill. Do you want to seek uh, leave for a one-minute statement? Or uh, no, it's fine. That? But I'm just I want that noted. Thank you. Thank you. So now I have the the, the second motion, which is in relation to the rearrangement of business to bring on the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill in place of the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill. Is there any other contributions on that motion? I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Government business orders of the day. Migration Amendment, Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023, second reading debate. Give it, give it the did, you, did you seek the call? No. Okay. Um, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution on the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023 and to indicate the opposition's position in relation to this bill, which is that we will be supporting the legislation. This bill is designed to establish a consistent approach across the provisions of the Migration Act as well as the Migration Regulations of 1994 in relation to sentencing for offences. Uh, the opposition understands the need for this bill, which follows the decision of the full court of the Federal Court of Australia in Pearson v Minister for Home Affairs. In that case, the Federal Court relevantly held that, in effect, an aggregate sentence, a sentence for more than one offence, imposing a term of imprisonment does not in and of itself constitute a substantial criminal record within the meaning given by subsection 5017 of the Migration Act and, in particular, paragraph 5017C, even in the circumstances as it was in the Pearson case, where the sentence is to an aggregate maximum term of imprisonment of four years and three months in respect to ten offences. 
The court arrived at this conclusion, having considered the purpose of the mandatory cancellation provision in subsection 5013A to be reserved for the most serious offences, noting that an aggregate sentence might be arrived at after conviction of a series of lesser offences and taking into account the definition of a sentence as including any form of determination of the punishment of an offence, as well as the specific use of the singular an in the relevant definitions. The opposition um, will always be supportive of sensible legislative changes that protect the national interest, and we support the clear intention of this bill to confirm the long-held understanding that aggregate sentences can be taken into account for all relevant purposes under the Migration Act. Um, we have been consistent about this, and this approach was on display also yesterday when we lent our support to the government in re-designating Nauru, the Republic of Nauru, as a regional processing country. This was obviously a very significant error by the government, and this remains a very important pillar of Australia's border protection framework. And while it's difficult to believe that something so significant could simply be overlooked, we nonetheless undertook to support the government in the national interest and for that uh, to be redesignated. Um, however, in supporting this bill and noting our support for the redesignation of Nauru yesterday, I also want to foreshadow when we get to the committee stage that I intend to move an amendment on behalf of the opposition, which would further strengthen the character test by providing the minister with additional grounds to consider visa cancellation when someone fails that test. In outlining the reasons behind this amendment, I want to state again at the outset that the coalition will always support sensible policy changes to strengthen our laws to protect Australians. But we recognise here there is an opportunity for the government to strengthen them even further. Um, we've always supported a strong approach to ensuring that visa holders in Australia uphold and respect the laws of this country and should be subject to the character test to enter and remain in Australia. If a non-citizen breaks the trust of being allowed in Australia by being found guilty and convicted of certain serious offences, and if they pose a risk to the safety of the Australian community, then they clearly do not pass the character test, and so they sh should be considered for a visa refusal or cancellation. We strongly believe that holding an Australian visa is a privilege that should be denied to those who pose a threat to the safety of Australians. We have a very proud record in government of taking strong action to protect the Australian community from violent non-citizens who have committed offences in our country. When we were in government, we refused or cancelled over 10,000 visas under the character provisions of the Migration Act. Before the last election, we committed to taking further action to strengthen these provisions and equip the relevant minister with the additional grounds to consider cancellation of a person's visa. These amendments passed the lower house in the previous term on 16 February 2022 in the form of the Migration Amendment Strengthening Character Test Bill 2022. Notably, the now Prime Minister voted to support this legislation, as did the now Immigration Minister and Home Affairs Minister. So I don't anticipate there should be any problems with Labor uh, senators supporting these amendments today because the amendments are consistent with the bill their colleagues voted for in the House of Representatives and they said they support at the time. Uh, these amendments will provide an additional objective ground to consider refusal or discretionary cancellation of a visa under Section 501 of the Migration Act, where a person has been convicted of a serious crime but does not meet the current substantial criminal record definition in subsection 5017 of the Migration Act. Uh, these amendments do not in any way seek to undermine the courts or their role. Rather, they create a new ground for failing the character test based on the seriousness of the offence, which in turn is determined by the maximum sentence able to be imposed by the relevant states and territories. This will establish a new designated offences ground in the character test. A designated offence is an offence committed in Australia or in a foreign country, punishable by at least a maximum sentence of no less than two years uh, imprisonment, and involves, for example, violence or the threat of violence against a person, the non-consensual conduct of a sexual nature, the breaching of an order made by a court or tribunal for the personal protection of another person, using or possessing a weapon, or procuring or assisting in any way the commission of one of these designated offences. These amendments have been very well thought out, and importantly, they ensure that convictions for low-level crimes that neither cause or contribute to a person's bodily harm or a person's mental health, whether temporary or permanently, will not fall within the scope of a designated offence while also ensuring that any offence involving family violence is indeed included. Uh, we should absolutely celebrate, as Australians, the diverse communities that make up our great country and, of course, seek to welcome here people 
on all types of visas. Uh, I firmly believe, however, that all senators would agree that a non-citizen who has been convicted of serious offences is not a fit and proper person to remain in Australia. There should be no loopholes for sentencing leniency, and this amendment addresses situations where sentencing discounts have been given to serious offenders as a result of, for example, a plea bargain or where serious violent offending is sentenced below the current visa cancellation threshold. Uh, these sensible amendments will give the minister extra powers to be able to consider the factors in relation to the nature of the conviction, any sentence applied and countervailing considerations before deciding whether or not to exercise the discretionary power under section 501 of the Migration Act to refuse to grant or cancel a visa. The minister will have greater scope to determine if someone has breached the character test in deciding whether to refuse or grant uh, or cancel a visa. It would not dictate the outcome of the exercise of that discretion. Uh, our amendments will ensure the character test aligns directly with community expectations, that non-citizens who are convicted of offences such as murder, sexual assault or aggravated burglary will not be permitted to enter or remain in the Australian community. The government is right to take the action in this bill to ensure consistency in the Migration Act provisions with regard to sentencing. But we believe that our amendment is complementary to those changes that the government is also seeking and would only enhance the ability of the minister to make cancellation decisions in the national interest. And I commend the amendment uh, to senators, which I will formally move in the committee stage. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, this bill was uh, extremely hastily introduced to the Senate yesterday. It wasn't listed on uh, the draft program this week. And this really is uh, an indecent level of haste by uh, this government. If passed, and I, I say if passed, but I probably should say when passed, because we know that uh, the Labor and Liberal parties are going to collude to get this bill through will make aggregate criminal sentences, which are sentences that take into account multiple offences to impose a single total period of imprisonment, uh, as a legal basis for the mandatory cancellation of visas, including protection visas. The bill is designed quite clearly and explicitly to circumvent the December last year decision in Pearson versus the Minister for Home Affairs, where the full court of the Federal Court of Australia ruled that mandatory visa, visa cancellations on the basis of aggregate criminal sentences totalling 12 months' imprisonment or more were unlawful. So that ruling, the Pearson ruling, was a much needed step towards a fair and just immigration system that recognises the importance of individual circumstances. The ruling ensured that mandatory visa cancellations were only imposed for the most serious offences and not for aggregate offences that do not meet the 12-month threshold. However, as we've seen repeatedly in this parliament over the last decade and more um, under previous Liberal governments, the current government clearly does not appreciate the courts interfering in its application of the godlike powers under section 501 of the Migration Act with inconvenient principles such as the rule of law. Even without the bill before us today, provisions within section 501 explicitly exclude natural justice. So the presumption of innocence, for example, a fundamental principle of the rule of law, is upended. That is, if the minister reasonably suspects a person doesn't pass the character test, it is actually on that person to prove otherwise. Another fundamental rule of law these powers trample on is uh, the principle of double jeopardy, because after serving a sentence, having been convicted for a crime, a person will be punished again for the same crime by being deported from Australia, having their visa cancelled. So Labor might come in here and argue that it's fixing an inconsistency in the legislation, but what they're really doing is formalising injustice in this country by providing their minister with more powers to circumvent and veto principles of natural justice. The minister already has discretionary powers that can be used to cancel the visas of people convicted of sexual offences against minors, regardless of sentencing, I might add, and against people who harass, molest, intimidate or stalk another person in Australia. 
These powers can also be used against people who damage or threaten damage to property belonging to in the possession of or used by the person. Not only can these powers be used against sexual or domestic violence offenders, they are, with the, previ they are um, with the previous government often crowing about how many visas it had stripped from people um, for those kinds of offences. So this bill, in effect, further automates powers that are currently discretionary without any consideration of the circumstances. In the case of Pearson versus the Minister for Home Affairs, the Federal Court of Australia surmised that because the parliament didn't explicitly make provision for aggregate sentences to be a trigger for visa cancellations, its intention must be that section 5013A powers would only capture serious offending and are not, not an aggregation of small sentences for lesser minor offences. The court noted in its decision, and I quote from that decision, of course nothing would have prevented the minister from exercising his discretion pursuant to section 5012 or 3 to cancel Pearson's visa should he have been satisfied that she did not pass the character test. But the government is now letting the court know that no, it was in fact just a legislative oversight. Now this is the first migration bill that the Labor Party has introduced into the parliament since it won government last year. Labor promised to restore human rights obligations into the Migration Act. Labor also promised to address the circumstances of the over 30,000 people who are currently in Australia on temporary protection visas and tr transition them onto a pathway to permanent protection. Now, those are the kind of things that should have been contained in Labor's first migration bill of the new government. But no, we're facing a bill that's straight out of the Mr Dutton and Mr Morrison playbook here. Now, yesterday, Minister Watt had to come in here and defend the designation of Nauru as an offshore processing country when what he really should have been doing was coming in here and saying that the government is going to uh, bring to Australia the very small number of people who remain on Nauru and look after them here. Obviously the Greens think they should be kept here and provided a pathway or offered uh, resettlement here and a pathway to citizenship, but even under Labor's policy they could be brought here and looked after and supported in Australia while they are awaiting a third country resettlement. That's what Minister Watt should have been up here explaining to the Senate that the government was going to do yesterday, but uh, instead, um, sadly, uh, we find ourselves debating a bill that could have been introduced by Mr Dutton or Mr Morrison. Labor's national platform, page 124, says this, Labor believes the Refugee Convention plays a critical role in Australian law, referring to the Refugee Convention in the Migration Act 1958 is good legislative practice and it commits Labor to, and I quote again, reintroducing the appropriate references to the Refugee Convention into the Migration Act 1958. The fact that this bill is the first proposed legislative reform to the Migration Act is telling and concerning. It will bolster powers that already harm many of the most disadvantaged members of our communities, including refugees and people seeking asylum and victim survivors of family violence. These powers already expose vulnerable people to the most severe consequences, including indefinite or arbitrary detention, being forced to return to harm. These powers do and they will tear families apart. This bill, as with the existing powers under section 501 in the Migration Act, will disproportionately affect New Zealanders. And I, I, I note here that New Zealanders comprise nearly half of all visa cancellations in Australia. And uh, the New Zealand, um, the former New Zealand Prime Minister, Ms Ardern, repeatedly called Australia out on the exercise 
of these powers. One of Labor's um, immigration policies was a general commitment to do better by New Zealand and New Zealanders living in Australia on subclass 4 for four visas, which are temporary visas uh, without any time limitations. Uh, and they pr promised to do that so New Zealanders can remain permanent temporary residents that can live here uh, indefinitely. Um, they pay taxes in this country, they work here, they live here, they've built lives here, and they should have access to uh, all of the rights and social safety nets that come with permanent residency and citizenship. The New Zealand um, Prime Minister has uh, very clearly said do not, to Australia, do not deport your people and your problems. But despite Labor's election commitment and despite frequent posturing on this issue in opposition, unfortunately we get a situation where this legislation, the first proposed reform to the Migration Act post the election and post the formation of a new Labor government, is to provide additional powers to deport New Zealanders uh, and many other people to the countries of uh, their birth or where they hold citizenship, regardless of whether they have any family or other support here uh, in Australia or there uh, where they are being deported to. And for the around 100 people that had their visas returned after the Pearson decision and were released from immigration detention over the Christmas period, um, you know, it's a roller coaster ride for those people. <laughs> And it's a roller coaster ride that I wouldn't wish on any person. This bill, unfortunately, is an abrogation of moral <coughs> responsibility. It's a breach of fundamental human rights. It continues the ongoing erosion of rights and freedoms in this country that we saw under the Liberal Party and that now clearly many Australians are bracing themselves for under the Labor Party. We need a charter of rights in Australia and we desperately need it. We're the only liberal democracy in the world that doesn't have some form of charter or bill of rights. It is time that the rights and freedoms of the Australian people were enshrined in a charter or a bill of rights so that that can provide uh, a defence against the ongoing erosion of rights and freedoms in this country. No further contributions. I will call the minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I thank those senators who have contributed to this debate. Uh, the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023 will amend the Migration Act 1958. Uh, and let's be very clear, this bill is about keeping Australians safe, uh, and it's also about clarifying uh, something in legislation that has been a well-understood bipartisan principle uh, underpinning Australian migration law for a very long period of time, uh, which was recently called into question as a result of uh, a court decision that uh, occurred just before Christmas. Um, the amendments in this bill will make it clear that, for the purposes of the Migration Act, including determining whether a person has a substantial criminal record for the character test, it is irrelevant whether a sentence of imprisonment, imprisonment was imposed on that person for one offence or two or more offences. It provides the most appropriate mechanism for the government to detain those individuals whose visas were previously cancelled on the basis of sentences for more than one offence and proceed with their removal from Australia. Uh, to give an example of what this bill will help clarify, uh, a person who is sentenced for a term of imprisonment of 10 years for committing a violent offence would be found to have a substantial criminal record under the current law and would be liable for mandatory cancellation of their visa, whereas in the absence of this legislation being passed, if that person was convicted for 15 years on the basis of two offences, they would not. Uh, be, be subject to cancellation, mandatory cancellation, simply because that sentence was in respect of more than one offence. Uh, that is clearly uh, not what the Australian people would expect from their parliament, and that is what we are seeking to change through this legislation. Uh, the bill does not change or expand the circumstances in which aggregate sentences are considered for all relevant purposes of the Migration Act. 
This bill simply confirms the long-held bipartisan understanding that aggregate sentences can be taken into account for all relevant purposes under the Migration Act. This bill will also retrospectively amend the Migration Act to validate past decisions and actions that have been rendered invalid on the basis of the judgment in the Pearson case, which was the case I referred to that was just the decision was handed down just before Christmas. This is important to enable those decisions which were taken to protect the Australian community to stand. In this respect, the decisions made under the powers of the Migration Act will not change as a consequence of this bill. In fact, the decisions undertaken will be in a manner consistent with the government's long-held understanding and practice. Um, now, just before finalising, I must take issue with some of the things that Senator McKim just said on behalf of the Greens. Uh, as would be expected, the Greens have used this as an opportunity to um, have a go at Labor um, and to try to pretend that this bill is about some attack on human rights. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the, the types of individuals who will be affected by this legislation have been convicted of some of the most serious sentences available, uh, serious offences uh, under Australian criminal law. It, it's about people who have committed serious sexual offences, uh, kidnapping offences, a range of other very serious offences, uh, and to try to paint those sorts of people as deserving uh, respect for their human rights at the expense of the, the Australian people is certainly not something that the Australian government supports. And I'm surprised, frankly, that the Greens actually are, are questioning uh, whether those are the kinds of people who are uh, right uh, to, to remain in this country. Uh, of course, powers that rest in a minister to cancel someone's visa need to be exercised carefully. Uh, they need to be exercised compassionately. Uh, but we make no apologies for ensuring uh, that the minister of the day has the power to cancel visas of people who have been convicted of some of the most serious offences imaginable under Australian law. So again, uh, it might be good for cheap shots from the Greens uh, to try to pretend that this bill is something that it's not, but this bill is about protecting the Australian people uh, from those who have committed serious offences, uh, not just minor offences, very serious offences while in Australia. And if the Greens want to defend that kind of behaviour, that's a matter for them. Um, this bill deserves support from all parts of this chamber, and I commend the bill to the Senate. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
dos. Senators, the question is that the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill of 2023 be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt, tell her for the ayes. Senator McKim, tell her for the noes. There being 39 ayes and 11 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. 
Uh, Senator Patterson has foreshadowed a committee stage, so after the clerk has read the bill, we will be moving to committee stage. I will request that senators who are not participating in that leave the chamber quietly. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 to provide for the treatment of aggregate sentences and for related purposes. Senators not participating in the committee stage, please leave the chamber quietly. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is the bill be stand. Sorry, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I foreshadowed in my second reading speech on this bill, the opposition is supporting this legislation. Um, we recognise the importance of it following the decision of the full federal court in the Pearson case, and I agree with the minister that this is a long-standing bipartisan understood position in relation to aggregate sentences, and it's important that the original intent of the parliament in legislating these provisions be reflected by updating the legislation, given the court case. Um, having said that, um, we believe this is also an opportunity to extend the protections to Australians from people on visas who commit violent offences even further. And consistent with the bill that was brought to the House uh, in February last year, uh, the Strengthening the Character Test Bill, introduced by the former government and supported by, at the time by the then Labor opposition, um, we believe that the minister sh should have additional powers. Um, it, is, it will not be compulsory for the minister to exercise these powers. It will be up to the judgment of the minister, um, but it will widen the scope of the minister's power to protect Australians from people who commit, commit very serious sentence, very serious crimes but receive shorter sentences than are currently captured by the Act. And just to be clear about the, uh, the style of the offences that will be captured, it includes violence or the threat of violence against a person, non-consensual conduct of a sexual nature, breaching an order made by a court or tribunal for the personal protection of another person, using or possessing a weapon, or procuring, assisting in any way in the commission of any of these designated offences. Um, on any reading and any plain understanding of the law, I think all Australians agree these are very serious offences, and it should be an option for the Minister for Immigration to cancel the visas of people who commit these offences or indeed refuse an application for a visa for someone to come to this country who has committed these offences. Um, uh, so we could, we'll be moving these amendments. Um, uh, in doing so, I note that um, uh, the, then prime, the then opposition leader, now Prime Minister, uh, the, the now Immigration Minister and the now Minister for Home Affairs all voted for this in the lower house, so I don't anticipate there will be any problems uh, from Labor senators supporting these amendments here today, um, which will only uh, naturally extend the powers that they're seeking to retain for the minister. Um, and, and so with that, I move the amendments on sheet 1807, and I believe I have to seek leave that they be moved together. There's only one amendment, so um, I think that is fine. Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Well, the opposition today has moved a series of amendments that were not a priority for them in ten government. In, in government, I mean, they only had nearly ten years to do so. Uh, if they were a priority for what is now the opposition, they would have passed them when they were actually had the power to do so for any one of the nearly ten years that they were in office. Um, in fact, uh, after the then government finally got around to introducing amendments of this kind. Uh, they had four years, three immigration ministers, uh, to, do, to, to progress them, and they sent the bill where these amendments uh, now come from through three Senate inquiries. So the, the now opposition had ample opportunity uh, to do this at any point while they were in government and chose not to do so and not to make it a priority, but all of a sudden they have decided they are a priority. The Australian community has a reasonable expectation that non-citizens who seek to enter or remain in Australia are of good character and are law-abiding. That is a reasonable expectation from the Australian community. And similarly, Australians expect that any non-citizens who are not of good character will be refused a visa or have any visa they hold cancelled. That is a logical conclusion uh, that Australians would make. 
This bill does not change the framework within which the character test operates. It allows for the continued effective administration of the powers in the Migration Act by ensuring that aggregate sentences are considered sentences, thereby restoring the ability to rely on substantial criminal record as an objective measure for the purpose of the character test. This government is taking urgent common sense action in response to a recent court decision in order to keep our community safe. We're not here to debate the broader character framework. We're here to clarify the powers in the Migration Act. For those reasons, we will be opposing the amendments and the opportunistic politics of those opposite. Senator Patterson. Uh, Chair, I don't seek to extend this debate any more than is necessary because I do understand the time sensitivity and we want to ensure this uh, bill passes. But I do have to correct the record in relation to the minister's claims, who said that this wasn't a priority for the previous government and that we didn't uh, pass it in our previous nine years in office. In fact, it was put to the parliament a number of times in the previous term, first in September 2019, second in October 2021 and third in February 2022. The reason why it was not successful in achieving passage in September 2019 or October 2021 was that the Labor Party and the Greens voted together to oppose uh, the, the bills on those occasions. And it wasn't until February 2022 that they then finally decided to change their position and support it, and they voted for it in the House of Representatives. But obviously that was on the eve of the election, and there wasn't time for the Senate to consider and conclude this matter before the election. So at the next available opportunity being now, we are bringing this forward again because we have a long-standing commitment to this. It's one that we now share with the Labor Party, given their vote for this bill, when they had the opportunity to in the House of Representatives in February, and I encourage them to consider supporting it. Are there any further contributions? Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I just want to ask the, um, the government a question on this. In regards to the amendment put up by, the, by Senator Patterson, it states here in 4.3 um, um, which one am I looking at? In for the for offence in another country, a foreign offence in another country. Um, yeah, C. For an offence against the law in force in a foreign country, if it were assumed that the act or omission con constituting the offence had taken place in the Australian Capital Territory, um, this asks, begs the question: Is that you have all the people on detention centre in Nauru that are actually wanting to come to Australia, which they haven't been allowed to, because they haven't passed the test, you know, for, for character. A lot of these people we know have destroyed their identification and we don't know who they are. So therefore, these people, if we don't know who they are, and some have actually got through the system to actually be given citizenship, but where do you stand then if you can't find out the particulars of who they really are? Have they committed an offence in a foreign country and therefore will the government uphold the fact is that they should not be allowed to get the citizenship? Uh, I just want to know how the government tends to deal with this of people you cannot really identify that now the Greens are pushing Labor to allow these people from Nauru to come to Australia and give them residency but you can't satisfy the, the Australian people of their character and if any criminal offences have been committed in their own country, how is the government going to address this? Minister. Um, thanks, Deputy President. Uh, Senator Hanson, the, the issues that you've raised uh, aren't relevant to this legislation. I would be happy to arrange for information answering your questions to be provided to you by the Minister's office, um, but because those issues aren't relevant to this legislation. I don't have uh, the briefing material to address it. But just a couple of points I would make in response to your, um, your points. I think at one point you said that people uh, who are currently um, are on Nauru have been granted citizenship. To my knowledge, that hasn't occurred um, with any of those people, um, that they've been granted Australian citizenship. Um, and uh, sim and uh, as for the claim um, that our government um, is in league with the Greens to bring these people to Australia, in actual fact, we, ha we have significantly reduced the number of people on Nauru, which I think is a good thing because they have been there a very, very long time. But the way that has largely been done has been through resettlement in other countries rather than in Australia. So just a couple of factual 
issues that I wanted to correct. And as I say, I'm happy to arrange for information to be provided to you to address the, the questions that you're asking. Senator Hanson. In your bill, you're suggesting that people that have actually had um, a 12-month um, sentence by the courts, is that correct, that a 12-month sentence, uh, that they're not of good character to actually become Australian citizens or permanent residents in Australia? No, no. Oh, Senator Hanson, what this bill um, is doing, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a um, simple bill that's very focused on one issue in particular. And that is um, that uh, there was a court decision handed down just before Christmas, um, which effectively overturned what had been understood to be the law in Australia on one point, and that is um, related to the Minister of the Day's power to cancel the visa of someone who had failed the character test because they had a substantial criminal record. What had always been understood, and, and being the representing minister, I'm giving you the best information I understand, and someone will tell me if I get this wrong, but um, what the Australian law had always been understood to be was that uh, if someone had been convicted of a number of offences um, and had an overall sentence or an aggregate sentence of more than 12 months, um, then they could have their visa cancelled. The decision that the court handed down just before Christmas basically said that you had that the person had to have a conviction for one offence that led to a sentence for that offence of more than 12 months, and then they could have their visa cancelled. But, for instance, if someone was convicted of two separate offences, two different offences, um, that had a combined sentence of more than 12 months, then they couldn't have their visa cancelled. Um, so. That was different to what the Australian law had always been understood to be, whether it be a coalition government or a Labor government. And so what we're seeking to do through this bill is to clarify that point so that um, if, the minister, if there's a particular person who has been convicted um, of a number of offences where the, the total sentence sentences are more than 12 months, then they can have their visa cancelled. That's what this bill is about. Not, not about granting someone citizenship. It's actually about giving ministers power to deport people effectively rather than keep them in the country. Senator Hanson. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you explained that to me. And uh, on that basis, um, I think it's a good move by the government to actually look at it, that to combine the sentences together because they're re-offenders. And also another fact is that what I, I've led to be, uh, how I've been told, is that the court system, if they know that that person could be deported of a 12-month jail term or more, they are actually um, giving them a lenient sentence of 11 months so that they can't be deported by the minister. So that is actually what I have personally heard and have been told. So, if you're going to, in this bill, what you've just said is that combined sentences added together is going to give the minister the ability to actually look at deporting these reoffenders in Australia, well then um, it will be a good thing for the Australian people. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks, Minister. Could you um, inform the Senate, if you're able, please? Uh, how many people were reissued with visas post the Pearson decision, um, and whether uh, the minister, in fact, has already cancelled a number of those visas using powers under 5013B of the Migration Act, and if so, how many people uh, have had reissued visas cancelled and therefore have been re-detained and re-traumatised um, by the government. Minister. Um, Senator McKim, I may have to take on notice the exact numbers uh, that you're seeking, but I do know that the minister has cancelled some visas uh, of people since the decision uh, in Pearson uh, effectively resulted in them having a, a visa reissued. That's obviously not exactly what happened, but that's the practical effect. But again, 
to your claims, which I know you keep making, that this government is traumatising people, can we keep this in perspective? We are talking about we are the, we are only talking here about people who have been convicted of some of the most serious offences under Australian criminal law: sexual assault, kidnapping, serious assaults. Uh, and as I said earlier, I'm surprised that the Greens um, think that there's something wrong with a minister from any government deciding that those are not ap appropriate people to stay in Australia. I'm surprised that the Greens think um, that Australians support the idea of people who come to our country, um, commit serious sexual assaults, kidnap people, commit serious assaults, that they are people who should remain in, that, in our country. But that seems to be the Greens' position. So we're not, I, don't, I reject this accusation that we are traumatising people that we're the big bad government picking on poor defenceless people these are people who've convicted who've been convicted of extremely serious offenses and i don't think they should stay in our country we're not talking about minor offenses we're not talking about shoplifting we're not talking about you know um, traffic offenses we're talking about people who have committed serious sexual assaults kidnapped people been convicted of it uh, and in some cases been been sentenced to very long periods of time which for peculiarities of the law were aggregate sentences, and I don't make any apologies for those people losing the right to stay in Australia. Senator McKim. Yeah, well, um, firstly, I'd just urge um, senators and anyone who might be listening uh, to this broadcast that Senator Watt is an unreliable witness in terms of the Greens' position on matters, and uh, he can make uh, all of the allegations about what we're saying uh, that he likes. He can draw all of the long bows uh, that he likes. But uh, if I was, um, if the Senator Watt was a witness in uh, a case that I was legal counsel for, I'd be applying to have him declared as uh, as a hostile witness. And, uh, and I just urge people that uh, if if uh, it really, if um, if they want to know what the Greens think, I'm happy for them to take my words. Uh, as a member of the Greens, what the Greens think, and uh, not to uh, not to take Senator Watt's word for it. Look, I guess um, well, the point I'd make. Senator McKim, can just resume your seat. Interjections under Standing Order 197 are disorderly, and Senator McKim, you are welcome to defend the Greens' position, but personal reflections are out of order. You have the call. Thank you for your wise ruling, Chair. Um, I, I, first. Request I'd ask a minute, what, Minister Watt if he's able to take the questions I asked on notice. He's, um, he's, convert, he's responded to some of them at a, uh, at a general level and accepted the, the general proposition that I made, which is that the ministers used pow uh, existing powers under the Migration Act to, um, to cancel uh, visas that were reissued post uh, the Pearson case and therefore um, bring people back into detention. If the minister could commit to providing the numbers, that I asked for in my original question, if you could come back on notice and provide those, uh, I, I'd, um, I'd appreciate that um, from the minister. The second uh, point I'd make um, is that uh, if um, the courts agreed about the seriousness of uh, these offences, then the people would have been sentenced to more than 12 months imprisonment and the minister uh, would have had the right to, uh, to cancel their visas under existing powers. So, um, I, I genuinely don't think that, uh, that Minister Watt's argument um, stacks up in any way. Now, um, thirdly, uh, I, I would like to, um, to make the point um, that the about 100 people um, who were uh, released post the Pearson case, that is, they had visas uh, reissued um, to them, and who are now liable, should this bill pass, to be um, re-detained, include refugees and stateless people. Now, you want to say, uh, Senator Watt wants to say, that the Greens' arguments around human rights that I made in my second reading speech uh, are spurious. They are not spurious arguments. Like a lot of the, and I won't, I'm not going to be hectored Order. by Senator Hanson, who has no idea what she's talking about on this issue, and he's just yet again demonstrating how she wants to punch down on migrants in this country that she has built a political career in doing. I'm not going to be hectored by a racist senator like Order. Senator Hanson. Senator, on this. Senator McKim, please resume your seat. That was a personal reflection which was uncalled for. You were with. Draw that mark about Senator Hanson. I withdraw. So the point I'm making is that um, 
uh, the people who were um, released post the Pearson decision and are liable to be uh, re-detained include refugees and stateless people. Many of these people have been uh, in indefinite immigration detention for long periods of time, many years. In some cases, they are often people with severe trauma backgrounds who are extremely vulnerable. Now, um, the minister has just admitted that the immigration minister has already cancelled a number of visas that were revived by the Pearson decision under section 5013B. So the process to target the so-called worse offenders is already underway using existing powers of the Migration Act. There is no need for this bill. I want to um, raise a couple of specific circumstances of people that are going to be impacted by this bill. And of course, I'm not going to talk about um, people's names or in any way identify them. But um, there is um, one person who is a refugee who has uh, trauma-induced psychosis and has been described as one of the most mentally ill people his social workers have ever engaged with. Now, that person should be treated for health conditions, not placed punitively into immigration detention. They're a refugee. They can't go back to their home country because they have a genuine, well-founded fear of persecution. They've been found to be a refugee. Another case, a refugee who's currently working full-time, was released over Christmas, finally reconnected with his daughter and is now going to face being re-traumatised and re-detained. Another case of a young refugee whose sentence was reduced to 10 months on appeal. He never should have been caught by the mandatory cancellation provisions in the Migration Act in the first place. He, currently, he finally returned to his mother over Christmas and now faces being ripped apart from his mother um, and, uh, and sent to uh, an immigration detention facility on the other side of the country, other side of the country because of this bill. I mean, seriously, there is no need for this legislation. It's going to rip families apart. It's going to re-traumatise incredibly vulnerable period uh, people. And yet Senator Watt wants to get up and crack into the Greens on the basis of some spurious longbow argument that he's making. I'd urge Senator Watt to have a bit of a look in the mirror here at what the government is doing and the way the government is destroying lives, destroying lives in this country. As I said in my second reading contribution to this bill, this could have been stumped up by Mr Morrison or Mr Dutton, just like the uh, instrument to designate Nauru as an offshore detention country that Minister Watt had to uh, limply defend yesterday. I mean, this is some um, same rubbish in a different bin stuff that we're getting from this government. And uh, sadly, uh, in politics in this country, when uh, the Coles and Woolworths of Australian politics change sides, in this chamber, it seems that uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, Minister. Um, thanks, Deputy President. I don't actually think there was a question in there, so there's probably nothing for me to answer. Um, I've, I had already taken on notice um, the earlier points, but um, I, I just note that the example that Senator McKim just gave, and I, I can only assume that the facts that he laid out of that individual are correct, but of course he omitted to mention whatever offence it was that that person had been convicted of. Uh, and as I say, it must have been a very serious offence um, that led to very, very high aggregate sentences uh, for that person to be captured by this legislation, if indeed that person is captured by this legislation. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, the court in Pearson v Minister for Home Affairs said aggregate, and I quote, aggregate sentences are often made up of a series of minor offending. So we've had this New Zealand problem, haven't we? We've known this for a while, and it is really putting a strain on our relationships. So I just want to say this. Now I think criminals deserve to be locked up. There's no doubt about that. I think everyone's clear on that where we stand. 
But if you have someone who came to this country as a kid and has lived in this country for 30 years and learnt how to be a criminal here, isn't that our personal responsibility? And more so for our New Zealand counterparts, because this has been going on and it has not been fixed. So how is it fair to deport these people to New Zealand, for example, when they've been here since they're so young? Where's our responsibility in that? These are our Anzacs. We have to be very diplomatic when it comes to New Zealand. Minister. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, thanks, Senator Lambie. And you'd be aware that our government has indicated an intention to uh, change the way uh, migration decisions are made in relation to people who have uh, come here from New Zealand. Uh, and in fact, uh, the minister has issued a direction, I think is the terminology, um, that, uh, but to the effect that um, if someone has been in Australia from New Zealand from a very young age, that is to be a primary factor taken into account um, in relation to decisions about that person's visa. How that would relate here is that um, if this bill is passed, we will go back to that situation that Australian law had always been understood to be, which was that there would be mandatory cancellation of a person's visa if they were convicted of serious offences that led to long aggregate sentences. Um, but even if that mandatory cancellation occurs, so not the decision of the minister, the mandatory cancellation, then the individual concerned has the power to seek a revocation of that decision, so effectively appeal that decision to the minister. And, and at that point, if, if we're talking about a New Zealander or someone originally from New Zealand, um, the minister would have to give primary consideration to the fact that that, that that individual had lived in Australia for a very long time. So um, the person's visa would have mandatory cancellation, uh, but in the, in the example of the New Zealander who've lived, who's lived here since they were two or something like that, then the minister would have to give consideration to the length of time they've lived in Australia um, in deciding whether to if effectively back off that mandatory cancellation. But the presumption is mandatory cancellation, because again, we are talking about people who've been convicted of very serious offences. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks. Just one um, a question of clarification, if I might, for the minister. So one of the cases I gave uh, in my last contribution was um, of a young refugee, arrived um, uh, in Australia, by the way, as a child. Um, at um, uh, at the age of 10. Um, he was um, convicted and sentenced, but his sentence was reduced to um, 10 months uh, on appeal. Um, my understanding that he was, is that he was caught by the mandatory cancellation provisions in the Migration Act, but post the Pearson decision he was um, released, had a, had a visa reissued based on the Pearson decision and was released into um, the community. Uh, the issue is, and I'll just ask if you could confirm this, Minister, firstly, that the mandatory cancellation process under the Act actually doesn't wait for appeals, that it kicks in straight away and doesn't wait um, for appeals, and that's what's happened in this case. Then, um, then this person was uh, had the sentence reduced to less than 12 months, uh, was released post the Pearson decision. Will that person be caught by the provisions in this Act, and can, do, will the provisions of this Act allow for the minister to, um, to again, um, cancel that visa of a person who was caught by the mandatory uh, cancellation provisions but had his sentence reduced to 10 months on appeal? And I just. Last, um, this is an observation, not a question. But um, you know, ten months. Um, again, I make the point that Senator Watt's talking about really serious offences. But but the people that are caught here are people that the courts have sentenced to less than twelve months imprisonment. Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator McKim, I obviously am not familiar with the particular circumstances of that case. 
Um, my, my understanding on the advice I've just been given, uh, and happy to come back to you if this isn't correct after further examination, but of course what we're talking about here is aggregate sentences um, that uh, lead to uh, of more than 12 months. Um, the advice is that um, if, if on appeal the sentence falls below that 12-month mark, then that would not be enough to trigger mandatory cancellation. Yeah. So um, the appeal, the sentence on appeal, would be would be taken into account. That's the advice I've got. If that if that is not correct, I'll come back to you. Any further, uh, Senator Lambig? Thank you. Um, this bill is retrospective, correct? Well, if you put your question or. Is that your first question? No, sorry. If you're happy, I'll just go. On. So I just wanted to know: is that retrospective, and how long does that go back? Sorry, I've missed that bit. Uh, this may capture the people that were released as a result of the Pearson decision, but also a bunch of others. Do you have numbers on how many additional people will be captured by the proposed changes? Uh, what are the exact crimes that these individuals? Uh, did. How long has each of these people lived in Australia? How did they arrive here and at what age did they arrive here? So, do you have much of that information on you now, Minister? Or can you give it, do you have a brief, just can you give me a roundabout without? Well, if you could, Sorry. thank you for your questions and we'll go to the Minister and then if you need to have some follow up questions, we'll go back to you. Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. I don't have all of that information here, Senator Lambie, but what I do know is that um, the legislation is retrospective in the sense that um, it, it seeks to uh, cancel, apply mandatory cancellation to people who had already had their visas cancelled under mandatory cancellation, but this Pearson court decision basically said that their visas were no longer cancelled. So they're, they're a group of people um, who, because they'd committed serious offences um, and had an aggregate sentence um, of more than 12 months, their visas they had mandatory cancellation of their visas. But what this court decision found was that for a relatively small group of people, um, who had had their visas mandatorily cancelled because they had aggregate sentences of more than 12 months, the court decision said that's not allowed and therefore their visas are effectively reissued. They're allowed to stay. So they were people who convicted of serious offences, mandatory cancellation of their visas. This court said Actually, the way the law works is that those people shouldn't have had mandatory cancellation of their visas, and therefore they got their visas back. What we're trying to do with this legislation is, if you like, step back in time and, and clarify that, in fact, for this group of people who had aggregate sentences of more than 12 months, it was right that they had mandatory cancellation of their visas. And that is, as I say, what's always been understood to be the case in the law. It was just that this court decision found something different. And in terms of the types of offences we're talking about, you may have heard me say um, it, it, it's not minor offences, it's serious offences. Because, and when you think about it, we're talking about offences that lead to sentences of more than 12 months. It's just that in some cases, you know, there might have been a six-month conviction for one offence and a 10-year offence a sentence for another offence. And because that's an aggregate sentence of more than 12, 12 months. Um, that wasn't enough for the court. So we're talking about sexual assault, kidnapping, um, serious assaults, and as I say, not shoplifting, not traffic offences, um, serious, the, you know, some of the most serious offences you can imagine. Mm. Senator Lambie. So I just, okay, so what, can I just go over this? So what you're doing is, is clearing that, um, because when we did that, I'll just say this. So what you're doing is trying to clear up the muddy waters in this, so it's very, very clear. Is that correct? Because I know that in your dissenting report on the inquiry into the previous government's migration amendment, um, Strength and Carrot Test Bill 2021, uh, the Labor, your side, was saying the Minister for Home Affairs already has extremely broad powers to cancel visas. Uh, Section 501 of the Migration Allow Act allows that. 
um, and in some cases requires the minister to cancel or refuse visas. So this is to clear this up. So you're in sync with the court. Is is that correct? Am I saying that correct? Sorry, sorry, minister. Minister, you have the court. Sorry, sorry, I can hear everything. Uh, yes, it is to clear this up. I wouldn't probably say that it, to be in sync with the court. I'd actually probably say to to disagree with the court. Um, that what the court found was something different. What the court found was that the Australian law was different to what governments of both persuasions have always thought was the law. And so what we're trying to do with this change is make really clear in the law what was always thought to be the law, but the court thought was different. Does that make sense? Yep. That probably makes it even more confusing. Yep. Any more speakers on the amendment? The amendment um, uh, on sheet one. 1807. That amendment was moved by the opposition. That amendment is that amendment being agreed to. Those of that uh, opinion say aye. Aye. Those who say no. Aye. No. Uh, the noes have it. Aye. Noes have it. Aye. Um, a division. Ring the bells for four minutes, please.
Moore's. The question before the chair is that the op that the amendment moved by the opposition on sheet number one on sheet one eight zero seven be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Noes to the left of the chair. I point as teller for the eyes, Senator O'Sullivan. Teller for the noes, Senator Urquhart. Honourable Senators, there being 28 ayes and 35 noes, it's passed in the negative. As it is 12.15 pm, the committee will report to the Senate. Honourable Senators, the committee reports progress. Pursuant to order, I now call on senators' statements. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, senators. Uh, Senator Smith Mariel. Yes. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, it is so good to be back here in the Senate in 2023, after what was an absolutely massive year in 2022. In May last year, the Albanese Labor government was elected on a positive platform to build a better, fairer country. And since our election, we have been working tirelessly to deliver on this agenda. We have introduced measures like cheaper medicines for millions of Australians. In fact, for the first time in the 75-year history of the PBS, the co-payment for general scripts has fallen, making a significant difference for families who rely on this. We have introduced legislation to support 10 days of paid domestic and family violence leave into the national employment standards, meaning no one needs to choose between a day's pay, between their livelihood and between getting help and getting out of a dangerous situation. The legislation underpinning the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which will restore integrity to our federal parliament. We advocated for the biggest increase to the minimum wage in years, which saw a 5.2 per cent wage increase for some of Australia's lowest paid workers, a wage increase that was long and well overdue. And we have gotten on with the job of fixing the crisis within sorry, our aged Senator, care system. Can I just ask, if people want to have a conversation, they leave the chamber. It is difficult to hear the contribution being made. You have a call. 
And as I was saying, Deputy Speaker, we have gotten on with the job of fixing the crisis within our aged care system so that our oldest Australians can live in comfort and dignity, a crisis which we, see, which we saw worsen and worsen over the past nine years of the previous government. And we are funding 180,000 fee-free TAFE places to help fill the shortages in our economy in skills. These places will come online over the course of 2023 with applications already open. In 2022 as well, we took important action on climate change to help preserve our nation and the world for future generations, legislating for a 43 per cent emissions reduction by 2023 and net zero by 2025. This was something we know our community, environmental groups and business have been calling on for years, essential to providing certainty, to guiding investment and to making a difference on the threat of climate change. And two, in 2022, we made commitments which I am personally deeply proud of. Our investment of $284 million in First Nations health infrastructure across Australia including $13.35 million to rebuild Yardu Health in Sejuna and $8.9 million to build a primary health care clinic for the Murundi Aboriginal Health Service in Murray Bridge. Acting Deputy President, we took to the electorate in 2022 an ambitious agenda, one driven by the deeply held Labor ambition to build a better and fairer country. I am proud of the work we have done in 2022, but more importantly, I am focused on the work that remains ahead in what is set to be another huge year. Because in 2023, we are expanding paid parental leave. From 1 July this year, Australians will have access to an expanded scheme, expanding it to full six months available to parents welcoming a new baby into their family by 2026. This will be the biggest increase to paid parental leave since its inception under the last Labor government and will help parents, mums and dads spend more time with their children in those critical early months where we know those connections formed are so important to a child's development and well-being and where we don't want any Australian parent having to choose to not spend those first few months forging those bonds and those connections with their child because they can't afford to take leave. And from 1 July, we will see Australian families and their kids be able to access more affordable early learning. And we know what a difference this will make. Access to quality early learning is vital for the development of children. It shapes and impacts their outcomes in life. Providing children with an environment to engage in play-based learning to help build those critical brain connections that will set them up for a lifetime of learning is vital work and it's work that our parliament is helping to advance and contribute to. We will further build on it by the work of the Early Years Strategy, which will be developed this year as well. In the first five years of life, we can make our biggest impact on the outcomes of children, on the outcomes of family, on our future productivity, on our wellbeing and prosperity as a nation. Our early years strategy will help improve government service delivery and help set up our youngest Australians for a successful and prosperous future. And I'm very much looking forward to all of the South Australians who I know share my passion for early learning and development on the consultation of these strategies so that we can develop something which will be truly impactful. Of course, in 2023, as we look ahead, Australians will also have the opportunity to vote for constitutional recognition of our First Nations Australians and a voice to Parliament. This is about recognising First Nations Australians in our constitution. It is about consulting them on the issues that matter to them, on the decisions government takes which will impact them. The Uluru Statement was a generous and gracious offer from First Nations Australians towards a more reconciled future. And in 2023, it will be significant. We will have our opportunity to respond to that call with the same generosity and graciousness. I have been absolutely hardened already this year by the number of South Australians who have reached out over the summer to tell me that they will be supporting the Yes campaign, who are keen to get out there and get involved. And I will be supporting it too and look forward to the outcome of this referendum and being able to walk together towards a more reconciled and united future. The voice is not a radical proposition. It is a simple one and it is a kind one. I am very proud to be part of a government that is supporting it. 
Of course, we know that 2023 will also bring particular challenges. We know cost of living pressures are already biting hard, and they are front of mind for many, many South Australians. Our government is committing to, committed to working with South Australians to ease this pain, including through making the cost of medicine cheaper, making childcare cheaper, uh, and doing what we can to promote wage growth. But of course, there will be more work to do in 2023. And in my state especially, there will be particular challenges confronting our community. The impact of the summer floods, which inundated towns along the River Murray, have been significant. The state government anticipates these floods will be among the worst South Australia's experienced in decades, and the impact on homes and businesses has been confronting. We know flows into the River Murray reached a peak of 185.9 gigalitres per day on the 22nd of December and remained elevated well above normal levels. Right now, across South Australia, families and communities are taking stock of the damage to their homes and businesses, with the SES estimating that over 3,000 properties were impacted by the flooding along the River Murray, with more than 1,000 kilometres of roads flooded in weeks. Of course, it's deeply upsetting too that there's an estimated 750 First Nations heritage sites which also may have been inundated and damaged during the flooding. And while the total financial impact of it will take time to calculate, it is expected to be amongst the worst national natural disasters in terms of the economic impact in our history, and the state government has already announced significant packages for rebuilding local infrastructure. I want to take this opportunity before the Senate to express my heartfelt condolences to all South Australians, all our volunteers and the staff of our emergency services who were working tirelessly over the summer to protect lives and to protect property and to assist their fellow South Australians with dealing with these floods, with dealing with the catastrophic impact of them on their communities. Without the committed and strong networks of volunteers across our regional communities, we know the impact would have been worse. The impact of these floods would have been much more significant, so I do express my heartfelt thanks. And I want to encourage any South Australians impacted by the flooding to explore their eligibility for the disaster recovery allowance, which they can do at disasterassist.gov.au. And I thank Minister Watts as well for the work he has done on behalf of the federal government in supporting these communities. Acting Deputy President, it is a privilege of my life to represent the great state of South Australia in this place. And in 2023, as we look to the year ahead, I will be working tirelessly as a member of the Albanese Labor government to continue our work and our fight to build a better, fairer future for South Australian families. I have always said as a South Australian senator that I believe our best days as a state are ahead of us. They are ahead of us and they will be ahead of us if we all work tirelessly in this parliament and in our state to be proactive about seizing and fostering the opportunities which come before us. Together, we can build a state with the brightest future of our nation, and I am dedicated to being part of that work in the Senate. I will be doing that as part of an Albanese Labor government, building a better and fairer future, and I look forward to and am very, very energised by the work that will be ahead in 2023. Senator Smith. Dean. Thank you very much. I rise to pay tribute to two late stalwarts of the West Australian Liberal Party, Fran Weller and Michelle Bower, whose contributions and very special personal qualities will long be remembered. Fran Weller's life touched a great many other people, not least myself. Often Fran's friendship or associations touched several generations within families. Fran's remarkable life and her many interests were such that very few of us would know until her death the full extent of her work and dedication to others. There was her teaching family, Fran having taught at Jerramungup, Harvey, New Norcia, John Wilcock in Geraldton and Clarkson in Perth's northern suburbs. Among her pupils were future politicians and future football stars, and her long teaching career was such that, to the surprise of some, Fran more than once found herself teaching the children of her former students. There are wonder these are some of the wonderful tributes from her teaching colleagues. And I share some lines from letters to Fran from John Wilcock College Principal Julie Campbell. Julie Campbell said of Fran, the program that you work with provides many of our students at risk the opportunity of experiencing success in a small group situation, that they feel comfortable in your group speaks for the fact that you always strive to provide a warm and inclusive environment for your students. I know that the staff who have worked closely with you 
have very much appreciated your willingness to share your experience and knowledge, and many of them have often felt that they can bring, bring to you their personal problems as well. That is not on any job description you will read. And that summarises Fran perfectly, always going beyond in whatever she did. Others knew Fran from her commitment to farming and the farming communities in which she lived. All students, fellow teachers and community members valued, valued Fran's warmth and generosity and her clear views on matters. For me personally, Fran Weller was a steady and wise counsellor. As a young man, and I met Fran decades ago, indeed as a young liberal, a young man in a hurry, a young liberal in a hurry, yeah, Fran yeah. was an encouraging and always reassuring presence. It was a generosity and warmth that blended her country style with the general support and reassurance a teacher brings. I liked Fran greatly. For me, I was never left unsure when I was on the right track, or equally, when in Fran's view, I may, may have found myself in a political cul-de-sac. Every word from Fran was from her heart. Every word from Fran was one you could trust. The WA Liberals, at least from the outside, can sometimes look like a strange and unwelcoming bunch of people. On the inside, though, it's best understood as a family. And with the passage of time, and on occasions such as Fran's passing, we are reminded of the virtues of being in a family like the WA Liberal Party brings us. Fran was an emblem of all that is good and noble about the WA Liberals. Fran's presence and participation enriched the Liberal family. People like Fran are a rare but greatly cherished type of person. She was someone whose sleeves were always rolled up. No task was too great, no task was too small. Fran was as comfortable organising the local branch of the division as she was stewarding the party as a state vice president or the chair of a committee or as a state councillor. After decades of selfless service, Fran and her husband Greg were properly recognised with a meritorious service award presented to them by the Prime Minister then, Mr Tony Abbott. But above all else, Fran was a wife, a mother and a grandmother. Some of us always knew Fran as Greg and Fran a term of endearment that painted a picture of teamwork by the couple who first met in Waruna in the 1960s. In Greg's own words to me before the funeral, he said it was a marriage made in heaven. I was honoured to join Greg and his family at Fran's funeral recently in Waruna, and particularly privileged and honoured to be asked to give the eulogy that has shaped this contribution in the Senate today. Although tremendously saddened by Fran's loss, we are so grateful to have in our own unique and very special way our lives touched and shaped by such a wonderful lady. We are reassured that she is now at peace, no doubt, with a few views of, our, of her own with our maker. Another member of the WA Liberal Party to sadly leave us has been Michelle Bauer heavily involved in the Fremantle and later Nedlands branches from 2013. Here I'd like to share with the Senate the words of my friend and fellow Liberal Michelle Boylan, who made a heartfelt and touching contribution at Michelle Bauer's funeral. She said, Michelle was a, a beautiful woman, incredibly caring and thoughtful. While small in stature, Michelle was strong in character not afraid of hard conversations or letting you know when she did not approve of, of a party matter or policy. Her discernment was an incredible character trait. Michelle had a strong and dedicated work ethic and always supportive, often turning up out of the blue with a smile, a treat, a hug or a word of encouragement, and her timing was always perfect. Michelle was a great champion for the women in the party, both as an active supporter and contributor to the Liberal Women's Council. Michelle served the party right to the end, phone canvassing for Celia Hammond in the most recent federal election while terminally ill, which speaks to her great character, one of kindness, integrity, strength and her beautiful ability to put others first. 
I echo the sentiments that it was a genuine honour to know Michelle Bauer, who served us so well, even when facing her own adversity, and to enjoy her friendship and her support. There's no doubt that she will be greatly missed, and I again send my condolences to Michelle's husband, family and friends. To these very special Liberal ladies, I end by simply saying thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. As I have said time and time again in this place, poverty is a political choice. There are around five million people who receive some form of income support payment. How can recipients not be struggling on $48 a day on JobSeeker? We know that a third of Australian households are struggling to just put food on the table. All costs are rising except for the rate of income support payments. Everyday Australians are tired. They shouldn't need to rely upon the goodwill of their friends, families and charities just to get by. This is all part of the neoliberal nonsense that will see more people worse off while corporate profits absolutely soar. The Labor government has ignored these calls and in doing so has left millions of people having to choose between paying the rent, essential medicines or eating three meals a day. There is nothing secure about our social security system. I hear that every day, as do my colleagues from the constituents who are contact contacting us. I'd like to share an account from James, who contacted my office to share his experience receiving the job seeker payment. James shared with us that for the last several years he feels like he is barely existing. Most fortnights I starve for four days unless my family takes pity on me and gifts me some food. This is embarrassing and my family struggles as well. It also creates tension and anxiety between us, so I try to go without, but I need to keep up meals because of diabetes. James is not alone. My office receives daily emails from people in income support, people who simply do not know where their next meal is going to be coming from. How will they pay for essential medications? Or they fear eviction due to skyrocketing rental costs. I'd like to share some evidence from an anonymous, anonymous witness who spoke to a hearing of our Senate poverty inquiry, inquiry last week. Every policymaker, every senator in this place needs to hear this witness's story. Seven years ago, witness A unexpectedly became homeless as a result of domestic violence. Her life was threatened and so were her children's. When she went to a refuge with her children, her husband withdrew all the money from the joint bank account and started court proceedings against her. She's had to rely on church pantries for food. A lot of the church food banks asked intrusive questions and tried to sign her children up for evangelistic programs. And when she said no to this, the church refused to give her the food box she was there to collect. Witness A shared that she had spent seven years of pretending to my kids that I'm not hungry or that I've already eaten. Her kids wear donated uniforms and the teachers get them in trouble for not wearing the right shoes and they pretend to her that they're doing okay. She has never paid less than 80 per cent of her income on housing, sometimes over 100 per cent. She's had to beg church authorities for emergency rental assist assistance. She's tried twice to go back to education but had to leave both times because the income support she received wasn't enough. After her most recent experience with JobSeeker, she decided never to apply again. The interactions with Centrelink, verbal abuse, gaslighting, coercive control reminded her of her abusive husband she had escaped from. These people in our community have been punished by 10 years of a callous coalition government, and they were hoping that they would get more from a change of government. And as we saw in Labor's first budget last year, however, these people continue to be chastised by a Labor government who profess to speak for the people but are taking no real action to help them. 
I mean, Minister Rishworth has stated that social services are central to the Albanese Labor government's vision to create a better future for all Australians and to leave no one behind. And Treasurer Chalmers continues to assure us that there's no room in the budget, however, to raise JobSeeker. Yet Labor has found plenty of room in the budget to give her another $9,000 a year per person in tax cuts for billionaires, for the ultra-wealthy, for everybody earning over $200,000 a year who, don't, who absolutely do not need that tax cut. Every single one of us in this place will receive a $9,000 a year tax cut. I don't need this tax cut and I don't think any of you do either. And in the same breath, Labor scoffs at the idea of raising job seeker above the poverty line. There's nothing laughable about this. The most vulnerable people in our community need financial support. You cannot claim to tackle the spiralling cost of living by abandoning those who need support, while lining the pockets of those who earn over $200,000 a year. To the people of Australia, like James, like Witness A, all those who are on income support and are struggling to pay for rent, food, fuel, education, childcare, bills <coughs> in this cost of living crisis, please know it is not your fault. You deserve so much better than what you are receiving from the government. The Greens will continue to fight for you inside and outside of the parliament until we no longer need to raise this in the parliament. The Greens believe that the foundation for a socially just society requires the provision of a guaranteed livable income so that everyone has enough to meet their needs, not just those who won in the lottery of life. Now, I'm calling on Minister Rishworth and Treasurer Chalmers to listen to real stories from people like James and, Win and Witness A and to genuinely hear what they are saying. People who share their stories have devoted their valuable time and energy. Don't let it be in vain. No one should have to skip meals just to get by, not in one of the wealthiest countries in the world like Australia. It's clear that our social safety net is broken. Poverty is a political choice being made by both major parties. Now more than ever, we need to raise the rate of income support to at least $88 a day, abolish punitive mutual obligations and provide earlier access to the pension at age 65. This is the only way that we can tackle the cost of living crisis and support those most impacted. I also want to take the opportunity today to particularly mention an important issue that has been raised with me by a number of constituents and the National Council of Single Mothers and their children, and that is the problem with our child support system. In 2019, the Swinburne University of Technology and the National Council of Single Mothers and their children released a report entitled Debts and Disappointments, Mothers' Experiences of the Child Support System. And that report notes that the Australian child support system transfers money to approximately 1.2 million children, and importantly, the report builds on the survey of hundreds of respondents. The survey and the results summarised in the report shows that there are clear problems that need urgent action. The report found that the ch national child support debt severely harms families. These hardships were often exacerbated by the Centrelink benefit system, particularly through the interactions of the family tax, tax benefit. There are devastating impacts on families, particularly single mothers, when the child support payment is unpaid, late, sporadic and or partial. Children miss out on social and educational experiences. And there are also health impacts, as kids may miss out on medical appointments, particularly specialists if their parents, usually their mothers, are struggling to cover costs. And there are impacts on the parents as well. As the report notes, recurring findings pointed to concerning health, emotional and wellbeing impacts that went beyond economic insecurity, manifesting in anxiety and a sense of being continuously let down by the system that was instituted to support them and their family. I want to thank the advocates who have raised this important issue and the constituents who have been raising it with me and other members of parliament directly. We hear you. Your voices are important. And you deserve better than a system that was left to grind to a halt after a decade of Liberal neglect. So we need to see urgent action from the government. I know that this is something that advocates and constituents have been raising directly with government. We will continue to raise it as well. 
and to urge the government to act. The system cannot continue in crisis. It is just too important for that. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, this year, the Australian people will go uh, to a referendum on enshrining an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in our constitution. <clears throat> the constitution holds part of the story of Australia, and it's time that our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are included in that story. Better yet, that they be given a voice in the constitution to tell their own Australian story. The voice is an extraordinary opportunity a genuine path towards improving the lives of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It's a proposal that has been put to us, the Australian people, and to this parliament by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and leaders themselves. It emerged from a series of regional constitutional conventions held across the country, and one, that most, one of the most extensive dialogues on our constitution since federation. And it culminated in a national convention at Uluru in May 2017. Since that day, the Uluru Statement has travelled the length and breadth of this country. Many hundreds of people from all walks of life have signed their names to the, uh, to the statement. And despite the claim of some within this chamber, the voice continues to receive over 80 per cent support amongst Indigenous communities. This support is shared amongst the broader Australian people. The statement of intent signed by our state and territory first ministers is just the most recent indication of the broad consensus that is building across the country in support of the voice. Essential polling has, received, has revealed that over 65 per cent of Australians continue to support the voice. This support has remained steady over recent years. This is because the communities we represent are ready for change. I have a great amount of faith in the Australian people and in their generosity and goodwill. This is a great country, but we can make it better with a successful referendum. We all want to find peace, honesty, and justice in our history. We all want to prosper in a more united nation, a nation in which all Australians can see themselves reflected, a nation where all are respected from the uniqueness of the contributions they have made to this country from their own social and cultural frameworks. Australians know that when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have a say in the laws and policies that affect them, when people on the ground are listened to and engaged, better laws and policies and strategies are made. The Voice is about making our work here in the chamber more responsive, accurate and informed, and hopefully more collegiate in the future. The voice will improve the work of parliament and its integrity. I must say with confidence that many senators in this chamber have at one time or another benefited immensely from the advice and wisdom of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders. This is what the voice is about. Genuine exchange, a sharing of knowledge and wisdom and mutual respect. This provision promoted by the Prime Minister at Gama last year will give recognition to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution and provide a guaranteed way for their voice to be heard in this place and the other place. The voice will be chosen by First Nations peoples based on the wishes of their local communities. It will be representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. It will be empowering, community-led, inclusive, respectful, culturally informed, gender-based and include youth. Importantly, it will be accountable, transparent and will work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. These principles agreed by the working group have been out there in the public space for more than four months now. And the working group and the government may have more to say in the 
say on the architecture of the voice before uh, Australians vote later this year. Some of these matters are under consideration by the working group. I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Attorney General for their attendance at the last working group meeting and Senator Bragg for his continued in principal support for the, for the voice. Many detailed matters can be worked out subsequent to a referendum. There will be and there has already been a significant amount of misinformation in the debate about the voice. And I ask that each of you embrace what is fact and reject what is fiction. This is our duty as senators and uh, as elected representatives uh, for the people of this country. As a senator, I can say unequivocally that parliament will retain its supremacy. It will be unencumbered in its lawmaking functions. As an Aboriginal man and traditional owner, I can say also unequivocally that the voice will not cede sovereignty nor cultural nor curtail future efforts towards agreement making and truth telling. Constitutional experts have consistently confirmed this, including the group of eight constitutional lawyers advising the working group. In advice published last week, all members of the eight experts of the expert groups agreed draft provisions would not affect the sovereignty of any group or body. In fact, the voice will strengthen and reinforce the recognition of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples. We must not lose sight of this as the first step in improving our relationship with the first peoples of this country. We are at the beginning of a new journey. This journey will make us face the consequences of colonisation and settlement and its destination will be a more united and unified nation. The up and coming referendum is an extraordinary moment for our country. Every vote will count. <coughs> we must grasp this moment and take our nation forward. Many of those who have walked along this long road for reform, who signed their names to the Uluru Statement, have already left us, and some far too early. I urge everyone to open their hearts to imagine an Australia that supports Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to have a say over matters that affect them and have that voice enshrined in the Constitution. In doing so, it will help us to be a prouder nation, and I hope to walk with you all later in this year as we go towards yes. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. What the Australian people are witnessing right now is an unfolding catastrophe that threatens the livelihoods and economic viability of Australia. And unlike COVID-19, this economic catastrophe is completely man-made and a result of reckless policy and thoughtless planning from the government. Madam Acting Deputy President, the catastrophe that I refer to is the artificial energy crisis of the government's own creation that will occur from their ill-conceived policies, such as the energy price cap that we saw come in through this chamber blindingly fast without any chance to any of us to talk to it or debate it late last year. And on top of that, their rewiring the nation plan will be a catastrophe. And the government have made it extremely clear by now they intend to forge on down this reckless path and seem intent on choosing the most uneconomical and costly path to reduce emissions, with no consideration of the economic consequences that will unfold. We've heard this from almost every sector of society about how dangerous this government's energy plans are and how little thought they have put into conducting an orderly transition to net zero. When I attended COP27 in Egypt last year, one thing was abundantly clear, that whether you like it or not, the transition to net zero is happening and going to happen. It's a tidal wave coming of enormous proportions, so everyone better get on board. However, it was a real shame that COP was attended by so few of those opposite, because if they were there, 
they would have heard for themselves from experts around the world that this transition is going to be long and is going to be hard and it is going to be very expensive, but not as expensive as Labor are planning on making it. The aim of the transition to a renewable energy grid is not just about recklessly scattering solar, and wind, solar panels and wind farms across the country, and then paying billions of dollars to connect them to the grid, as the government intends to do through their rewiring the nation plan. Because this will leave us with an unstable grid that will result in soaring energy costs, blackouts and economic ruin. Yet, despite the Albanese government repeatedly blaming the, Ukraine inv the illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the Coalition on Energy Policy to explain Australia's steadily rising power bills, the impact of current and proposed policy is key to the uncertain future of domestic energy prices and investment. The government's reasoning behind this energy crisis is due to the global impact of Russia, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. However, it is important to note that prior to the invasion, the Brent oil price was at $80 per barrel and the ACCC reported that the net back uh, LNG price was at $41.24 uh, per gigajoule. So despite the events in Ukraine exacerbating the challenges in the LNG market, it's clear that this issue has been prevalent globally and in Australia for a decade or more due to a lack of investment in new supply. And states such as my own home state of Victoria can well be blamed for that. Despite having an abundant amounts of natural gas, the Victorian Labor government intend on prohibiting Australians from accessing it, thereby reducing supply and increasing the cost of gas for Victorian businesses. And now this Labor government have essentially nationalised the gas market and put the expectation on private companies to continue to put their own capital at risk in the market to keep this essential industry and resource abundant, while simultaneously making the operating conditions unviable for anyone who is prepared to invest in it. This kind of ludicrous and irrational policy making will only result in uh, further reductions of supply and increased costs and instability. And the market has already responded to this. ExxonMobil and Woodside, which jointly own some of the biggest sources of gas in the domestic market, reduced their forward investment commitment to a six-month time frame. Now, these are projects that take years to develop, and they are citing the government's, and I quote, reckless intervention in the gas, in the gas market for doing so. And, Madam Acting Deputy President, the supply shortage of gas should not come as a surprise to anyone, or no one can claim that they didn't see it coming. AEMO, in their GSU guest statement of, uh, of opportunities, have been telling this for a long period. And just last year, when the ACCC released their gas report, they said, and I quote, Supply conditions in the East Coast market are expected to deteriorate significantly in 2023, with a shortfall of 56 petajoules now expected. This is equivalent to around 10 per cent of domestic demand and is the largest projected supply shortfall we have forecast since the inquiry commenced in 2017." Close quote. Now, when Minister Bowen came out and tried to defend his absurd price cap in January. He cited tre Treasury figures from the 21st of December uh, of the wholesale price of energy, stating that, I quote, the figures released show that the intervention, while we still have some way to go, we still have some more work to do, is having an impact. However, this data was before the price cap had even come into effect on the 23rd of December. And the government know that their policies will result in increased costs. In fact, the Treasurer's last budget in October forecasts an additional 56 per cent jump in retail prices. Despite going to the polls at the last election, promising to cut bills uh, for households by $275, 
Now, all they can promise is to make the cost of living harder than it has to be. While the shift to a low or zero emission energy is unstoppable and accelerating, the transition to a 100 per cent renewable grid will, requ re will require a role for gas and perhaps coal to supplement the renewable energy and provide firming capacity for the grid until zero emissions technologies become more mature as a solution to firming the grid it, when it's running on 100 per cent renewables. This was made clear in JP Morgan's 2022 annual energy paper, which explicitly states that countries that reduce production of fossil fuels under the assumption that renewables can quickly replace them face substantial economic and geopolitical risks. If the energy transition is to succeed, we cannot disconnect the generation methods we have before we have a replacement for it. It has become abundantly clear that this government has not even considered grid stability or um, supply security in their rewiring the nation plan. Just last week we heard on the ABC from top energy expert Dylan McConnell that Australia is adding renewable energy at less than half the pace required to replace retiring coal-fired generation and meet its own 2030 climate targets. Of course, there is the obvious solution to firming the grid that will allow Australia to reach its emissions reduction goals much, much sooner than 2050, and that is nuclear power. As a mature, ready-to-implement emissions-free technology, Australia is absolutely mad not to pursue this technology. The Treasurer's, I won't say the, the word, uh, but uh, the crazy 6,000-word uh, essay on reimagining capitalism, redefining how we define a successful economy, says it all about this government. Not only do they know that their policies will make it more difficult for Australians instead of actually trying to make things better, now they want to move the goalposts and give themselves a participation, participation medal. Newsflash, guys. If the lights aren't on and Australians can't afford to live, that is not a successful economy. And it's time the government gets that through their head before they attempt to nationalise the rest of Australia. Let us not forget that sharp, prices in, uh, sharp rises in energy prices have preceded several global recessions, with the most famous coming from the OPEC oil embargo in the 1970s. Similarly, the 2008-2009 recession there was a 150 per cent increase in oil prices. And somehow this government thinks that reducing supply and nationalising the energy market is a good idea and that it won't lead to energy prices and a potential recession. I think we'll find out it will. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to call out the thuggish wage suppression tactics being used by Woodside against their own employees. In June of last year, that's eight months ago, a majority of Woodside offshore gas workers voted they wanted to negotiate together for a new agreement through their unions, the AWU and the MUA. In a civil workplace where the employer respects their workers' basic human rights to join a union and negotiate together, that majority vote would be respected. And then they would get down to bargaining in good faith. That would be normal practice. Instead, what we've seen from one of the richest and most profitable companies in Australia is a disgraceful abuse of legal process. In the last eight months, Woodside has lodged not one, not two, not three, but nine frivolous legal challenges against their workers' majority support petition. And all nine of Woodside's legal challenges have failed. After eight months and nine legal disputes, Woodside's workers thought they were finally going to get the chance to begin work on a new agreement until late last night. Woodside announced it's filing a tenth legal appeal. This tenth appeal is on the grounds that Woodside thinks supervisors should not have the right to be included in the agreement a right they're requesting. That is a despite the ruling by the Fair Work Commission as well that last week, to quote directly from Deputy President Binnett, 
It is not uncommon for agreements and awards to cover frontline supervisors. The evidence supports the conclusion that there is a nothing unfair in the supervisors being part of the employee group. End quote. It sounds pretty clear to me. And what's pretty clear is that those supervisors voted to be part of an agreement. The fact is that this latest appeal is as absurd and vexatious as the last nine filed applications. In one of those applications, Woodside claimed without any evidence that some of the signatures on the petition were fake. Then in another application, Woodside demanded access to the unredacted signatures that it could verify them against signatures in their own records, only to later admit that they had no such records. Woodside then argued that because they had successfully dragged their workers through the courts for so long, that the petition was now out of date. But when the Australian Workers' Union offered to pay for a new ballot, Woodside strongly opposed that too. Now, the AWU National Secretary, Dan Walton, summed this up by saying, thousands of sensible companies sit down to negotiate with workers and their representatives every year. A massive Australian company like Woodside should not be allowed to stack up meritless claims to put on pressure on a union's resources with the sole intention of bullying its workforce. The offshore alliance coordinator, Zach Duncalf, also was spot on in saying, unfortunately companies with bottomless pockets like Woodside have the means to frustrate and delay what should be simply a proceeding before the commission. End quote. If Woodside has a limitless sum of money set aside to waste their workers' time, to waste the union's time, to waste the precious time and resources in our legal system, then perhaps they aren't paying enough tax. Woodside has made a fortune in the last few years by jacking up gas prices paid by every single Australian household and business. Woodside has made a fortune by exploiting the tragic situation in Ukraine, and they have the gall to complain about price caps. And they have the audacity to rob their workers of their legal right to join a union and bargain together. Well, if this is how Woodside CEO Meg O'Neill runs a business, it'd be very interesting to see her before a Senate inquiry explaining is that the way that we represent Australians and engage with Australians, wanting their democratic voice to be heard. If that's her policy, then that's something that should be held to account by the Australian people. Because we need to demand a serious change of behaviour from big corporates like Woodside and, of course, companies like Qantas when it comes to their pattern of thuggish behaviour against their own workforce and hard-working Australians. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak about the stain on our nation and our soul that is family violence. We promised before the election that we would make women's safety a national priority, and we have. Last year, one of the first pieces of legislation we introduced was paid family and domestic violence leave. And I'm proud to say that as of the 1st of February, this leave is now available for millions of Australians to access. And make no mistake, this will save lives. Australian workers, full-time, part-time and casual, will have access to 10 days paid domestic and family violence leave a year, no matter how many hours they work. The full 10 days will be available when it's needed, rather than having to be accumulated over time, like annual and sick leave. This will make a huge difference in the lives of many Australian workers who are affected by family violence. And there are rules to keep information about whether an employee is taking domestic and family violence leave private rather than having to be included on a pay slip. Importantly, casual workers will be paid at the full time rate for the hours they were rostered on to work. So what can this leave be used for? It's to help all employees do whatever they need to keep themselves and their families safe. And this may include making arrangements for their safety or the safety of loved ones, attending court hearings, dealing with the police, attending counselling or meeting with medical, financial or legal professionals. 
We know that the most dangerous time for a woman is when she attempts to leave an abusive rela relationship, which is why being able to access this leave is so crucial to women's safety. No one should ever have to choose between their safety and their pay. I want to acknowledge the work of activists over many years to make this a reality. This landmark legislation started with strong union women standing up and speaking out in their workplaces for safety and security. And this is a change that is years in the making, and it's only thanks to campaigning from survivors, from frontline workers and the union movement. Last year I had the opportunity to meet with some of the pioneering ASU women in Geelong who were the first to negotiate domestic violence leave in their agreements. Standing together, these women became the first in the country to have paid family and domestic violence leave. And this win set off a national campaign which ran for over a decade, culminating in the change that we now see. And I really hope that Christy, Sharon, Harriet and Adele are just so proud of what they've achieved. Uh, I know I am so proud of them. This is a landmark reform and it's just one of the parts of the Albanese government's commitment to ending family violence. Because everyone deserves to feel safe in their own homes around people that they love the most. And that's why we're delivering the new national plan to end violence against women and children. We're funding hundreds of new frontline workers, uh, including in rural, regional and remote areas. We're delivering 4,000 social housing dwellings for women and children escaping violence. We're funding consent and respectful relationships education to help stop violence before it starts. Uh, and we're implementing all 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work report, including a requirement from, for employers to actively prevent sexual harassment in Australian workplaces. All of this reform is not easy, but it's the right thing to do and it will save lives. We know that regardless of your background, family violence can happen to anyone and it can happen anywhere in our country. Most importantly, we know that family violence is preventable. Legislative reform like this, along with our record investment, is just part of our commitment to making women's safety a national priority. And I want to finish by acknowledging some of the incredible frontline workers in the family violence field for the work that they do uh, every day and every night, helping those who need them the most. And I'd also like to acknowledge those who are no longer with us, women who have lost their lives to family violence. We won't stop until every woman feels safe in her, in her home, uh, and this work is for those women. Thank you. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. It is no secret that for a long time now that freedom of speech, thought and political association has been under attack in many of our institutions, and no, no more so than in our universities. Last year, a mob of vandals violently assaulted the UQ Liberal National Student Society Market Day stall, covering the club's equipment and young female students in paint while spraying foul, vile and abusive threats to these students. And following the attack, the UQ Union and, disgracefully, the university administration took no steps whatsoever to hold these thuggish vandals to account. If that is not enough of an example of how much our universities despise those who hold sensible centre-right political views, the UQ Union has now moved to, dis to disaffiliate the UQ Liberal National Society, a damning move against freedom of speech on campus. Now, the current UQ union leadership, surprise, surprise, is comprised of young labour and socialist alternative students. Now, given that the UQ Liberal National Society was the only group to campaign against the ruling party in recent student union elections, 
This is quite clearly a move by the UQ union to not only silence but outlaw their only opposition on campus. That politically conflicted Labor hacks are directly linked to this decision indicates a complete lack of procedural fairness and of due process. UQ's dismissive attitude towards the serious issues of probity and safety on campus is quickly diminishing its reputation as an open and inclusive space for all, no matter their political persuasion. But UQ, sadly, is no longer a place that champions the contest of ideas. So I'm calling on the university administration to hold the union accountable for this disgraceful move and to ensure that the UQ Liberal National Society remains affiliated. What we are seeing here in Australia is that a Labor government is ignoring the concerns of Australian families who are being impacted most grievously by a cost of living crisis. The Reserve Bank has again increased interest rates. So we've got nine interest rates rises, nine interest rate rises in nine months. Labor will always cost you more. 2012 was the last time that interest rates were so high and not coincidentally, I'd surprise, I, I would suppose that was the last time Labor were in power. Nine interest rate rises in nine months. Now you would think Labor would do something to try and help Australian families by fulfilling their election promise to reduce power bills by $275. You think that would be a sensible start. Now, Prime Minister Albanese promised to do that 97 times during the election campaign last year. It's 97 times. 97 times he promised he would reduce power bills by $275. Now, he hasn't mentioned it once since becoming Prime Minister. He can go to the tennis, he can be having fun at the tennis, but he hasn't uttered the number 275, the figure that dare not speak its name. The 275 is a bit like the Scarlet Pimpernel with Labor. It's hidden. They seek it here, they seek it there, they seek it everywhere. But with Labor and the Prime Minister, they're not doing anything about people's power bills. They're not delivering their promise. So what we're seeing in Australia is a cost of living crisis. Nine interest rate rises, we see inflation going up, and what do we have a Treasurer do? He writes 6,000 words saying absolutely nothing. Well, Treasurer, deliver on cutting people's power bills. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, this year, the Women's World Cup will be co-hosted in Australia and New Zealand. A wonderful chance for everyone to get behind women's sport and the Matildas, who are in fact our most successful national football team. Last week, both Football Australia and New Zealand Football were blindsided by a FIFA announcement that Visit Saudi, the Saudi Arabian tourism body, would be a major sponsor of the event. This outrageous decision has been widely condemned by human rights groups and activists, including Amnesty International and former Socceroo Craig Foster. Until June 2018, Saudi Arabia enforced a ban on women driving and imprisoned many activists who tried to challenge and change this ridiculous law. Saudi Arabia's guardianship law is still in place, a system that means every woman must have a male guardian, rendering them legal minors throughout their life. And while Saudi women over the age of 21 can now apply for a passport and travel abroad without permission from their male guardian, Considerable male-centred legal control still applies when it comes to marriage, divorce, children's issues and custody. Men retain significant rights over women that allow them to file cases for disobedience, forcing women to choose between a return to guardianship or imprisonment. These laws entrench a system of gender-based discrimination for women in Saudi Arabia, 
and neither women playing in this year's World Cup or those who will pack stadiums in Australia and New Zealand to see them play should be forced to accept this obvious attempt to rebrand its image through the guise of sports sponsorship. While the country tries to modernise its image for tourists through sponsorship of women's sporting events, it continues to impose draconian prison sentences on women like Salma al Shahab. Salma is a PhD student and mother of two young children who was sentenced to 34 years in prison in August of last year, and her crimes include having a Twitter account and retweeting women's rights activists. Same-sex relationships are prohibited in Saudi Arabia, and atheism is illegal and punishable by death. I can't imagine why the Matildas might not want Visit Saudi printed on their jerseys. We've seen so many attempts to purchase this kind of social licence recently, and sport is a popular avenue. In October of last year, Noongar woman and netballer Danelle Wallam raised her concerns about Hancock prospect, uh, prospecting being a uniform sponsor. The Diamond's only Indigenous player, Wallam opposed wearing the uniform bearing the Hancock logo, as its CEO, Gina Reinhart, had never publicly denounced racist comments made by her father. Hancock, as we know, subsequently withdraw, uh, withdrew the funding. And a public statement from Hancock says that it considers, uh, considers it, quote, unnecessary for sports organisations to be used as a vehicle for social or political causes, end quote. As though that wasn't exactly what they were attempting to do by sponsoring the Diamonds in the first place. Forcing women into a situation where they become walking billboards for organisations, and in this case the Women's World Cup countries, that often threaten their rights is not fair and it's not part of the job. FIFA's human rights policy prohibits any form of discrimination, including on the grounds of gender. How they can then accept this sponsorship, encouraging tourism to a country that operates every day under a system of entrenched gender-based discrimination, baffles me. I support calls of Football Australia and New Zealand Football and human rights advocates in demanding FIFA reject Visit Saudi's sponsorship of the 2023 Women's World Cup. And I might note that uh, the publication Women's Agenda um, has, is running a petition where people can sign on again to call for that uh, sponsorship to be dropped. So uh, it's up to 9,000 signatures right now, and please go and add your voice if you think that women shouldn't be walking billboards and certainly shouldn't be for a country that doesn't even accept them as equal citizens. Senator Junior. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I rise today to uh, talk about an issue that is, uh, to a degree, a little far removed from the work of this chamber, but something that is close to my own heart. And anyone who knows me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Knows that I have a strong association with the small European nation of Albania, uh, through family ties to that country, and it's that country I wish to speak about today and some of the happenings and goings on in that country over the last year or more. Now, the history of Albania, of course, is not a pretty one, um, particularly in the last 70 or 80 years, particularly with the reign of um, a, well fairly easily stated evil dictator, Enver Hodja, and the communist regime that oppressed millions of people, um, and the stories that I've been told about the impact that that has had on the lives of people I've met uh, and others who are related uh, to them is um, nothing short of uh, unbearable to listen to, um, something that reminds me again and again of how lucky we are in this country. But as a result of that period of oppression, uh, and the way in which uh, people were oppressed and denied the right to vote, to have their say, to live where they wanted to, to take up the job they wished to take up. Uh, the system they have now, post the fall of communism in the mid-90s, uh, is one that probably isn't what we're used to here in Australia, a system that can't withstand some of the pressures that smaller countries with uh, younger democracies um, would easily fall to. So, uh, it, it's on that basis and knowing some of the issues that they do have in that country that I uh, became very concerned when I saw some of the activity of a member of the diplomatic corps uh, from another country, from the United States, posted to Albania. And I think anyone who has had any interaction with um, the, uh, any member of the diplomatic corps from any country, anywhere in the world, understands the role of a diplomat. 
It is one to work on behalf of the country they represent in the country they are posted to, from head of mission down to the most junior administrative staff member. It's not to become involved in the political process or any judicial process. Uh, it's not to um, offer commentary on political issues of the day. Uh, it is to advocate um, for stronger relations between your home nation, uh, in this case we're talking about the United States, and the nation to which you are posted and uh, a representative of your home nation in, in this case Albania. It's about forging stronger trade ties. It's about talking about security arrangements. It's about uh, assisting um, uh, fellow countrymen and women with visa and passport issues. It's those sorts of things. And uh, as I say, anyone in this chamber, anyone who's ever had to deal with anyone from the diplomatic corps would understand that that is uh, the work of an ambassador, a commissioner, a councillor or anyone else in an embassy, which is why I find it passing strange that the US ambassador to Albania, Ambassador Yuri Kim, has taken it upon herself to offer commentary on the goings-on in that country. A country which, as I say, is fairly volatile when it comes to its political arrangements. Uh, there's often unrest, as we've seen in many European countries, around the outcome of elections and things that happen in between elections. And so it's even more important in a country like that, particularly when you're coming from a country that loves democracy, that is founded on freedoms and liberty, to respect those freedoms and liberties of the people in the country to which you are posted. And so when I see posts from Ambassador Kim reflecting on claims of intimidation of judges and prosecutors, somehow politically motivated, to pervert justice, to insist on impunity for the powerful, to drag Albania back to the past, they don't sound like the words of a diplomatic representative to me. They sound rather activist. And what's more, it's in a public forum. These are not communiques between a head of mission, a representative of a foreign government and the government of that country. These are on Twitter. These are there for public consumption. And because they are the words of a head of mission of a significant, freedom-loving nation, they carry with it a degree of credibility. Um, and there are a range of posts here. And the reason I raise this is because Albania, as I say, a country very close to my own heart, is a fragile country. It has a fragile democracy, and it's one that the people there, whichever side of the political divide they stand on, seek to protect. And so when you have representatives of nations coming in and making comments like that, from the platform of ambassador, no less, it is something we need to be very concerned about. And I call that out today because I don't think it is right for other nations to interfere through diplomatic means in the affairs of another nation. There are appropriate channels for dealing with allegations of corruption and crime, and they should be used. And they should be used by the people within that country, not by diplomatic uh, members of the diplomatic corps. Ambassador Kim's comments, uh, as concerning as they are, from as far away as we are here in Australia, earned the rebuke of a diplomatic colleague, the uh, French ambassador to Albania, who made the point uh, that um, we have to leave matters Albania to the Albanians, that it's not up to us to decide these matters. Her words in an interview with Euronews Albania were, uh, and the ambassador's name, I should add, is Elizabeth Barsak, said that it's not up to foreign ambassadors to decide for Albanians making the point very clear. It is up to those who are electors in that community to make that point. So I wanted to put on record today that these things being done, I suspect <coughs> by a rogue diplomat rather than the US government, are being noticed. And I feel very strongly about it, and I hope it stops. I'm now going to proceed to Is there another senator in the chamber who wants to speak for the last minute and a half? Uh, senator Smith's already made a contribution. Senator 
Senator Scar. I rise in support of the Australian Iranian diaspora. I was absolutely privileged at the end of last year to have the opportunity to attend a public rally in Brisbane and to see the passion, the commitment and the concern of the wonderful Queensland Iranian diaspora. And I've been strengthened by the comments I've heard during the course of this week from all parts of the chamber, from all parts of the chamber, from the government, from the Greens, uh, from coalition members, providing our support to the, our brothers and sisters in Iran and our thoughts and concerns with the Australian Iranian diaspora. We know, we know that there are vile things occurring on the internet, on Facebook, those who are putting up their hand and saying change must come to Iran. Iranian people deserve freedom, deserve democracy, deserve their human rights to be protected. And we know people who are raising their voices in Australia have been subject to attacks on the internet. And I say to each and every one of those people, you have the support of every single senator in this place. We stand with you. We stand with our brothers and sisters in the Australian-Iranian diaspora, and we all stand united for human rights in Iran. I will now proceed to two-minute statements. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise with great enthusiasm to inform the House of an exciting development in our vitally important meat production sector. In an age when the noble art of growing food and fibre is scorned by green and vegan activists, Australian meat producers can keep holding their heads high after more than 650 international scientists signed the Dublin Declaration, endorsing the role of meat and its production methods. The declaration was made late last year at the International Summit on the Societal Role of Meat, which also highlighted the need to increase meat production to combat nutritional deficiencies affecting billions of people worldwide. The scientists also found that well-managed livestock production can improve soil health and aid carbon sequestration. In October last year, the United Nations reported that the number of people affected by hunger has more than doubled in the past three years, and almost a million people are living in famine. The World Food Programme reports that a record 349 million people across 79 countries are facing acute food insecurity, up from 287 million in 2021. And putting it simply, we simply need to dramatically increase our food production. Australia, with its space, quality controls, sustainability and cutting-edge approach to animals, genetics and welfare, is perfectly placed to improve the lives of people worldwide. Just this week, I convened a gathering of the Parliamentary Friends of Red Meat, along with co-chair Raf Senator Raf Ciccone, and was proud to host representatives of various national livestock bodies. Australia currently exports about 70 per cent of all of its beef, sheep and goat meat that we produce, making us the largest exporter. I heartily congratulate our meat industry and the work that they do. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Billick. I rise to put on the record my sincere thanks to the Ambassador of Ukraine, His Excellency Vassil Miroshenko, for visiting my home state of Tasmania. The Ambassador was the guest of honour at a reception hosted by the Governor of Tasmania, Her Excellency Barbara Baker, AC. And he met with members of the Tasmanian Ukrainian community and an event hosted by the Association of Ukraines in Tasmania. Both, of, it, both those events I was present at. And I also had the pleasure of having dinner with the ambassador, joined by the president of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations, Stefan Romanu, and my husband, Robert, who is of Ukrainian descent. I'm especially grateful for Mr Miroshenko that he took the time to visit our beautiful state where he has, when he has the difficult job of appealing for help defending the survival of his country. And I also thank the Ambassador for agreeing to speak at the official launch of the Australian-Ukraine Parliamentary Friendship Group, which I am hosting as Chair with Deputy Chair Senator Van. Many members and senators have already replied positively to our invitation, so it should be a great event. The illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia has brought Australia and Ukraine closer together. It has strengthened the connection of Australians with the Ukrainian diaspora in Australia. 
and I appreciate the extraordinary efforts of many Australians to connect with the Ukrainian community to help and support Ukrainian refugees arriving in Australia and contribute to the humanitarian aid in Ukraine itself. It gives me a great sense of pride that Australia is the largest non-NATO contributor of aid to Ukraine, both lethal and non-lethal. And even though Ukraine is half a world away, Australia rightly recognises that Russia cannot be allowed to succeed in its plans. If the global community had not come to Ukraine's aid, then the security, sovereignty and territorial integrity of every country would be at risk. Okay. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. In November, the Parliamentary Friends of International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance wrote to university vice-chancellors urging them to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. This definition has been widely criticized, including by progressive Jewish organizations, for its ability to stifle academic freedom, silence Palestinian voices, and prevent legitimate criticism of Israel. The need to apply scrutiny to Israel's actions has never been greater. 2022 was the deadliest year for Palestinians living under occupation since the Second Intifada ended in 2005. A day before being sworn into office, the new right-wing conservative government of Israel explicitly called settlement expansion in the occupied West Bank its top priority. Critical commentary on these unjust and violent actions should not be silenced. The State of Israel has to be called out for its ongoing apartheid and oppression of Palestinians. Universities should be politically active places. That is why last week, Senator Steele John and I wrote to university VCs urging them not to adopt the IHRA definition. We firmly believe anti-Semitism, like all racism, is abhorrent and must be condemned and consider that universities should uphold and strengthen their existing policies on all forms of discrimination rather than adopt the definition. Universities must ensure all students and staff, including those who are Palestinian, are protected and can speak freely. Unfortunately, some universities were quick to adopt the definition, but I was heartened to see the common sense approach shown by others, including Griffith, James Cook and UQ, in indicating they did not intend to do so. I encourage other universities to show the same resolve. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Labor government's broken election promise on urgent care clinics and the impact that this will have on my fellow Tasmanians. We've seen the Albanese Labor government renege on a number of major policy announcements that they made during the election campaign, most notably their broken promise to save Australians an average of $275 on their power bills. It seems that making what appears to be genuine commitments during an election campaign and then delivering on those promises when elected is a completely novel concept for the Labor government. Just last month, media reports revealed yet another broken promise on a key election commitment in my home state of Tasmania. On the eve of the election, the Labor opposition's shadow finance minister promised the delivery of 50 urgent care clinics which would occur within the first 12 months of government, including three in Tasmania to be located on the northwest coast in Burnie, in the north of the state in Launceston and one in Greater Hobart. They promised all 50 would be operational within their first year of government, yet Labor has announced the expressions of interest for just three. Now, I would be very surprised if the government can even deliver one urgent care clinic, let alone the 50 that they promised during the election campaign would be open in 12 months' time. Tasmanians were promised these health care services in the north, in the northwest and in the south of the state, and Tasmanians deserve to know whether the government still intends to deliver these clinics in the proposed timeframes. Because if they can't deliver that commitment that they set out in May last year to provide vital health care services across the state, then Labor has misled the Tasmanian people. This latest broken promise just goes to show that Labor is all talk and no delivery. The people of Tasmania deserve more respect. Senator Polly. I rise to speak about the importance of nutrition and what it means in the health space and how it can change lives and communities for the better. We all go on a health journey, a food journey and an exercise journey throughout our lives. I've spoken many times before about the importance of preventative health and how it can improve your life. 
Well, nutrition is part of a preventative health strategy for a healthy and long life. Nutrition is important for a healthy physical and mental state. When people think about nutrition, most of us think about a food uh, pyramid. But nutrition is more than that. It's more important than ever that we educate ourselves as there is so much information out in the community on social media now about different diets and lifestyle choices. Nutrition is the biochemical and physiology process by which an organism uses food to support its life. In our case, it provides humans with nutrition which will be metabolised to create energy and chemical structures. Failure to obtain sufficient nutrition may cause malnutrition, poor health outcomes, and ultimately nutrition is a critical part of health and development of your entire life. Better nutrition is uh, related to important and it can't be expressed more importantly than when we're talking about infants and child health, maternal health, stronger immune systems, safer pregnancies and childbirth, lower risks of non-communicable diseases such as diabetics and cardiovascular disease and longevity. It can stave off disease and potentially um, early death. This is why it's so important that it interconnectness to the way we live the way we are educated and our lives are, are lived. What I'm doing is I'm a establishing a Friends of Nutrition, so I encourage my colleagues in this chamber to be part of that new exciting friendship Thank you, group. Senator Foley. Um, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the Firefighters Alliance that are here in Canberra seeking our support and our help. These are the people that have been denied their jobs back. When we had the COVID-19, Vaccination mandates were put in place by state governments to force people to have the vaccine. What has happened is there is about 250 firefighters across New South Wales and Victoria that have not given back their jobs. I had people in my office with 116 years of experience denied their right to provide for their families and do a job that they are passionate about and they love for their communities. Why is it that in Victoria, three mandates for vaccinations, the last one was March 19, 20, 2022, no vaccinations for, for nearly a year. In New South Wales, two vaccinations, the last one was December 2021. So the people they work around are not vaccinated, and yet they cannot get their jobs back because they're not vaccinated. To me, this is bloody-mindedness by the state governments because these people have allowed others back into the workforce, whether they be you know, teachers and also the police and other services, but not these people because they stood up for their rights because they believe in pro-choice goes into their body. There is no clear indication what harm they are doing. It has come out in evidence that it is not contagious. It can't be passed. If you had the vaccination, I'm sorry, it can still be passed. There is no clear evidence. It's about time we start to support these people. Another thing is, these people cannot go to an emergency to fight fires or national disasters. They can't cross the borders to help their, their mates. And they can't help the Australian community. If they go and sign up as a volunteer, they can, but not as firefighters. I call on every senator here to start backing them and get them back into the jobs where they should be. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Little. Thank you. South Australians were listening when the Prime Minister promised 97 times they would get a $275 reduction in their energy bills. But we don't hear it now, not from the PM, not from Labor MPs and senators from South Australia. The cash rate is up at 3.35 per cent, and that means mortgages too. This month, Adelaide's median house price is 565000 so with a 500000 loan, you could be paying a total of 908 more a month. Inflation is at 7.8 per cent, with the impact worse for those on fixed incomes or in regional and remote areas. South Australia is highly centralised in its geography and, amongst other factors, is affected differently and disproportionately. But you can be sure your mortgages, your taxes will be higher under the actions of this Labor government. The SA Productivity Commission report of 2022 found South Australian retail consumers continue to face the highest electricity prices across the national energy market. In fact, they pay the highest average quarterly electricity bill in the nation at $322.
That is $82 more than the lowest quarterly bill of all other states and territories. A 55 per cent power price rise is forecast over the next two years for SA households, and they've got to cop that. What is the plan to put downward pressure on inflation and ensuring South Australian industry and small business remains viable and families can support their children? They're feeling the pain right now. Got no problem with funding childcare and cheaper prescriptions, but they need a plan for inflation, not an essay, and definitely not to be told they have to wait. Cost of living is the most important issue for particularly South Australians, but also for all Australians. Are you listening? It seems not. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I want to begin by uh, saying hello to all of the Labor members who live down in the uh, area of Farrah and the Riverina, and particularly I acknowledge the, the branch leadership uh, out down at the Griffith branch. I want to pay tribute today to the life of uh, a great member of the Griffith Labor Party, Peter Knox, uh, a Labor stalwart who fought for uh, his values all through his life in the toughest of territories for Labor. And, uh, he was a very honourable man and much regarded by his colleagues uh, in the Labor Party and also by local constituents. Peter joined the Labor Party in 1972 after attending a campaign meeting held there by Gough Whitlam in a local club in Griffith. Uh, Peter was born in Ardlethen but lived most of his life in Griffith where he worked as a qualified painter. He later ran for parliament as a Labor candidate in 2007 and in that, uh, the course of that battle he achieved a sizeable 4.62 swing to Labor. He later went on to serve as the senior vice president of the Griffith branch. Peter never stopped advocating for Labor beliefs and policy. He stood on pre-poll booths as a servant of democracy for the last 45 years of elections. What a great Australian. Whatever party you belong to, to stand up for your values and principles and serve democracy in that way is a profound contribution to our democratic structures. Um, I also know that he fought very, very hard uh, for a midweek train service from Sydney to Griffith. Peter was a, a life member of the United Services Union, a dedicated supporter of the Sydney Swans and a big fan of cold beer at the Exes Club in, in Griffith. Sadly, Peter left us uh, on uh, the 14th of, of September last year, aged 82, after a long battle with lung disease. He'll be sorely missed by his friends and family, but his life stands as a tribute to his labour values and his advocacy. Vale Peter Knox, I pray Thank you, that his memory O'Neill. is Senator a blessing. Senator Steele John. Folks with ADHD in the country are being left behind. 2023 is the year that we can and must change this. Last year in this place I shared some data from a survey that my office asked the ADHD community around the country to complete. We heard from over 10,000 community members and the experiences that they shared with us revealed some huge gaps um, in our healthcare system and in the systems that are meant to support people with ADHD. I heard clearly that the wait times to get appointments are currently too long, that if you can find a medical professional uh, with appointments available, um, it is often outside of your geographical location. Getting an ADHD diagnosis in this country is just too costly. People are right now being stigmatised accessing medications that they need, and they are too costly these medications uh, if you can finally get onto them. It is clear that there are many decisions with this, which government makes uh, that are putting barriers in the way. To the community, let me be really clear. I hear you. The Greens hear you. And I am happy to share with you um, that the Australian Greens party room have agreed to my proposal for a parliamentary inquiry into ADHD diagnosis and the care in this country that is provided to the community, um, and that we hope that the government will back our proposal when the time comes. This inquiry will give us the opportunity to radically transform the lives of millions. We can only address the many shortfalls in this space by first acknowledging that they exist. Together we can fix ADHD care in this country. We here in this place and you in the community together, let's get it done. 
Thank you. Senator Babbitt. I rise here today to speak of a most distressing situation. Now, the situation is the disastrous effect of vaccine mandates. Now, I know that there are some here in this place that wish this issue was forgotten. Swept under the rug, but there are a lot of people that are still suffering right now. Now, obviously, we all know that people have lost their jobs, but arguably worse, people have also been denied medical care. Let's be honest, it's still an experimental, zero long-term safety data mRNA injection. Now, I'd like to bring to the attention of the Senate the inhumane treatment of Vicky, one of my constituents in Victoria. A 47-year-old mother of two, Vicky is suffering from serious heart failure, and she has been denied a heart transplant by the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. This denial is based on her choice not to take the mRNA injection, even though she has a legal exemption in line with the TAGI guidelines, which the hospital refuses to acknowledge. Now, it is well documented that these injections can cause heart issues like myocarditis and pericarditis. Now, for Vicky, her vaccination may increase the risk associated with her already failing heart. She's suffering physically and psychologically, and she's currently on life support and has an external pump attached to her, which helps her heart to move blood around her body. Now, it is a matter of life and death for her. Now, this hospital is adamant that they will not list her for life-saving heart transplant surgery, even though she is medically ready and she has undertaken all the tests required. Now, Vicky, she is just one example of how these mandates are hurting people. We must lift the mandates. We must allow people like Vicky to get the life-saving treatment that they need. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to stand up for the magnificent doctors, midwives and nurses at Epworth Geelong's maternity service and the thousands of women and families who have relied on this vital service since 2016. They have been abandoned by their local Labor MPs, by the Albanese and Andrews Labor governments, by a lacklustre nurses union and by Epworth's cold-hearted management. Given the tens of millions of dollars that Epworth Geelong received in state and federal funding, including to help build a full-service hospital, the closure of the maternity unit constitutes a real betrayal of our community. I condemn the appalling lack of action and lack of compassion from the member for Corio and the member for Corangamite in the other place, who stood idly by as women and families pleaded for help. Their failure to do anything is appalling. Our public hospital system depends on a strong private health system, and as Senator Rustin has made clear after we met with Epworth Management, Labor's health minister has a workforce crisis on his hands, and rather than working with his state counterparts, he is leaving regional communities high and dry, including the people of Geelong. In the fastest growing region in the country, we cannot afford to lose any health services, public or private, especially as state Labor has put the Barman Women and Children's Facility on the back burner. I also condemn Epworth, driven by cost-cutting, which ran a sham consultation and recruitment process to justify closing its maternity unit, so seriously misleading its two obstetric practices based there that this could constitute a breach of the law. That's why I've reported Epworth to the ACCC. I, I congratulate my Liberal parliamentary colleagues who have stood up for Epworth. If we had in, been in power, this never would have happened. Labor and Epworth, hang your heads in shame. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Remember getting on the train when you were a little kid, the wind on your face as you chugged down the coastline, the sound of the engine and the wheels on the track? Tassie doesn't have any passenger trains, doesn't have many passenger trains anymore, and I think we're missing out. We need to stop tourists turning left on the Bass Highway and driving straight to Lonnie and Hobart. We need them on the other side. There's a lot of great things happening on the coast, but we need something to make a splash. And the Don, Rail River, the Don River Railway is sitting right there ready to expand. It's going to cost money, and the former federal government promised $20 million during the election, but unfortunately you guys didn't win. Now the ball's in Labor's court. Don River Railway wants to take passengers from Devonport to Penguin. Imagine the tourism dollars in that for the North West Coast, you beauty. And to do this, they need money to fix up those tracks. 
There will be a cafe, restaurant, an event facility, a shiny new visitor centre, so tourists can learn about the history of the railway and about all the steam trains, not just in Tasmania, but right across the world. There will be a special play area for the kids and tours of the workshops where they restore the old trains and carriages. A passenger train will make tourists want to spend more nights on the coast. They will spend more money in our hotels, cafes and shops and markets instead of going down the south to Hobart. No offence between the competition between the north and south, but bugger it, we want it. I know the team behind the project have put in a submission for the May budget. Money's tight and a lot of things need funding. But seriously, this project could be an absolute game changer for Penguin, Devonport and the surrounding towns on the northwest coast. It will become a tourist icon, although it already pretty much is, for us. I'd like to see other Tasmanian senators show their support for this project too. We're up to help. We're up here to help Tasmania. That's our job, and this project is a damn good idea and, I, and should receive res, um, support. And I know I'll be the first one lining up to get back on that steam train and have another shot at it. But I'd like to go a bit further than about five kilometres, 30 or 40, and supporting buying a coffee uh, 20 minutes away would be fabulous for the town of Penguin. Thank, thank you. you, Senator Scar. Uh, thank you. Deputy President, and I'll come on that train with you, Senator Lambie, and I'll even shout you a coffee when we get to the other end. Absolutely. Couldn't think of something I'd rather do in the great state of Tasmania. Madam Acting Deputy President, I refer to what appears to be, from media reports, the Prime Minister's backflip with respect to the provision of information to voters in the forthcoming referendum. If this is in fact correct, if this is in fact correct, I'd like to congratulate the Prime Minister for listening to the arguments which the coalition has been put forward that the Australian people deserve to know the detail. The Australian people deserve to hear the arguments both for and against, put in an appropriate, respectful, civil fashion, and then make their own decision. And then make their own decision. That is the process. That is the process which, which we should be embracing. So the government should be providing an information pamphlet outlining a yes and no case. And the government should be providing equal funding, equal funding to the official yes and no campaigns. That should be provided. And then it is up to the Australian people to come to their decision. And just in this regard, just in this regard, I go back to that beautiful piece of literature and philosopher John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, where he said the corollary of freedom of speech the corollary of freedom of speech is the right of people to hear the arguments. The right of people to hear. That's the corollary of someone's right to freedom of speech, is the right of the audience to hear both sides of the argument and then to form their own view based on their own contemplation of the arguments for and against in a civil matter like we saw in this chamber earlier today. Like we saw in this chamber earlier today, in particular Senator Nampa Jimpa Price and Senator McCarthy. Civil, respectful Thank you, discourse. Senator Scar. Senator Green. I've given the call to Senator uh, Green, okay. and I'll come to you uh, after Senator Green. Thank you. Uh <clears throat> I've allocated the call. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Thank Take you, seat. Acting, <laughs> acting um, President. Um, this week, um, we've learned that once again the Liberal National Party is going to turn their back on manufacturing in this country. At the last election, Labor was very clear about our commitment. We want to bring manufacturing home and we'll be bringing manufacturing back to regional Queensland. The National Reconstruction Fund will invest $15 billion in rebuilding Australia's manufacturing industry. It will provide loans, equity investment and guarantees for modern manufacturing, clean energy, defence and medical projects and technologies. It has been carefully designed as a targeted strategic investment to make sure that we secure our long-term security and prosperity. And it will create good, secure jobs in my home state of Queensland. But those opposite have already said that they're going to vote against the National Reconstruction Fund, a $15 billion fund for manufacturing in this country. Now, it is, they have form for turning their backs on manufacturing, and I've, I'm yet to understand the motives for doing this. What Am I yet, what I'm yet to figure out is exactly why they have turned their backs on Aussie workers and Australian manufacturing once again. Perhaps they can help me out. 
Are they voting against the legislation because you're embarrassed of the legacy that you left for Australian manufacturing? Do you not want to admit that you oversaw the hollowing out of the manufacturing industry that Australians once were proud of? Is it not the LNP's cup of tea to deliver this important investment because there will be investment in renewables, which I know some of the people opposite could get a little bit upset about? And did they decide, did they decide against supporting manufacturing because there will actually be a return on investment and good, secure jobs for regional Queenslanders? They killed the car industry. Uh, thank you, they Senator smashed Green. manufacturing and uh, order. Senator Thorpe. President, I rise today as a senator for the Black Grassroots Movement, a movement that has existed in this country for tens of thousands of generations, a movement that I was raised in, a movement that my children and grandchildren are being raised in. Sovereignty has never been ceded in this country. The generations of staunch black activists who came before me fought not for themselves, but for the continuation and survival of the oldest culture on this planet. For the generations to inherit their cultural birthright, that is, un that is sovereignty unceded. Sovereignty may seem like a new and uncomfortable concept within the walls of this building because this place was built with a vision that my sovereign body would never walk a foot in here, that my ancestors' stories of fight, of pain, of survival would not survive the war this building declared on them, on us and on me. Well, I stand here to declare that we are still here. We are here, and Thank I'm proud you, to be guided Thorpe. by Your black time excellence. Has expired. We'll now move to question time, and I'm going to Senator Fawcett. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Was the Assistant Treasurer reflecting government policy on interest rates this morning when he said, and I quote, we think that what's already in the system should do the job to ensure that we can dampen down demand, end quote. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I just missed the end of the question, but I, th I think I've got it. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, if you wouldn't mind. Sorry, you, I just Senator missed the Fawcett, end of it. If you wouldn't mind repeating. So, thank you, Senator Reeves. I'll do that. Was the Assistant Treasurer reflecting government policy on interest rates this morning when he said that, and I quote, we think what's already in the system should do the job to ensure that we can dampen down demand." End quote. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, President. I haven't actually seen the transcript of, of that interview, but I, I do understand that the Assistant Treasurer well, the, I do understand that the Assistant Treasurer um, was outlining uh, that our, about our government's plan to deliver on cost of living relief. He also indicated that the RBA has a tough job to do and that the RBA is independent. Um, and those statements are correct. The RBA does have a difficult job to do. It is independent of government. It makes decisions based on the information that it has available to it at the time. The government's position reflects that. It's an independent body making decisions on monetary policy in this country. The area where the government has, the area where the government has something uh, to do is on making sure that our, our decision making, the decisions we make in relation to the budget and others, do not make the job of the reserve banks uh, harder. And that is the government's position. Thank you, Minister. Senator Fawcett, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, President, despite the um, minister saying that what they have in place would dampen down demand, the RBA said in its statement yesterday, and I quote, the board expects that further increases in interest rates will be needed over the months ahead to ensure that inflation returns to the target and that this period of high inflation is only temporary. End quote. The assistant treasurer said this morning, quote, I'm hoping if this is not the last, talking about interest rate rises, it's near the last of the rate rises. End quote. Minister, why does the Albanese government contradict the RBA? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister Gallagher. Well, the government isn't contradicting um, the RBA, and I've read, I've, I've read um, the governor's uh, statement on the mon monetary policy decision. 
uh, and it's very clear that the Reserve Bank is making decisions about how to get deal with the inflation challenge and how to return inflation to uh, more normal levels. Um, it's a challenge not only for the Reserve Bank but for the government as well. Um, and of course, the bank needs to make these de decisions independent of any influence. They, we have total and utter trust in them making the decisions uh, that they need to do to ensure that inflation doesn't remain higher for longer. And they are saying that they are seeing inflation moderating. The challenge for the government in working with the Reserve Bank and not against it is to make sure that the decisions we take uh, are supportive and working alongside monetary policy and not against it, which is why the decisions we're taking the budget are informed by that. Thank you, Minister. Dealing Your time has expired. Senator Fawcett, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, with the increase in the cash rate to 3.35 per cent, the eighth successive rise under your government, it will add more than $10,000 in extra repayments for the average Australian family with a variable rate mortgage. She couldn't answer that yesterday. With no plan to tackle inflation, a treasurer distracted by writing essays, and an assistant treasurer who contradicts the central bank, isn't it the case that Australians will keep paying more under your government? Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Conveniently, in that question, left off the fact that there was an interest rate increase uh, during the month of May when you were uh, in, in government uh, and at the highest rate of inflation quarter, the highest quarter of inflation growth was in the March quarter last year. Who was in government uh, then? And who was in, in government was then? This is an inflation oh, challenge that we inherited. We inherited this challenge. Order. The government has a plan to deal with it. Order. It's to deal with uh, cost of living relief where we don't add to inflation. It's to deal with some of the supply chain problems that we've been seeing as a result of the war in Ukraine and the end of the pandemic. And the third thing is to deal with the budget mess that we inherited from you lot and to show spending restraint in some of the decisions that we take in the May budget. So it's incorrect to say the government doesn't have a plan. We do have a plan. We are implementing the plan and uh, we look forward to more of that in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Marielle Smith. No, I beg your pardon, Senator Sheldon. I need my glasses on. Good, thank you. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. The situation in Turkey and, uh, Turkey and also in Syria continues to deteriorate. What else would the government do to assist those in affected areas? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, Minister Wong. Thank you, uh, Senator Sheldon, for the question. Uh, and I know. I speak for all in this chamber that we have been watching the heartbreaking scenes from Turkey and Syria with horror. Uh, yesterday, as I indicated to the chamber, the Prime Minister announced an initial commitment of $10 million in humanitarian aid to support the people affected. I'm also pleased to announce uh, that earlier today, following advice from my department, I agreed to activate an Oz Assist plan to deploy an urban search and rescue team of up to 72 personnel to Turkey Air to assist local authorities. Our National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, is now conducting an urgent assessment to ensure the safety of Australian personnel. NEMA is working closely with Fire and Rescue New South Wales, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the ADF to coordinate the deployment as soon as possible. These are urban search and rescue specialists, highly trained to locate, deliver medical assistance to and remove victims who have been trapped or impacted by a structural collapse. Uh, these are uh, extremely difficult times. I think all of us uh, have been horrified uh, by the scenes of devastation and the stories of uh, human tragedy uh, that we are witnessing. Uh, there, are also, uh, there is also so much heroism uh, and um, compassion for one's fellow uh, man and woman and child. Uh, that is on display uh, in these areas, which already have been um, uh, you know, so devastated in many cases. So uh, if we are able to assist, notwithstanding we are a long way away, I'm sure all of us uh, would want the government uh, to support our personnel to, to engage in such assistance. Thank you, Mr Wong. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Can the minister update the Senate on assistance being provided to Australians and their loved ones impacted by the unfolding emergency? Minister Wong. 
Uh, I know uh, that this is uh, a distressing not, a, not, not only to all Australians, uh, but particularly to members of the Turkish Australian uh, and Syrian communities, particularly those with loved ones in the areas. And I thought Senator Birmingham's contribution yesterday, where he uh, spoke about their experience, uh, was uh, very moving. Uh, Australian diplomatic missions in Ankara, Beirut and Istanbul are working closely with local authorities to ascertain the welfare of our citizens. Uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is providing consular assistance, uh, including to the families of four Australians who were in the region at the time of the earthquake and, I regret to say, at this stage remain unaccounted for. Obviously, their safety is our immediate priority, and consular officials in Ankara are working with local authorities and others on the ground to assist them. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is working to provide consular assistance to around 40 other Australians and their families who are in the earthquake Thank area. You, Mr. Wong, the time for the answer in this question has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister provide an update to the Senate on how Australia's initial contribution is assisting those on the ground? Minister Wong. Uh, yesterday, the Prime Minister announced, as I said, the initial uh, $10 million contribution in humanitarian aid. Today, I can provide a, 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 some update to Senators about how these resources are being used and intended to be used. UNICEF has commenced assessment of water infrastructure and health infrastructure da damage. They have dispatched more than 1,000 prepositioned water, sanitation and hygiene kits. And is prepositioning and are prepositioning another 10,000 kids. UNICEF is also leading the education response for displaced families seeking shelter in schools. Local Red Cross and Red Crescent teams have been assisting with search and rescue, transportation to hospitals, and first aid and distribution of essential non-food items. Uh, we will continue to work with partners to do all that is possible to assist those affected by this tragedy. Thank you, Minister. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. The Prime Minister in October 2019 supposedly led the charge to kick John Setka out of the Australian Labor Party, where he said, quote, John Setka isn't welcome to stay as a member, and I am pleased he is gone, end quote. And his values aren't the same as Labor's values, end quote. Given that Mr Setka's CF MMEU division gave the Australian Labor Party over $1 million in the last financial year. Can you confirm that Mr Setka's supposed expulsion from the party was nothing but a fancy charade, considering you still accept his tainted money? Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, Yes, we, 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 uh, we, we can always assume uh, that those opposite will fight about climate change uh, and will uh, unite around uh, trade unions, uh, against trade unions. Uh, order. Uh, order. It's one of, one, of, one of the few things you actually agree on. Uh, we, we have made clear, uh, the Prime Minister has made clear, as leader of the party, uh, his views about Mr. Setka's personal membership, personal membership of the C of the Australian Labor Party. Uh, there are many people who might point to the failure uh, of of those opposite at times to deal with some people in their ranks. But the Prime Minister, as leader of the party in opposition, uh, was clear about his view of the, the Mr Setka's membership of the Australian Labor Party, and that matter was dealt with by the party organisation. Uh, the matter of donations is a matter, as you know, for the party organisation. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Scar, first supplementary. Thank you, President. I'm not sure what the High Court has said about climate change, but I know what they've said about the CFMEU. They've actually called it a recidivist offender and that the CFMEU considers law-breaking to be a cost of doing business. Can you confirm that the Prime Minister is willing to ignore the behaviour of Mr Secker and the CFMEU because they're $4.3 million in donations to the Labor Party? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. Uh, that, that allegation is untrue, and the senator knows it. Uh, we have been clear uh, about our view that law-breaking that criminal conduct in any context is unacceptable. Thank you, Senator.
uh, Wong. Uh, second supplementary, Senator Carr. Scar. Thank you, President. Um, in distinction, in contradistinction to the Prime Minister, Premier Malinowskis intervened to ensure South Australia Labor returned a donation of $125,000 from the Victorian CFMEU. When will the Prime Minister Albanese show the same leadership as Premier Malinowskis and return Federal Labor's multi-million dollar donations from the CFMEU? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Wong. Uh, as I've uh, indicated in my previous answer, the Prime Minister has made clear his views about Mr Setka. He has made here clear his, his views and the Australian Labor Party's views about compliance with the law, and matters of donations are the responsibility of the party organisation. Thank you, Minister Wong. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, President. Next month, my question is to the uh, Foreign Minister. Next month marks 20 years since the Howard government's uh, participation in the catastrophic invasion of Iraq, a war that has killed hundreds of thousands, displaced millions, and left millions more uh, with a trauma that will last generations. Is it the government's view that the 2003 US-led invasion of Iraq was illegal under international law? And convention. Thank you, Senator Steele John, Minister Wong. Uh, as the Senator would know, uh, uh, the Australian Labor Party at the time uh, placed its views on the public record on these issues. I don't intend to add to them, uh, and nor do I uh, believe at this stage in 2023, 2023 that this is the most important foreign policy priority that the government faces. The more important foreign policy priority that this government faces, that this parliament faces, is the fact that we live in the most difficult strategic circumstances since World War II. And we have to make decisions as a people, as a government, as a parliament about how we deal with that. The government has been clear we will deal with that by utilising all levers of Australian power, both invest through investing in strategic capability but also investing in our diplomatic capability, investing in our diplomacy, in our relationships, because this is part of how we try and keep Australians safe, how we work to keep Australians safe at a time, at a time, at a time where we face these difficulties in our region. Uh, and I've spoken at length about this. Now, it may be that you wish to engage in uh, a, an historic accounting. That's a matter for you, Senator Steele John. My focus is very much on what we have to do now and into the future. Thank you, Minister. Senator Steele John, first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, of all the responses I prepared for, an effective no comment was not one of them. Let me try one more time. The United Nations has declared the invasion illegal. The advice given to your party was that the invasion was illegal. The broad legal consensus is that the US invasion was illegal. Is it the current view of the Australian government that the US invasion of Iraq was illegal under international law and convention? Uh, that's time. Thanks, Senator Steele. John Minister Wong. Uh, uh, look, I, 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 will, I don't propose to add to the response I gave to the primary. Well, no, because it is, it is uh, the same question. Uh, if, I'm sure through estimates you can speak to the international lawyers in the room if you wish to do so, uh, because this ultimately uh, is a question that might be determined by an international tribunal or court. But uh, as foreign minister at this time, you know, given the, the responsibility and privilege of the job I have, I'm really clear about what my priorities are, and I've outlined them in the earlier answer. Thank you. Order. I'm, uh, Senator Steele John, before I invite you to ask your second supplementary, I remind you that to ask the question and refrain from commentary. So please ask your second supplementary. Thank you. Twenty years on, will the Labor government, in the name of all who have died and all who continue to suffer, commit to releasing all relevant documentation surrounding the advice to the Howard government about the invasion of Iraq so that Australians can judge for themselves the actions that were committed in their name and whether those actions were illegal, given that we went to war without a single politician being asked to cast a vote. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, Minister. First, in, in relation to the first part of the answer, I'll take on notice uh, what documents can or can't be released. <laughs> 
uh, and I'm sure we can have a conversation <coughs> about uh, this further at estimates. As I said, obviously we, you know, the Australian Labor Party has made its previous views on these matters clear, but I would also point to your last comment. Uh, I think your last comment suggests that, as per the Greens policy, that there should be a parliamentary vote before the executive can commit the ADF to any uh, conflict or, or to any other part of the world. Uh, I've made it clear uh, in discussions in estimates that that's not a view uh, that I share. It's not a view that the government shares. You know, we, we do believe in, the, the, in ministerial accountability. We do believe the parliament uh, should be entitled uh, to appropriate uh, to scrutinise the decision of the executive. The executive should account to the, to the parliament for such a decision. But it is, in, in our view, important for the security of the country that that remains a power and prerogative of the executive. Thank you, Minister Wong. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Albanese government is strengthening Medicare? Minister. Thank you. Thank you, President. And, uh, I can, and I thank Senator Smith for the question. Last week, the Prime Minister chaired the National Cabinet meeting, which included consideration of the report from the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. Senators will recall that Labor went to the election with a commitment to improve primary care through $750 million commitment to strengthen Medicare and the establishment of the Strengthening Medicare Task Force and, to take the interjection, to establish urgent care centres across Australia, which we are also doing, and working with the states and territories to improve access to after-hours emergency care. I should point out, Ms. Uh, President, that we were the only party to commit additional investment in Medicare at the 2022 election, probably not surprising in the sense that the former government had, had done everything they could to undermine Medicare over the years, Cut it. Um, cutting it, it uh, 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 putting uh, the indexation rates and, and, and um, capping the indexation rates so that it, it affected general practice. Labor is the only party of Medicare. Uh, we know this mob over there wanted to end it. We what know you, you want to undermine care? it. It's the backbone of our health care system. It's the foundation that has provided the care that Australians need, deserve and expect. And the Australian people expect their government to look at ways to invest in Medicare not to weaken it, not to cut it, but to look at ways to make it work better for Senator them Rustin. and put downward Senator costs Rustin. on their um, on the expenses of accessing health care. We know we've got a big challenge ahead. We've got an ageing population, more chronic disease, complex care needs, and the Australian community needs and expects Medicare to be there to meet their needs. We can't do this alone. We will work in partnership with the states and territories to make sure the health system meets the needs of the future. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. As order, order. Interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Order, Senator Wong. Order, Senator Rustin. Um, Senator Mariel Smith, uh, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister outline why Medicare needs strengthening? Minister. Yes, I can. I thank um, Senator Smith for the question. Primary health care is in crisis. The shadow minister herself has said that our health system is in crisis at a number of levels, and she even went on to say perhaps we should have been more challenging in Senator reform. Senator Henderson. Oh, what does that mean? That was, oh, that was Senator Rustin, shadow minister for health. We should have been more challenging in reform. Mm, what does that mean? Co-payments? It might be. Cuts? It could be. They were the reforms that the government, when you were in power, sought to put in place. The crisis in primary health care is a product of a deliberate decisions made by the former government. Uh, there is no person in Australia who bears more responsibility for this than the now leader of the opposition, right. a man voted by Australia's doctors as the worst health, health minister in a generation. It's a hard award to get, but he won it. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Mariel Smith, second supplementary. Order on my left. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, President. Can the minister outline the major challenges to strengthening Medicare? 
Uh, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. I can. There are challenging challenges, including the considerable workforce challenges that we inherited and that we are dealing with. And one of the biggest challenges we're dealing now is the legacy of terminating measures, ah. unfunded measures in the health and aged care portfolio left to us by the co coalition. We see what must have happened when the health and aged care Order. ministers went to ERC. Order. They must have gone to ERC and said, we need some extra money for these things. And the ERC must have said to them, well, you can have it for one year or maybe two years, and then it's going to end. And that's what we're dealing with now, hundreds of measures that terminate, that just end. 30th of June, no more money. Sorry, adult, adult dental program. We know that adults still have teeth and might still need dentist services after the 30th of June, uh, but we're not going to fund it. It's a terminating measure. Well, we're dealing with that. We're cleaning up your mess. Thank you, uh, Minister Gallagher. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. The Prime Minister has stated that an Indigenous voice to Parliament will consult Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on matters that affect them. If that's the case, will you please provide the Australian people and me with the government's list of all the matters which don't affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, given I'm asked about uh, the voice, I would like to acknowledge, if I may, the ten leaders from empowered communities who are in the President's Gallery today uh, as part of their visit to Canberra to advocate uh, for, from the grassroots for constitutional recognition through the voice to Parliament. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Senator Hanson, I, I appreciate your position on the voice, and I think you've made that clear, and probably no answer I, I will give you will satisfy you, because I think you have made your opposition to this clear. Uh, I would make this point. Uh, I would first make the point the voice is about two things. It is about recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in our constitution, and it is about consultation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on matters that affect them. Uh, in terms of the, the various aspects of detail, um, can we, I, I would make two points. First, the referendum working group have already offered principles of what the voice would look like. The second point I make is if Australians see fit to change our constitution the way I hope they do, you, alongside with every other member and senator in this parliament, will have a say in how that voice operates because it is parliament that will legislate. There will be consultation and there will be legislation, just as you have a right at the moment to, be, uh, to, to uh, respond to and deal with legislation that comes before the chamber. And I Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. No. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yep, you're right. Are you on a point of order? Matter of relevance, it's past half the time of the, of the ministry to respond to my question. It was directly matter. Uh, I asked directly um, about what matters that will um, that, that do, don't affect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Hasn't even touched uh, on that thank whatsoever. You, Senator it's a matter of Senator, relevance. You've please. raised a point of order. Please resume your seat. You also asked at the beginning of your question about. Uh, a broad question about the voice. You referred to comments the Prime Minister had made, so the, the Minister Wong is being relevant. Please continue. Uh, well, Senator Hanson, I'm not, not, not Senator Hanson. I am trying to respond very honestly because the reality is those no, because those, those matters those matters will be the subject of a discussion in this parliament and a discussion with the community should Australians vote for a constitutional recognition. What people? What people? Order, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson, order. You've asked your question. Senator Hanson, I've called you to order. It's an order, not a request. The minister is answering your question. You may not like the answer, but she's answering your question. Please continue, Minister Wong. Senator Hanson, through you, uh, President. What Australians are being asked to vote for on is a principle of whether there should be a voice. The detail will come from the parliament and the government that is elected by the people, and it is for the parliament and future parliaments to determine the detail of how it works, including the issues that you describe. Thank you, Minister Wong. Uh, Senator Hanson, first supplement. Last month, the Minister for Indigenous Australians said that if the provo proposed voice to parliament had been established earlier, then we would 
not be where we are with escalating violence and crime in Alice Springs. Will the minister please provide the direct evidence supporting this claim, and does the Prime Minister support this claim? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, well, um, Senator Hanson, I think that everybody in this place, I would hope, um, uh, understands that the challenges that we uh, see and some of our um, uh, colleagues are living in Alice Springs and in the Northern Territory are not new challenges. And to pretend otherwise is disingenuous. And I would hope that the principle that if you work with local communities and listen to local communities, you achieve better outcomes. And you know, Ms. Senator Hanson, we, 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 we are very different, come from very different political uh, places, but I do uh, recognise that you do work in your community. You do engage with your community. Uh, and I would think you would understand that policy is intrinsically better if there is an engagement with and listening to the community. The voice is about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people having a say. That's what it's about. And I think we are stronger when people have a say. Yeah. Thank you, Minister Wong. As Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Well, I hope you can answer the third one because I have no, had no response to the second uh, or the first one for that matter. If the referendum rejects the voice being inserted in the constitution, will the government legislate a voice that will clearly be against the will of the people? Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Wong. Uh, we are working to uh, in, uh, achieve a change to our constitution in accordance with the wishes of so many of our First Nations people who very eloquently articulated this offer of recognition, consultation and a, a path forward together uh, in the Uluru Statement. And we are hopeful uh, that there will be enough people of goodwill in this place and in the community to ensure that we are able to do that, to do what was sought uh, and insert a provision into our constitution. That is what we are doing. So, um, uh, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson. Relevance to the question. I ask a question. Uh, Senator if Hanson, the Senate referendum does not Senator get Hanson, up, will they legislate? Senator yes or Hanson, no? Very simple. I've called you to order. You stand up and you ask a point of order. Uh, you talked about the outcome of the referendum, and that is exactly what the minister is referring to. Please continue, Minister. Um, we, we are optimistic and we are hopeful about the referendum, and that is the focus of the government's work. And I don't propose to get into a what if, Senator Hanson, because our job as the government is to do what we said we would do if we were elected. Uh, and our job is to keep faith with the commitment we gave not only uh, the Australian people and the broad, but our First Nations Australians, and we will do so. Thank you, Minister. Senator Little. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Gallagher. Senator, how many Australians have died from COVID in residential aged care since 2022 election? Uh, minister Gallagher. Thank you. I'm not sure I have um, figures since the election. Oh. No, I can give you the fig. Order. Uh, she's not the minister. Order. She was the minister. No. He was the Order. minister. She's a okay. Minister. He was the minister. I've got uh, minister, them. Minister, minister Gallagher, Minister Gallagher. If you no, Please, I've got the answer. The minister Gallagher. I, I down. Okay, you asked in 2022. Minister Gallagher, you asked, I've asked you to resume your seat. The minister was part way through a sentence, and then the chamber on my left, particularly, became so disorderly I could not hear her response. I would ask you to listen in respectful silence. Minister, please continue. Thank you. As I was saying, uh, as I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, as the 2nd of February, there have been 5,067 deaths nationally, 686 in 2020, 226 in 2021, 3,855 in 2022 and 300 in 2023. Now, given the seriousness of the issue that we are talking about, which is the passing of older Australians in aged care facilities, I think your behaviour just then was disgusting. I think it was disgusting. You ask a, you ask a question like that 
and you behave like that. Absolutely Order. disgusting. Order. I have the information. The difference between me and what happened to Senator Colbeck is that I actually had the information. Order. I'm aware of the numbers. I'm aware of what's happening in aged care. So have a laugh over there. Have a laugh, um, by all means. By Minister all means. Gallagher, and Minister disrespect Gallagher. the thousands of people Minister in Gallagher, aged care. I have a order. Order. Senator Cash, I have a senator on her feet. Senator Urquhart. Order. I would ask Senator McGrath to withdraw that statement, what he called Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, senator McGrath, I did not hear. Uh, the, um, the, the comments that were made by you or any other senator, but I would ask you to reflect and, you, and in the interests of the good spirit of the chamber, ask you to withdraw with Everything our, that I called uh, Senator Gallagher. Senator, thank you. <laughs> senator McGrath, when, please resume your seat, Senator. When, when I, uh, senator McGrath, when I ask senators to withdraw, I asked them to do it respectfully. Senator McGrath, you did not do it respect. I would ask you to do it respectfully. Uh, the point of order taken by um, Senator Urquhart asked me to uh, withdraw a comment. You said you didn't know which comment. Um, you asked me to respectfully withdraw a comment. I said many things. I withdrew uh, all Senator of them, McGrath, and I withdrew all of them. Senator McGrath, to assist the smooth running of the seat. Senator McGrath, you did not withdraw respectfully. Thank you. Senator Little, were you on a point of order? Yep. Order. 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 Senators Wong and McGrath. Again, I have Senator Little on her feet. Order. I'm still waiting. Senator Little. First supplementary. Order is, uh, point of order is relevance. Oh, um, the question was specific uh, to. I understand Senator uh, Wong, uh, Senator Gallagher has finished her response. Of, so that was an I'll move you now to your first supplementary. Okay. Okay. Why did your government change the way aged care deaths are reported on the exact same day that we saw? more aged care residents had died from COVID in eight months under your watch than in two and a half years under the coalition. Mm. What are you trying to hide? Thank you, Senator Little. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And can I again just say that any death in relation to COVID-19 and indeed in residential aged care is a tragedy. Um, and um, I think the behaviour of those opposite on the previous question reflects on them, reflects on them, and, and speaks McGrath. for themselves. Data on, data on the number of deaths in residential aged care are reported directly from aged care providers to the department. This is not an official data set and is used for aged care surveillance purposes. It is not directly comparable with published figures on the total number of COVID-19 um, deaths Minister, in Australia. Seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, on a point of order, um, I think the question was very specific around why you changed the means of reporting, not actually asking for a reiteration of how that is reported. I, I think the minister is being relevant. It, but I shall listen carefully. Minister, please continue. Well, I, I re if, if, you, if you want me to, I reject the assertion and the implication of the way the question is put. So that's my answer to the question. I am explaining. I am explaining about uh, how aged care deaths in Australia are reported. If you're not interested in that, that's not my problem. You ask the question. I'm trying to answer it. The review and adjustment to COVID death reporting, including the timing to release uh, the updated data, was a decision of the department. The, uh, the Minister, Minister for Health was briefed for in advance of the release of the data. Senator Little, second supplementary. In February 2022, the now Prime Minister said that deaths in aged care was a measure of performance. We know that more aged care residents have now died from COVID in eight months under the Albanese Labor government than in the entire first two and a half years of the pandemic. Given this tragic statistic, will the Prime Minister now admit that he has completely failed the important measure of performance and step up to the job of protecting older Australians? Thank you, Senator Little. Minister Gallagher. Well, we are doing everything we can uh, to ensure, and the mortality data 
and I will correct the record if I have to, but the mortality data that I'd seen uh, is decreasing compared to the first waves when, when residents in aged care were completely unprotected because of the way you rolled out the vaccine rollout. When you rolled out the vaccine rollout and you didn't meet your own targets, you set yourself the targets. Order. What we saw Order. was people in residential aged care that were completely Order. unprotected. Uh, Senator Wall. I can barely hear Senator Gallagher and she's here. Well, I have asked all members in this place to refrain from commenting and arguing across the chamber, from calling out repeatedly, and I would ask once again that you listen respectfully, Minister. Uh, thank you. The difference uh, between the approach now and the numbers of people uh, with the different waves was that back in 2020, people were left completely unprotected completely unprotected because of the bungle in the rollout. What we have now with Omicron uh, is uh, that the vast majority, in fact very high numbers, of people in residential aged care are protected through the vaccination program. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Rice. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Minister Watt. Minister, the Samuels Review found that our logging laws, the Regional Forest Agreements or RFAs, had weaker protections than EPBC legislation and inadequate Commonwealth oversight. <laughs> Minister Plibersek's Nature Positive Plan commits to increasing environmental protections for areas under RFAs. Given the need for urgent action to protect our forests, why is native forest logging still occurring under the regional forest agreements? Uh, Senator Rice, thank you. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Rice, for the question. And I recognise this is an issue that uh, you have a long history of activis activism in. Uh, the, obviously, there are two states in Australia which have now decided to phase out native forestry, being Victoria and Western Australia. Uh, but there are a number of states uh, that have not that made that decision. And as you point out, uh, native forestry around a number of states is regulated through regional forestry agreements. Um, the reality is that, uh, at this point in time at least, we are not in a position as a country to, to meet all of our timber needs through plantation forestry. Uh, plantations. It's estimated that plantations supply somewhere like 85 to 90 per cent of timber uh, and paper and products uh, in Australia, and it is completely unrealistic to think uh, that if we were to ban native forestry uh, immediately in the form that you're suggesting, that we would be able to meet our timber, paper, and other wood product needs. Um, quite Senator apart from, Henderson. quite apart from. Uh, the impact Senator that Henderson. such a decision would have on regional communities and the jobs that are delivered uh, through those industries. So it's a little like when I hear these sorts of comments from the Greens, it's a little like uh, the claim and the argument that we should be shutting down all coal and gas tomorrow as well, ignoring the fact that that would bring the electricity network to a halt, um, that that would mean that people's lights would go out. Uh, similarly, if we were to end native forestry today in the way that you suggest, we would not be able to meet our timber and paper and other wood product needs. Uh, unfortunately for the Greens, some of us choose to live in the real world, uh, where we actually need to be making decisions about what will actually happen in the world. And, and we, we, as a government, of course support responsible, sustainable forestry. Uh, Minister Plibersek has flagged an intention uh, to, to look at how this uh, practice is conducted in consultation with stakeholders, but we need to be real. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Just before I come to you, Senator Rice, if you wouldn't mind just resuming your seat. Senator Henderson, when I call you to order, that's what I expect. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, at, at COP15, the Australian government committed to take urgent action for zero extinctions after 2030. There are hundreds of rare, threatened and endangered animals and plants that live in and as part of our forests, including the critically endangered wallet or Leadbeater's possum and the greater glider. Minister, in this real world, the RFA are, uh, A's are allowing these species to continue their trajectory towards extinction. Will you scrap the RFAs and end Thank native you, forest Senator logging Rice, as part of your expired. government commitment? Minister Watt. 
Yeah. The, thank you, uh, Senator Rice. Um, I've already outlined the reasons why it would not be a prudent move to do the kind of things that you're talking about, whether we're talking about supplies, whether we're talking about regional economies and jobs. Uh, but it is the case that we do want to make sure that Australia's forestry industry is as sustainable as possible. Uh, and that's why Minister Plibersek, in responding to the Samuel, Samuels review uh, last year, said, and I'll quote, Regional forestry agreements are designed to have regard to environmental values such as old growth forests and wilderness endangered species and world heritage matters, uh, but they are currently exempt from the EPBC Act, which makes them unique. As part of our government's reforms, we will begin a process of applying a, our new national environmental standards to regional forestry agreements. We will consult, consult with stakeholders on how this will be done. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that the management of our forestries in this country is done as sustainably as possible, but we do need to meet some of the current timber uh, and paper product needs that our country has. But we flagged uh, an intention to consult with stakeholders as we apply Thank those Minister EPBC White, principles. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Minister, scientific analysis shows that ending native forest logging would have very significant benefits to the climate and would be the easiest and most significant land use change that could be implemented to help Australia meet its carbon reduction targets. Minister, given your government's commitment to tackling the climate crisis, won't you scrap the RFAs and end native forest logging? Yeah. Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Well, um, as I say, Senator Rice, um, I invite you to let the Australian people know how we would meet uh, our timber Order. and paper product needs if we were to end native forestry Senators immediately in the way that McKenzie. you suggest. Uh, I also invite you uh, to explain to the Australian people um, what, uh, what effect on the environment it would have if, as a result of ending native forestry overnight, uh, instead Australian importers were to turn to uh, forestry uh, activities overseas, uh, which have far worse environmental standards than our own country does. What we're trying to do is make sure that we have a sustainable forestry Order. industry, that we can meet our timber and paper product needs, but that we have strong environmental principles around it. And that's exactly what Minister Plibersek has flagged as part of the implementation of the Samuels Review. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. My question is to uh, the Minister for Trade and Tourism, uh, my good friend Senator Farrell. International students make an important contribution to the economy and diversity of communities across Australia. How is the international education sector faring in the aftermath of the pandemic and, and what are the long-term effects of the former government's complete lack of support and the former Prime Minister telling students to go home? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator, uh, Senator Farrell. I'll take that uh, interjection. Uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> but they're all, they're all good. They're all good. <laughs> um, thank uh, Senator O'Neill for that uh, question, and I know she has a great interest in uh, education, particularly the topic of her question, which was international education. And, Regrettably, uh, President, um, international education was one of the hardest hit sectors uh, of our economy during the uh, pandemic. With students unable to travel to Australia, the former government's bungling uh, meant that many education institutions were not able to access financial support. Worst of all was the damage done by the former Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison. <coughs> which damaged our international reputation by telling international students to go home. Scott Morrison, yep, yeah, that's what he said. That's what he said. That's what he said, Senator Watt. Scott Morrison made it clear that um, his government Senator Farrell, I just remind you to refer to um, people in the other place by their correct titles. Thank I'm, you. I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Madam uh, President. Uh, former Prime Minister Scott Morrison made it very clear that his government didn't care about international students, didn't care about educational institutions, and most importantly, he didn't care about those who relied on them to support their families. Uh, the message to parents of international students was that the Morrison government didn't care about their children and didn't want them here. In one single press conference, 
uh, the former Prime Minister uh, caused a massive setback of uh, 40.3 uh, to a to a 40.3 billion dollar industry. Uh, thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you. With international travel normalising and international students being able to resume their education on campuses here in Australia, what is the current state of play for the international education sector? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Farrell. Thank, uh, Senator, thank you, President, and I thank uh, Senator O'Neill for her uh, question. Well, of course, we hope that international travel is, uh, is normalising, but with no thanks uh, to the previous government, the sector remains uh, one of the largest export industries. Its recovery is testament to the quality education our institutions offer and the hard work uh, of industry and government agencies. In December, there were uh, <coughs> over 452,200 student visa holders in Australia. Not pre-COVID levels yet, but the industry uh, pleasingly is, uh, is recovering. The uh, Albanese Labor government is proud to be welcoming back international students from across the world. While China is still our largest and most valuable market, diversification is occurring and growth in other markets including India, Nepal, Colombia and Vietnam. Last year, Austrade supported the India Comprehensive Strategic thank Partnership. Thank you, uh, Senator Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President and Senator Farrell. Looking to the future, what is the Australian government doing to support the international education sector to assist the recovery you were describing? Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister. Thank you, President, um, and thank you, Senator um, O'Neill. Well, a lot more than the previous government is the uh, answer to that. <laughs> the answer to that, uh, to that that's <laughs> the answer to that question. My agency, Austrade, which is responsible for promoting Australia's international education offerings globally, has been working hard to support the uh, sector's uh, recovery. Dedicated staff in six. Uh, th um, 36 locations provide advice, support and uh, connections to registered uh, Australian international education clients. Australia's International Education Centre of Excellence oversees the uh, sector strategy and manages uh, um, the Study Australia website. Recent upgrade to the uh, Study Australia website have new users um, uh, increased by 24.7% uh, in 2022 with over 7.5 million unique page views, up 28 per cent on the year. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. At the last election, Labor promised a building capacity, building community policy aimed at increasing capacity in the Australian charity sector. And in the October budget, the Albanese government committed to a Productivity Commission review of the framework that incentivises philanthropic giving to charities. Can the minister confirm that, as of today, no further announcements have been made on either Labor Party promises? Thank you, Senator Dean Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. I never know what question is going to come from you, um, and I think, I, um, in respect to the chamber, I will have to take that on notice. Um, hang on, I'll see whether I can find something on my feet. Um, I'm not sure that's the same question that I got asked. Um, <laughs> I think it's probably in the interest of getting you an accurate answer, Senator Smith. I think um, it wasn't in my top list of issues to prepare for in question time today, but I will uh, come back to the chamber with any information I can. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dean Smith, first supplementary. I agree you should trust me first. <laughs> does, the minister, does the minister agree that the charity sector, facing unprecedented, unprecedented demand due to the cost of living crisis and Labor's insufficient plan to address it, deserves a government that prioritises charities' urgent needs and delivers on its promises? 
Thank you. Senator Smith, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I thank Senator Smith for the question. And I would say that in the budget, one of the largest line items that we had was to increase indexation uh, to community organisations, some of whom are charities, uh, who provide services to the community in response to the fact that they had been inappropriately or the indexation that had applied was not adequate and not allowed them to continue to um, meet some of the costs they were incurring. Um, that was in the order of several hundreds of millions of dollars, and it was in re re response to a request from ACOS and some in the charity sector to have a look at the indexation when we came into government. I undertook to do that. It was unfair. It had been left in an inadequate state, hadn't been addressed, and it was, you know, in a finance sense, quite costly uh, to, to deal with. Uh, but we did that in the first budget uh, in respect of the work that they do, the value that we place in it and the fact that we recognise their costs were increasing and they needed extra Thank support. You, Minister. Uh, Senator Smith, second supplementary. The index ma indexation matter is a good one, but it's not the subject of this question. How does the, how does the minister explain the government dragging its feet on delivering its modest commitments to Australian charities at a time when they are needed the most? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith for the question. Um, and I, I don't accept uh, the proposition that he puts. Uh, I know that um, my colleague, um, the member for Fenner, who has responsibility for this area, has been working uh, closely and um, is focused on this area. I just don't have an update of where that, all of that work is, but I have undertaken to come back to the chamber and, and provide that information and that update, and perhaps it's something that we can explore in estimates, uh, Senator Smith. Um, now that I'm aware that of your interest in it, I will make sure that officials and myself um, are briefed fully so that we can take you through all the work that has been being done. But I know that um, the focus of the, um, of the assistant, assistant treasurer has been um, to focus in this area. I have some information on fundraising reform, but I'm not sure it answers your question. Thank you, Minister Gallagher. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. And my question is to the Minister for Women, uh, Senator Gallagher, uh, also. Uh, and I'm uh, confident that my question uh, is at the top of your priority list, <laughs> Senator Gallagher. <laughs> and, uh, Order. And, uh, Order. And also at, the top of the, also at the top of the priorities of the whole Albanese government. Uh, Senator Gallagher, uh, can, can, you please, can you please update the Senate on how the Albanese government is taking action to close the gender pay gap? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. And, um, I, thank, um, I thank Jess, Senator Walsh. <laughs> Uh, for the question, and I can assure the chamber this is a question that I have prepared for earlier, um, but it is an important subject, and I'm proud that to be a member of a government that's introducing the workplace gender equality amendment, closing the gender pay gap bill uh, into the parliament later today. This is an important step forward in advancing gender equality in Australian workplaces. Together with the remade instruments under the Act, it fulfils a key election commitment of our government to close the gender pay gap at work, including by boosting pay gap transparency and taking action to help close the gender pay gaps within organisations. On average, women working full-time can expect to earn 14.1 per cent less than men per week in their pay packets. Current projections suggest that this will take another 26 years for this gap to close. This is too long, and women shouldn't have to wait, nor should our daughters or those that are being born today, those girls being born today. It's not fair. Uh, we need to address it. With these reforms, we will, for the first time in Australia, publish gender pay gaps of businesses that employ 100 or more people. The reform only covers employers that already report to WGIA, and it will be drawn on existing reporting, so employers themselves will not need to provide any additional information. If they choose to, employers can provide information about their gender pay gap and any action they are taking to close it. And employers will have around a year to get ready with the first reporting planned for early 2024. Gender a gender pay gap data will be published on WGIA's website in a searchable tool available to the public. This will add to the rich data already publicly available on WGIA's website. 
Reporting will commence in 2024, and it draws on all of that data, as I said before, from um, information already collected. The legislation being introduced responds to the recommendations of the review of the Workplace Gender thank Equality you, Act 2012. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for outlining those uh, historic and uh, very necessary reforms that I'm sure will be supported uh, by all of us uh, here in this place uh, in the chamber. Um, could you go a little further uh, and outline for us uh, why it is that gender equality must be considered a core economic uh, imperative and, and why it is being considered a core imperative by our government? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, Minister. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Walsh, for the supplementary. On average, across all jurisdictions and occupations, Australian women earn $263.90 per week less than men. That is a lot of money to be short each week, and it entrenches women's disadvantage and economic inequality. It's not right that women are missing out just because of our gender. It's not just bad for women, it's bad for our economy as well. The gender pay gap is estimated to cost our economy $51.8 billion a year lost when it comes to women's pay. The consensus on women's economic equality as a, as a key economic priority was an important and actually the first outcome at last year's Jobs and Skills Summit. One of the immediate outcomes from the Jobs and Skills Summit was for the government to require businesses with 100 employees or more to publicly report their gender pay gap data to WGIA, which is implemented through today's legislation. And I should say employers benefit too because gender equality you, makes Minister, good business sense. Has expired. Uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, Minister. And of course, uh, the historic reforms that you're talking about are really just the beginning for our government uh, and our commitment to gender equality as a core of our agenda uh, is really just the beginning. Uh, can you outline what other actions the Albanese government is taking to drive economic equality for women? Minister. Um, Senator Walsh, for too long Australia has fallen behind the rest of the world when it comes to gender equality, and I know many members in this place were at the UN um, Women Australia's um, breakfast this morning, um, and where this subject was talked about. I think from all of the speakers who, who addressed us, including the Prime Minister and our leader here, Senator Wong. Under the previous government, Australia fell to 43rd of 145 countries on the World Economic Forum Global, Global Gender Gap Index 2022, having ranked 15th in 2006. We ranked 50th for economic empowerment, and it fell as low as to 71st in 2021. We want to address this and improve on these results considerably. The Albanese government is working hard to restore Australia as a global leader on gender equality. Our budget put gender equality front and centre, investing over $7 billion to drive gender equality and reintroducing you, gender Your responsive time budgeting. Has expired, Minister Wong. Uh, President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Senator Smith. Deputy President, I rise this afternoon to, uh, take, note take, of, you take, note? Yes, to take note of answers given to all questions asked by coalition senators. Thank you. You had the call. Just wait for my colleagues to disperse or be quiet. Can my colleagues on my left please be quiet? Senator Smith is on his feet. Thank you. I'm going to do just two things in the brief opportunity I have this afternoon. In all seriousness, the first is to remind the government about their commitment, their policy that was aimed at improving, sustaining, refreshing, energising Australia's charity sector. And then the second thing I'm going to do, and I'm embarrassed to have to do it, but is to highlight the very, very real concerns the evidence 
that is now appearing that demonstrates that Australia's charity and not-for-profit sector, which has done good work, which many Australians regularly rely upon, is feeling the strain. And it's a feeling the strain of a number of things. It is feeling the strain of the current cost of living pressures, made worse for them because many of them are still feeling the fatigue and the exhaustion of having, run, having responded to a series of natural disasters in our country, stepped up in their local communities during the pandemic, and now are facing very, very real and serious and immediate challenges. I would hope that after today's brief remarks, this issue does get to the top of Senator Gallagher's priorities. I hope it does get to the top of the government's priorities, because you can't be interested in providing cost of living relief if you're not also interested in supporting Australia's charity and not-for-profit sector. Labor committed in its building capacity, building community policy to do just three things. And we heard from Senator Gallagher this afternoon that not one has been delivered. The first is an appointment of an expert reference panel. How difficult can that be? How long should that take? The second was to create a blueprint mapping out how Australian charities could reach their potential. How urgent that has now become. Thirdly, they said they would provide coaching to the charity and community sector to fulfil its important and very, very urgent and needy role as frontline responders. And it said in the budget it would do one more thing, and that was to initiate a productivity commission inquiry into philanthropic giving. How difficult can that be? How urgent it has become? It's disappointing that over the last few days, indeed last week, much of the commentary in our newspapers has been about cost of living pressures, has been about the number of fixed mortgage rates shifting across to variable rates. But we hear this afternoon 800,000 of them, 800,000 fixed rate loans shifting across to variable rates in this year alone. But we heard from the responsible minister that it's not yet reached the list of the government's priorities. So let me just share what the sector is saying. What the sector is saying. December last year, the sector released a report. It said, key findings, you don't have to look very hard, page seven, three per cent of participants said their main service could always meet demand. That means 97 per cent of services do not feel like they can meet demand. 63 per cent of survey participants, and this is surveys of charity providers, reported the cost of living pressures affected the people or communities their service supports. This was the most frequent reported challenge. 57 per cent of participants said access to affordable housing or homelessness affected their service users and communities. This was much higher amongst providers focused on domestic and family violence, 94 per cent, and financial, legal and emergency ports, supports, 90 per cent. In the last budget, just in October, the government applauded itself for delivering on its election commitments. Today, second sitting day of the new parliamentary year, and they still not have been able to deliver on what has now become a most critical, a most urgent election commitment and election promise. The matter is serious, and I hope we get some responses soon. Thank you very much, and I'm really pleased to contribute to this debate um, in addressing the answer given by um, uh, Minister Gallagher um, around what is the government's major priority. The number one thing that we are focused on as a government is the economy and responding to the challenges that we are facing right now. And can I say we are acutely aware as a government 
of the very difficult nature of interest rate rises and the impact that this is having on households and families and small businesses. It is our number one focus and that is why we are delivering cost of living relief for Australian families. I know that uh, those opposite would like to ignore some of these steps and even at times vote against them, but it is clear that we are delivering and responding to a very challenging economic situation in a manner that is um, affordable and responsible but delivers that relief for families. We have delivered cheaper medicines for Australians and we are delivering cheaper child care. We passed the legislation last year. It will come into um, force um, very soon for Australian families. Uh, and to ignore this as an economic measure just shows that those opposite have not learnt how important childcare, how important economic participation from women really is to our economy. And we're delivering energy relief. We came back to parliament. It's, it was a priority and urgency for our government. That is why we ensured that we could pass ex extraordinary times, call for extraordinary measures, and we passed that bill despite the fact that those opposite voted against it. They voted against cost of living relief, cost of living relief for families, for small businesses, for no other reason other than they are uh, ideologically opposed to any, any action when it comes to delivering cost of living relief. That can be the only explanation. That can be the only explanation as to why they voted against cost of living relief on energy bills for Australian families. We're getting on with the job of delivering these important measures and we're doing it in a responsible way that seeks to make sure that we don't create any further inflation. We are making sure that we are spending responsibly and we are tackling our supply chain issues. But it's funny to me that those opposites seem to think or want, want to believe that they left this brand new house for um, the new government to walk in, into. No curtains, no furnishing, nothing, untouched. Untouched, that nothing had been happened. This is what we inherited. We inherited a house that had, had an 18-year-old birthday party in for two nights. Everything was broken, the budget was a mess, and we inherited a trillion dollars in debt. A trillion dollars in debt, budget in a complete and utter mess. You want to forget about this? But that is the situation that you've left us in. Funds for the National Party with colour-coded spreadsheets, irresponsible spending, terminating measures of incredibly important programs that just have no funding in the future, and absolutely no energy plan. After 22 tries, they couldn't land a single energy policy, and yet they want to come here and vote against energy price relief. They left us with skill shortages across the country which are impacting our economy. We know that, but we're getting on with the job of um, dealing with those skill shortages with fee-free TAFE. On top of this mess that we inherited, this absolute mess that we inherited, a trillion dollars in debt that the, those opposite want to completely ignore and completely pretend does not exist, we are delivering responsible and affordable budget measures. And we're doing it in a way that makes sure that every single Australian family knows that our number one priority is dealing with these economic challenges that we're facing, responding to these cost of living pressures and doing it in a way that does not create worse inflation, that does not contribute, contribute to the issues. That is what we Senator are doing. Reynolds. But, Pretty President, well, listening to those opposite, you'd think that all is absolutely fabulous uh, in, out and about across Australia. Well, let me tell you, as a senator for Western Australia, let me tell you, come out to any supermarket, any, anywhere 
where Australians are spending money. And in Western Australia, retail sales are down 30 per cent last month because the cost of living is biting and it is biting hard. So I'll challenge any one of you over there to come with myself and Senator O'Sullivan, go out into the suburbs of Perth and out in rural regional Australia, and you just trot out that rubbish about how great life is under, under, under you. It demonstrably is complete and utter lies. So if you think if you think that people aren't feeling the cost of pressure through the inflationary measures that you're doing through increased interest rates, then come and speak to real Australians, because let me tell you what they're telling us. They are saying that they are struggling to pay for their groceries. They are having to make incredibly difficult choices each and every day on how they feed their families. They are struggling to pay their power bills because you promised you would reduce them by $275, and instead they have gone up and up and up. And it's not only individuals and their families, it is businesses large and small who are struggling with all of these inflationary pressures that you've put on our economy. They are struggling to pay for their mortgages, and as we have heard, 800,000 Australians and many tens of thousands of Western Australians are about to come off uh, fixed mortgages and fixed interest rates, and they will be struggling even further. And you are doing nothing but put further pressure on uh, in interest rates and inflation. West Australians are not only struggling to build a house or to afford a mortgage, they're also struggling. They are struggling to pay their rent with the increased uh, inavailability of uh, houses to rent. They are not taking holidays and they are working significant overtime. In fact, 12 per cent of Western Australians who are renting are looking to downsize uh, their rental property, but of course they can't find any because the McGowan government has been completely derelict in actually providing uh, greater housing stock and rental stocks in Western Australia. You are keeping the Albanese Labor government is demonstrably putting pressure on the cost of living of all Western Australians. And Please, please, please take up our offer, won't we, Senator O'Sullivan? We will take you to any shopping centre in Western Australia and you talk to real Australians and you tell them what tripe you've just put out here in this Senate. It is complete and utter rubbish. And of course, for Western Australians who deserve far better from this current government in terms of helping them with their cost of living, they've also subject to the complete dereliction of the McGowan Labor government. So in Western Australia, we have a double whammy. Uh, and again, you, if you're concerned about health care, come and talk to West Australians about the tragedies that impact on every family now in Australia. So they're not only struggling for their health care, their cost of living. Our hospitals in Western Australia, despite record funding uh, from us when we were in government, are at breaking point. We have thousands and thousands of sick and injured Western Australians now who sit out for hours and hours and hours outside of the emergency room, not because the state government doesn't have enough money, it's because they cannot manage their doctors, their nurses, and make beds available. So Western Australians deserve so much better. Um, so for example, the WA State Labor government promise a lot on infrastructure. They have record surpluses, and yet they are not spending the money uh, on health care. They've spent six years delivering supposedly better rail, the Metronet. And guess what? After six years and about three times the budget blowout, there is not a single, single train on any of those tracks yet. And people in outer suburbs who are already feeling the cost of living pressure are still having to pay exorbitant amounts and time to transport themselves to their places of work. Uh, and again, I have to note, in terms of Western Australia and West Australians deserving better, I mean, our Premier there is so out of touch. His comments today on Carnarvon and having been there recently for his fly-in, fly-out actually 18 months ago, uh, fly-in, fly-out to do a pub pub publicity stunt, and he hasn't been up there since to have a look at the devastation uh, that alcohol and also you know, many of the other issues, social issues that are plaguing Carnarvon. So Western Australians deserve better from both Senator Smith. states. Senator Reynolds, please be seated. Um, thanks, Deputy President. It's, um, anyone listening to this at home would be wondering when the last chance uh, those opposite had in government 
It wasn't that long ago. You spent the better part of the last decade in government. Low ambition government. Short memories. <laughs> Short memories. Because none of this stuff started on the 19th of May in 2022. The, the issues you're referring to, the issues around cost of living, started well before that. The inflationary pressures started well before that. Many of the challenges in our economy started well beyond, before that, and they started under your watch. So short memories, for sure. Also, not good listening skills, because I just sat here through Senator Green's contribution, where she um, uh, very delicately acknowledge the, the great difficulties facing Australians at the moment when it comes to cost of living. Great difficulties. These issues are biting. They're really stinging. I know they're stinging in South Australia. They're stinging in terms of the cost of rents, which are soaring in many parts of Adelaide and around our state. Supply issues in the housing market are causing these challenges, something we're seeking to address through our housing policies in government, something which has been neglected for the better part of a decade. And yes, interest rates are creating significant challenges for Australians with mortgages. These pressures are real. They're real and they're hurting people in my state. And that's why our government is acting. But let's not pretend you can act in this way without some degree of delicacy, right? You need to be careful. You need to be responsible. You need to show restraint in the budget. And that's exactly what our Treasurer and our government has done. We have been working to deliver cost of living relief for Australians in a way which won't add further pressure to inflation through things like our policies to lower the cost of medicines, a significant reform which makes a real difference to many, many Australians and some of our most vulnerable Australians who are reliant on regular medicines. This will make a very significant difference. And for people of my generation, the costs of childcare are enormous absolutely enormous. They eat into a huge part of a family's budget each week. They are a necessary expense to participate in the economy, to maintain your connection with the workforce and, of course, to give children access to that amazing, incredible thing which we call play-based learning, which sets them up for a great start in life. But these costs are significant, which is why we have introduced a significant significant package to lower the cost of childcare and increase access to early learning. And we have responsibly supported wage growth. We supported an increase to the minimum wage, a significant, a significant measure which makes a big difference in the lives of Australians, our lowest paid Australians, with cost of living pressures. But we are doing these things responsibly. We are doing them in the context of restraint. And alongside these measures, we're addressing challenges in the supply side. Challenges like the skills gaps in our economy, skills challenges which sat ignored and untouched by the previous government for the better part of the decade. We're doing this through measures like our fee-free TAFE positions. We're investing in cleaner and cheaper energy. After almost a decade of failed energy policy after failed energy policy, that failure to give the market and businesses the investment guidelines they needed to stimulate that part of our economy, to grow jobs in that part of our economy, we've made those decisions, we've legislated those targets to provide that certainty and to provide that growth. Of course, we didn't come to government to a perfect economy. We came to a a government which uh, we inherited a trillion dollars worth of their debt, a trillion dollars worth of debt with very little economic dividend to show for it. We came to government at a time of falling real wages. We came to government at a time of increasing energy prices where the insecurity and instability in the energy market because of their failure to legislate, because of their failure to choose a policy and stick to it. And we came to government at a time of significant skill shortages. All of these are things that we are working on. We understand that cost of living is biting at the moment. It's biting people in my state. It's biting people in Adelaide. And that's why we are working to address it. And I am sure and have great confidence that our May budget will take even further measures to help support Australians with these cost of living pressures. So let's lose the, the dodgy listening skills and stretch back a bit further in your memory. Because we are doing. Uh... Senator Little. Thank you. The opposition is committed to supporting the health, safety, and well-being of older Australians 
and we hope the Albanese government continues our generational reform of the aged care system for the benefit of all residents. The opposition called on the Labor government to prioritise keeping vulnerable older Australians safe, something they failed to do in 2022, and unfortunately it looks like they have failed again. The minister earlier today couldn't tell us how many Australians have died from COVID in residential aged care since the 2022 election. Couldn't answer that question. This government has neglected older Australians through devastating COVID outbreaks at the end of last year. Shamefully, the minister characterised her response to this situation as a watching brief. How long are you going to watch? Act. This last wave of the COVID-19 virus has seen more aged care residents die of COVID in the first eight months of the Albanese government than in the whole two and a half years dealing with the pandemic. It flies in the face of transparency that in the exact same week that marked this serious milestone, the data reporting changed. The minister said she would put the care back into aged care, but instead she has ripped out the measures put in place to protect older Australians through the pandemic and has now changed the reporting system, which raises further serious questions. Sensible measures like supplying PPE and rats to residential aged care are important, but the tragic statistics show that is not enough. The government also ended the most effective vaccine program, Operation COVID Shield. Despite health advice, the vaccination is the most effective defence against new waves of the pandemic. All Australians want and expect our older Australians to be well supported and cared for in our community, including in residential aged care homes. That is why, in government, the coalition called the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety to ensure our oldest and most vulnerable Australians receive care that supports and respects their dignity and recognises the important contribution they have made to society. The final report of the Royal Commission makes 148 recommendations. Following 23 public hearings over 99 days, 641 witnesses and over 10,000 public submissions, they are the product of wise and compassionate scrutiny of Australia's aged care system. In response to the Royal Commission, the Coalition committed $19.1 billion to a five-year plan to improve aged care, with new home care packages, respite services, training places, retention bonuses and infrastructure upgrades. upgrades. The opposition remains committed to supporting the health, safety and well-being of older Australians and understands the important role that aged care providers, care workers and nurses play in ensuring this support is provided in residential aged care settings. I acknowledge the work they have done and that they continue to do. During the election campaign, Labor said it would put the care back into aged care, but instead they have delayed the delivery of the Fair Work Commission's 15 per cent pay rise for Australia's hardworking and dedicated aged care staff. This is another shocking, broken promise from the Labor government. After repeatedly committing to fully fund the outcome of the pay rise case, the Labor government has now announced that they will only deliver a 10 per cent rise next year for the sector, with the remaining 5 per cent delayed an entire year. This government has neglected older Australians through devastating COVID outbreaks. At the end of last year, shamefully, the minister characterised her response again as a watching brief. The minister did say she would put the care back into aged care. We look forward to seeing evidence of that and the data that supports that. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you, Deputy President. Next month marks 20 years since the Howard government's decision to participate in the catastrophic US-led invasion of Iraq, a war that killed hundreds of thousands, displaced millions and left uh, millions more with a trauma that they still live with and that will last for generations. Now, during the course of this question time period, I'll put a simple 
question uh, to the Foreign Minister and to the Government. I asked whether it was the Government's view that the 2003 invasion of Iraq was illegal under international law and convention. And the response was, we have no further comment. It's 2023. As though to suggest to this chamber that the Iraq war and its implications are not something that the people of Iraq and that the people of Australia continue to live with to this day. Five million orphans were created by the Iraq war. Hundreds of thousands lost their lives. Today, the direct result of the war is still the third largest cause of death and the largest contributor to child mortality. The infrastructure, the services, the health care and education of that sovereign nation was devastated by a military campaign in which this Howard government, this Australian government, participated in willingly. Now, this month leading up to the anniversary of the invasion must be a period of reflection and of hard introspection. What happened? Who is responsible? What are the impacts that people are living with today? How do we ensure that it never happens again? Who made the decision to go to war? Who gave the order? How did we end up there? How is it that when 92 per cent of the Australian population opposed an illegal invasion, that their government was able to go ahead and do it anyway? And how is it now that an Australian Labor Party government comes before this chamber in the context of that reality with no comment? I yield my time. Mr. Deputy President. Senator Shoebridge. Twenty years now since Iraq was illegally invaded, an invasion predicated on a lie sold to the world by Western governments that together went to war in Iraq, and that included Australia, and no one has been held to account. The initial shock and awe military campaign killed more than 7,000 Iraqi civilians in just two months. Could just imagine the fear of communities on the ground facing that swift, ferocious invasion. The war and its aftermath since have since claimed the lives of hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. Iraqis are still waiting for justice and accountability for the full truth of what happened, and indeed the entire region is, is struggling with the instability of violence caused by the war. And Australian war veterans who were sent to fight a brutal, bloody, illegal war based on a lie are still waiting for answers. And the current Labor government is refusing to give those answers. Yesterday, Labor teamed up with the Liberals to stop the Greens' push for accountability for the release of documents surrounding the decision to go to war. This is exceptionally frustrating because two decades ago the then Labor opposition joined with the Greens and millions of Australians in opposing that war. The United Nations General Secretary Kofi Annan said in September 2004 that, from our point of view and the UN Charter point of view, the war was illegal. And today, the current Labor Foreign Minister still won't state a position on whether or not the law was illegal. Why not? Why do we still not know who made the decision and on what alleged legal basis to send Australia into that brutal, unjust, illegal war? And worse still, the WikiLeaks founder and Australian citizen Julian, Julian Assange, who has been a vital truth-telling force about the illegal invasion of Iraq, is still sitting in a UK maximum security prison for the crime of telling the truth. It's about time the Australian, the Australian people learnt the truth. It's well past time the Iraqi people learnt the truth about this illegal war. And we say again, with the 20th anniversary coming up, this is the chance for Labor to remember where it stood two decades ago and tell the truth about the illegal war. Put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Pursuant to order, I call Minister Watt 
to provide an explanation. Thank you, President. Uh, I refer to the notice of motion from Senator Mackenzie, agreed by the Senate of the 20, on the 25th of October 2022, for the order for the production of documents, Order 50. The Senator's request relates to correspondence between the Commonwealth and state and territory governments. The government claims public interest immunity over documents relating to the Senator's request on the ground that disclosure of such documents would cause prejudice to the relations between the Commonwealth and the states. Specifically, disclosure would harm the Commonwealth's ongoing relationship with the state government on this and future infrastructure funding arrangements. Thank you, Minister. Senator Mackenzie. I rise to take note of the minister's response. <coughs> yeah, you know, and I, I take that interjection from my good colleague from South Australia, Senator Rustin. The Senate performs an incredible accountability mechanism on executive government. Spot on. And it doesn't matter whether you're in the opposition or in the government itself or on the crossbench. The processes, the procedures, the conduct of this chamber is critical for Australians to have confidence in the operation of the executive part of government. And on the 25th of October, our Senate voted we required the minister to table the documents regarding a project in the Harndorf township three and a half months ago. The minister responsible, Minister King, claimed public interest immunity on the basis that releasing the documents would damage relationships between Commonwealth and states. Again, on the 23rd of November, the Senate rejected that public interest immunity. It wasn't the opposition. It was the Senate chamber rejected oh, yeah, that. Yes. On the 28th of November, Minister King once again claimed public interest immunity on the same grounds. This response by the minister representing Minister King is an insult to the Senate. And I would also just like to say thank you to those senators who joined with the opposition in the interests of accountability and transparency. We don't always agree on public policy but we do agree on public accountability. I can understand a minister from the other place, such as Minister King, may not fully appreciate the important role of the Senate, but the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt, does or should understand the importance of the Senate. He, the response he has given on behalf of Catherine King here today is an insult to the Senate and to our form of government. It's absolutely embarrassing for Minister Watt to have to come in and claim public interest immunity uh, because somehow the relationship between the Albanese Labor government and the Malinowskis Labor government would be damaged if Minister King had to actually comply with the order of the Senate about the delays to a critical road project in South Australia. What is there to hide? Everyone knows the Harndorf project has been delayed and that the funding has been cut by 45.5 million bucks over the forward estimates. That was all public in the October budget. It's been asked about in Senate estimates. It's a public fact. The release of the documents between the Commonwealth and state governments relating to this project is not going to change those known facts, but it may provide further clarity to the community that's been impacted by the funding delays as if to answer questions around what challenges exist in delivering the project. Minister Watt should actually be ashamed to stand in this place and admit that he can't convince Minister King to make the documents available to the Senate, to actually respect the will of the Senate, not the opposition, not the shadow minister, the Senate in and of itself. And he should exercise that seniority by expressing in no uncertain terms to the minister how important it is to our democracy more broadly that uh, the Minister for Infrastructure comply with these orders of the Senate. Because it hasn't, the Senate hasn't made this decision. They haven't claimed this once, twice. This is now three times. I mean, it is just blatant disregard. They've also this, but this isn't, you know, this is how they're going about their promise for transparency and accountability. Every single place you turn. These guys do not want to be upfront and accountable to the Australian public. 
They attempted to cut a week of estimates in this chamber, and next week we'll be able to exercise um, oversight on behalf of Australian taxpayers. They also withheld the release of budget tables for infrastructure projects. They refused to take ownership for funding cuts and delays on road projects, road safety funding, regional economic development programs, and they failed to deliver answers to Senate estimates questions on notice in a timely manner. In my own area of responsibility, there are still 34 questions tabled during uh, October-November estimates which haven't been answered. I mean, that's three and a half months ago. I've been there. I know where the answers to the questions are because the Australian Public Service in the Department of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development will have drafted the answers in a timely manner, will have shooted them up to the minister's office for them to OK them. And you know where those, answers, those 34 answers will be? Sitting on the minister's desk, refusing to release them publicly because she knows that the truth will damage the reputation uh, of the Albanese government. The former coalition government committed to deliver the Harndorf Township Improvement and Access Upgrade project in partnership with the South Australian government. It's a $250 million project of which the Commonwealth would contribute 80 per cent of the funding. Uh, that's $200 million, and it is critical to the safety and the efficient uh, movement of product. I visited the township of Harndorf recently uh, with my assistant shadow minister, Tony Passon, and saw for myself one of the most iconic villages uh, in South Australia from a tourism perspective, with B-doubles driving through the main street turning dangerously uh, in corners where families are crossing the street, international visitors with fabulous product from the Riverland, uh, from right around South Australian regions and even my home state, the Mallee, some of that product comes through there. This is a much needed project because someone is going to get hurt uh, if it is not built. There's one long road through that busy Harndorf village with a single lane each way and the car parks are also always utilised. It's long overdue, this project, and it was meant to be completed uh, in 25-26. So fair enough. Labor governments have decided they'll kick this one into the long grass. But public interest immunity is an important aspect of our democracy. And I just want to quote to the chamber what Senator Gallagher said uh, back in the 2nd of December 2021 about the process that government should adopt in complying with Senate uh, determinations around public interest immunities. Senator Gallagher said, you know, the Senate passes it, then requires the documents to be provided or the minister to come and make a statement. If the documents aren't provided, then the minister comes and makes a statement which basically says what they originally took was a question on notice. She then says, the thing is, when you're in opposition and you're trying to do this, we will remind you of this, she said. We'll remind you of the proper process that should be done by ministers in complying with orders of the Senate. Well, you've had multiple opportunities on this particular topic and you have failed at every juncture. I will quote Senator Gallagher again on the 17th of March. This is a lazy approach by the Labor Party and the misuse of the public interest immunity claims process. I agree, Senator Gallagher. I agree with Minister Watts' absolutely pathetic attempt here today to provide transparency around this project. Joke. Absolute joke. And I would call on Senator Wong, as leader of the government in this place, to have a bit of a hard chat with ministers in the other place and respect the chamber uh, here in the Senate and the determinations that it's made in, t in the interests of public transparency and accountability. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. On the same matter, Senator Rustin. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, uh, President. Uh, and can I associate myself with the remarks that have already been put on the record in relation to this disgraceful exhibition um, of a lack of accountability by those opposite that have just been put on the record uh, by Senator Mackenzie? I mean, the, the question that this chamber should be asking the minister in coming in here and claiming a public interest, uh, public interest immunity on the basis, if you will believe it, um, that it may damage the relationship mm. between the Commonwealth and the state of South Australia. Um, 
What are you hiding, Minister? What is your government hiding? What is the South Australian government hiding? Um, does the South Australian government know that you are actually impugning them in your, uh, in your decision to not provide this information to suggest that they too are somehow involved in a cover-up mm. about a project that is being funded entirely by the funding of taxpayers' money from both South Australia, my home state of South Australia, and by federal taxpayers? $250 million a quarter of a billion dollars worth of taxpayers' money, and apparently nobody has the right to see any information about the arrangements that are being put in place in relation to this particular project. Um, one would have to uh, assume um, that uh, there must be something to be hidden here, because you would think that a government that was prepared to commit this kind of money to a project would be proud to tell the people yeah, of Australia, right. proud to tell the people of South Australia what they were investing $250 million. But the reality of the decision today by the minister to come in here and claim a public interest immunity on this project is it not only insults this Senate, it insults every single member of this Senate, and it insults the fact that this Senate has actually voted for this information to be released. It insults the parliamentary process that we all come in here and hold so very dearly. And those opposite um, are all well and good to get up there and, and talk about parliamentary process when it suits them. But right now, when it doesn't suit them, all of a sudden, parliamentary process apparently doesn't matter anymore. So you also insult parliamentary process. But you know who the people you are insulting the most here by doing this? You are insulting the people of Harndorf. Mm. The people of Harndorf have long awaited to have a remedy applied to their town that has caused them massive, massive inconvenience, uh, exposes them to potential um, you know, accidents and fatalities that, that could happen. I mean, as Senator McKenzie just said, I come from South Australia. I was only uh, in Harndorf last week with uh, the, uh, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Susan Lee, and we sat in the main street of Harndorf for a few hours talking to the locals and watched what went up and down that street. You know, B-double logging trucks mm. backwards and forwards um, you know, while you've got tourists there trying to enjoy the amazing ambience of that community. So I think the people who would be, should be most insulted by the response from the minister today are actually the people of Harndorf. But you have to then actually um, have a look underneath all this about why would the government be seeking not to provide information around this project. Um, you know, we respect the public interest immunity system. There are times when there are reasons why information shouldn't be made public, and we absolutely respect that. But the minister has failed to even come into this place and give us any explanation as to what kind of information is contained in the correspondence that exists between the Commonwealth and the State of South Australia that would actually be considered by their legal team as to be jeopardise the relationship between the Commonwealth and the State of South Australia. If there is, um, I think you know, if you can come in here and you can prove that and present that, um, at that under a reasonable set of, of explanations, I'm sure those on this side and others in the chamber would accept that. But to come in here and just say, we are not going to tell you anything at all about the expenditure of $250 million, $200 million of which was promised through the process of this particular parliament, then I think you are really just saying, I'm no transparency. I mean, a government that apparently was elected on transparency and accountability, no transparency, no accountability, just don't care. But I suppose the thing that is most concerning to me as a South Australian and as somebody who takes a great interest in the region of the Adelaide Hills, and particularly in this instance, um, the promises that were made to the people of Harndorf about dealing with an issue that would improve accessibility and connectivity of the roads in that area, and we know that they are significantly lacking, but also to improve road safety for everybody who is impacted by the proposal. So the proposal was to take the traffic off a particular road, which is the main street through Harndorf, the Mount Barker Road, and actually redirect it in such a way so heavy vehicles would bypass the town. Um, that is what the project description was, um, and everybody in the Adelaide Hills breathed a collective sigh of relief when the project was announced. However, on the 27th of September last year, the South Australian Transport Minister, Tom Coutsentinus, completely blindsided the town of Harndorf 
by coming out and saying that the intention was to scrap the much-awaited bypass and interchange at Handorf, leaving a massive, massive hole in the benefits that were proposed to be delivered by this project. Handorf is absolutely united, almost to a person, in the desire to have the traffic removed, mm. uh, the heavy traffic removed off that road. And anybody who has done anything in infrastructure would understand it is very, very rare that a town would actually seek to have traffic bypassed from its, uh, from its main street, because, of course, in some instances, and in many instances, it will have a commercial impact on that town. The people of Handorf actually see that this will have a positive benefit to them because they believe that the heavy vehicles going up and down their main street is actually a deterrent to the main core business of that town, which is tourism. However, in his decision to do, make the decision to uh, scrap the long-awaited bypass from Handorf, the South Australian Minister uh, for Infrastructure, Mr Kutzentonis, said that it was after public consultation with the people of Handorf that they'd made the decision to scrap the bypass because the people of Handorf didn't want it. Well, I just wonder whether uh, Mr Kutzentonis actually bothered to speak to um, the, uh, the Handorf um, Business and Tourism Association, who speak on behalf of the businesses and the tourism operators that exist in that main street. Um, and to quote them, following the announcement by the minister, um, that the proposal that's put forward by the government, who claim that it's somehow going to solve the problem, will not. And I'll quote the Tourism Association: "says the upgrade that is being proposed uh, will not solve traffic issues on Handorf's main street." So, in the absence of um, understanding why the minister is choosing not to provide the information uh, as to uh, what is going on here, the fact that the South Australian Minister for Infrastructure has made a decision that they are not going to continue with the project as was originally announced and celebrated by the community. One can only imagine that this is a protection racket that is being run here because what is now being proposed is going to cost less than the $250 million that was previously allocated. and That is a quote that's come from the minister in South Australia. They are scrapping a substantial and the most substantial component of the development, according to the people of Harndorf. They're doing it on a premise that the people of Harndorf don't want it, and yet the people of Harndorf are on the public record as saying that they do want it. And then today, we see the minister walk in here, hand on heart, and tell us that the reason that they're not providing this information is because it's going to damage the relationship between the Commonwealth and the South Australian government. I would contest that the reason this information is not being released today is because it will damage the relationship between the South Australian government and the people of Handorf. It will damage the relationship between the Commonwealth government and the people of Handorf. Um, and, you know, those of us who are somewhat more cynical would suggest uh, that the member for Mayo, um, Rebecca Sharkey, um, who has been um, a, a very strong advocate um, for her community of, of the Adelaide Hills, um, is no longer of any value to those opposite. So no longer um, are we going to, to, um, to provide any support to the community of uh, the Adelaide Hills. Um, and what we're going to do is instead we're going to run a protection racket for the South Australian government. Um, we have no transparency about uh, where this other, the, the money is going to. Is it just disappearing back into to general revenue? We have no transparency about what the South Australian government is being required to do in the expenditure of taxpayers' funds that have been allocated to it by this particular parliament. Uh, and instead, today, we see the minister come in here and just basically ignore us. But you know, one of the things, you know, it may only be a small thing, but the minute the minister dropped his PII claim into this chamber 15 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, he didn't even wait for Senator McKenzie, the first person to respond to his requirement to be in the chamber, to say one word before he up sticks, walked out the door, has not listened to one word we've had to say. This is so disrespectful. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Little on the same matter. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, um, on the public immunity claim on the basis of um, the relationship between South we Australia and the Australian government. What about the relationship with the people of South Australia? What about the residents? of Handorf. What about the motorists that use Handorf? What about the visitors to Handorf? Of course I want to speak on this matter. Every day 
The more than 3,000 residents of the Adelaide Hills town of Handorf are grappling with 11,000 vehicles which use their main street. There are almost 500 heavy vehicles among the congested traffic, frequently grinding the street to a crawl. We're talking logging trucks. We're talking livestock trucks. We're not talking the little ones. We're talking about semi-trailers in a main congested street full of pedestrians and full of tourists. I was there about two weeks ago with Minister Rustin, and I was stunned at watching the trees in the street, the tree-lined streets being smashed by these trucks driving past, trying to manoeuvre their way amongst the traffic, amongst the pedestrians and amongst the public transport, the buses parked on the sides of the road. I was sitting at a cafe on the side of the road, and I was horrified waiting to hear a bang. And the poor residents and visitors and truck drivers must be feeling that every time they turn into that stretch of road. Around 3, uh, 36,700 vehicles use the Mount Barker interchange on the South Eastern Freeway each day. That's not a small number. These statistics clearly point to ever-increasing traffic congestion and safety concerns that shown, in fact, there have been about 45 accidents in the past five years. What also should not be missed is how vital this town is to the South Australian economy, with an estimated one million visitors each year. This economic tourism injection adds to the congestion and safety concerns, yet the solution has been scrapped. The $250 million Harndorf Township Improvements and Access Upgrade project announced by the Morrison government and South Australian governments in 2020 on an 80-20 funding basis is now not going ahead. We have no real explanation for that. In Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee on October the 28th last year, I was told, I asked the question, what's happening with the project? In quotes. The project would be proceeding as always planned. Yes, as always planned. And that the federal government was awaiting a final report from the South Australian government. Yet on the 27th of September last year, the South Australian government had already announced they had scrapped the project. Well, that does not add up, nor does the response we were given just a few minutes ago. Obviously, the federal department's answer was wrong. It had already been axed. Labor's left and right hands don't know what's going on. The Handorf Community Action Group, who are large and very active, are stunned. It is worth noting that Handorf is not placed within a federal or state Labor electorate. Could it be that Labor, both federally and state, don't have the needs of the Adelaide Hills residents as a priority? There doesn't seem to be any transparent or valid reason for the project to be axed, and that certainly wasn't a transparent or, it appears, a valid reason that any of those residents, drivers, locals, tourists would accept to be reasonable. A petition to reinstate the bypass project has gathered more than 1,700 signatories, and it's growing. We know this is bad news for Handorf and for all Adelaide Hills residents, as the interchange upgrade would have reduced congestion, improved safety for road users and connectivity between the freeway and Mount Barker and other growing Adelaide Hills towns. This would have helped thousands of motorists who travel to and from the CBD every day. The congestion is still there and the road accidents will continue. Even currently on the SA Government Department's um, Infrastructure and Transport Department website, it clearly admits the problem. Without new infrastructure still up there on their website and upgrades in and around Handorf, it's likely traffic and freight will continue to increase. Traffic collisions are likely to increase. The performance of existing intersections will continue to decline with increased delays, queues and further disruptions to the community and businesses. Growth opportunities for the local economy, which is tourism dominated, will be limited due to the road environment. 
You know, when you go up one end of Harnoff, even on a weekend, a weekday, it takes you oh, maybe 15, 20 minutes sometimes. You're down to about five kilometres an hour to get through that stretch. But you know what? I sat on South Road the other day in my car, and South Road is a major arterial road in South Australia. The project to help ease the congestion there in the seat of Boothby delayed again. The price of that build has gone up. Similar story. We don't care that people sit in traffic ambling along at 10 k's an hour for kilometres. Who cares about people getting to work? Who cares about people who are running a business getting from one point to the other within a reasonable time frame? That's money lost for them. That's what you do when you don't focus on infrastructure improvements. Houndorf residents will now get an upgrade of its main street. The congestion will remain. The risks remain. And I say that's just simply not good enough, and nor was the explanation for not providing the answers. Uh, thank you, Senator Little. There being no other speakers, I um, move that um, I ask that take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Thank you. Yes, Senator Rice. Attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, yes, I believe we probably need a quorum call. I'll just check with the clerk. Yep. <laughs> yep. Did you ring the bells? Yeah. Thanks, Senator Rice. It's quorum. Um, Senator Little, you have to remain now. And Senator Mackenzie, you should know that, Senator Mackenzie, trying to sneak out the door. Uh, I believe quorum has been established. So, uh, are there any um, notices of motion to be given for another day? Uh, Senator White. President, pursuant to notice given on the 7th of February 2023, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notices of motion numbers 2, 3 and 4 for today, proposing the disallowance of the Australian Capital Territory National Land Lakes Ordinance 2022, Competition and Consumer Industry Co Codes Franchising Amendment, Franchise Disclosure Register Regulations 2022, and Competition and Consumer Amendment, Consumer da Data Right Regulations 2021. Thank you. So uh, the question is the motion is moved by it. Drawing. I beg your pardon. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk. Postponement notification has been lodged as follows. Um, business of a Senate notice of motion number six for today to the 9th of February. No extensions have been lodged. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business.
I'm going to start with business of the Senate uh, number eight, standing in the name of Senator Rennick. Senator Rennick. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number eight be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rennick. I move the motion. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rennick be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Um, and my apologies, that notice is in the name of Senators Rennick and Brockman. Um, I'll now move to general business notice of motion number nine, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number nine, proposing a reference to the Environment and Communications Committee relating to the government's cultural policy, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number nine, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to uh, government business number two, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I ask that the government business notice of motion number two be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without form formalities and be now read at first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Bill for an act to amend the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012 and for related purposes. Minister. President, I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator uh, Minister Gallagher. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 6th of March 2023. We we'll now move to uh, general business, I beg your pardon, government business at number three, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Chisholm. I ask that government business notice of motion number three relating to the consideration of disallowance motions be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number, I beg your pardon, government business Notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, moved by Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we now move to general business. So we'll uh, start with uh, general business. Notice of motion number 130, standing in the name of Senator Steele John. Thank you uh, very much, President. I ask that General Business notice of motion number 130, proposing uh, the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steele John. I move, uh, President, that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections and referendums and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Steele John. I present the bill and I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to elections and referendums and for related purposes. Senator Steele John. Mr. President, I move that this bill now be read a second time and that I uh, seek leave uh, to table an explanatory memorandum related to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Steele John. 
Thank you, President. I table an explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have uh, this second reading speech incorporated into the Hansard and to continue my remarks. Thank you. Is, Steel, uh, is um, leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Steele. John. I now move to general business notice of motion number 138, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 138 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 138, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now move to general business notice of motion number 139, standing in the name of Senator Dunningham. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, uh, President. I ask that motion number 139, standing in my name, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And another one. So we now move to question number 140. Uh, general business notice of motion number 140 standing in the name of Senator Dunningham. Uh, I ask, Madam President, President rather, uh, that motion number 140 standing in my name for today be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Dunningham. I move the motion. So the question is that uh, general Government General Business Number 140, standing in the name of Senator Dunningham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And you're on the trifecta, Senator I Dunningham. I sure am, President. Number 141. Uh, thanks, President. If I could ask that motion uh, number 141 be taken as formal also. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Dunningham. I'll move that motion too. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Dunningham, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I now move to general business notice of motion number 144, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Mackenzie, I ask that general business notice of motion number 144 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that General business, notice of motion number 144, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll now move to general business, notice of motion number 145, standing in the name of Senator Antic. Senator Antic. Thank you. I ask the general business notice of motion 145, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Antic. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill to uh, a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act, 1995, and for related purposes. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Antic be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Antic. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and it now be read for a first time. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Antic be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Criminal Code Act 1995 and for related purposes. Senator Antic. Uh, I move that this bill now be read for a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Antic. Thank you. I table, uh, I table the explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into the Hansard and to continue my remarks later. So the question uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Antic. So we now move to general business notice, of num notice number 146, standing in the name of Senator Canavan and others. Uh, thank you, Ma Madam President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 146, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Canavan. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator Canavan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Canavan. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator Canavan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and for related purposes. Senator Canavan. 
I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Canavan. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Canavan. We now move to general business. Notice of motion number 147, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Dean Smith, I ask that general business notice of motion number 147 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that Gov general business number 147, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now go back to uh, Senator Pocock's not here. Yep. Um, Senator Lambie, are you seeking to move business of the Senate number seven now? Uh, otherwise I'll call you if you are. Uh, sure. Do you want to I'll go to um, you, you can debate it later, but um, we we'll just need to do a postponement. Why don't I come back to you? Um, I'll go to um, business of the Senate number six standing in which has been postponed, has it? Senator Hanson Young. Left. Entitled to debate it now, or you can come back to it later. Oh, she can debate it now. Oh, Senator Lambie. Sorry, Madam President. Um, we'll come back to it later if that's okay. So you're okay. seeking a postponement? No. Just moving no. it to later. Okay. Yeah. Good. Sorry, I think that was arranged, so I do apologise. That's okay. No drama. Um, I think that concludes notices. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. No? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think. Call call. Um, Senator Urquhart. I bring to your attention the state of the chamber. Uh, call quorum. I believe quorum has been reached. Uh, we'll now move to attendance by a minister, and it is uh, Senator Watt. Order for the production of documents regarding the Gabba Stadium projects. Thank you, President. Minister Watt. Sorry, thank you, President. Um, I refer to the notice of motion from Senator Orman Payne, agreed by the Senate on the 27th of October 2022. Uh, for the order for the production of documents, Order 69. The Senator's request relates to correspondence between the Commonwealth and state and territory governments. The government claims public interest immunity over documents relating to the Senator's request on the ground that disclosure of such documents 
would cause prejudice to the relations between the Commonwealth and the states. Specifically, disclosure would harm the Commonwealth's ongoing relationship with the state government on this and future infrastructure funding arrangements. Are you seeking the call, Senator Orman Payne, on this matter? President? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, President. I move that the Senate take note of the statements made by the Minister regarding the choice of the GABA as a redevelopment venue for the 2032 Brisbane Olympics and the refusal of the government to comply with two separate orders for the production of documents. I thank the minister for appearing, but I must say that I am not satisfied with the explanation provided. The argument that release of these documents would prejudice relations between the Commonwealth and the states is spurious and should be subservient to the public's right to know about major projects that will affect them. The Senate rejected the claim of public interest immunity made by the minister and affirmed that, and I quote, the public has a right to know the details of and de deliberations on infrastructure projects such as the Gabba Stadium project and impacts on surrounding infrastructure. I do note that the previous order for the production of documents stated that the minister should consult with the Queensland government if a public interest immunity claim is being made and seek agreement to publish the information or invite reasoning if the state government opposes the release of the information. The minister should also have made the Senate aware that this had occurred. It seems that this has not occurred as stipulated in the original order for production of documents. This simply reinforces the fact that the federal and Queensland governments are not interested in letting Queenslanders know about or have a say in major infrastructure projects and the funding arrangements that support them. This isn't the murky depths of national security policy execution. It isn't the exercise of sensitive bilateral relations between two nations. It isn't even commercial in confidence, not that I would be swayed by that argument if it appeared. No, this is a case of the public's right to know about a sporting infrastructure program that would level a state primary school and reshape the community, all for the sake of a two-week sporting event. The Gabba Stadium project was announced in April 2021. It's been almost two years since then, and yet we still have no answers regarding the future of East Brisbane State School. Construction may begin in 2025. Parents with kids starting prep now don't know if their kids will make it to year three without having to shift schools, and they deserve clarity. Prior to the bid, the government was talking about holding the opening ceremony at Metricon Stadium, Queensland Sport and Athletics Centre in Nathan, or building a new stadium at Albion. Why have these ideas been scrapped? There's been no public consultation on this. There's speculation in the media now that they might be looking to ring-fence this project from federal funds so that the Commonwealth can distance itself while still throwing money at the Olympics. If that's true, that's a huge admission that this is a toxic project. If the federal government knows this is a bad deal, why not share this reasoning with the people of Queensland? Or better yet, stop protecting the mates in Queensland Labor and use the power you've got in funding the Olympics to tell them to have another look and give the community a real say. Queensland Labor are doing everything they can to stop the community from learning about the Olympics or having any say about their own community. The community has a right to know. That's why the Senate has ordered the government to tell us what's going on. I want to thank the other parties that supported our bid to compel an explanation from the minister. As Senator Mackenzie said earlier today, we don't always agree on public policy, but it's heartening to see a mutual interest in accountability in this case. The government often talks about the need for Brisbane 2032 Olympics to leave a positive legacy. If the federal government progresses with plans to help fund the demolition and rebuilding of the Gabba Stadium as the main athletics track, then the biggest legacy could be the loss of the East Brisbane State School and Raymond Park. There is a $2.5 billion projected cost for an upgrade which will only provide 8,000 extra seats all for a two-week sporting event, which is an absolute criminal waste of public funds at a time when schools and hospitals across the country are suffering from chronic underfunding. East Brisbane State School has over 311 students, having grown by more than 38 per cent in the last few years. 
It's a very diverse school with students from 39 language groups and a specialised English program for refugee children. It is also a 123-year-old school on the Queensland Heritage Register, and it is the only public primary school in the catchment, which is a rapidly growing local area. Currently, around 70 per cent of families walk, scoot or ride to school, emphasising the importance of having a well-placed and accessible school for this local community. Thousands of residents have signed petitions, written to the government and rallied to save their school and local park. The Greens will be standing with them for a better outcome. The local community will not be letting this go. These billions of dollars could go towards proper public education funding or housing. We're calling on the government to make it a condition of any federal funding that the Queensland government drop the costly and destructive Gabba Stadium project. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much. And I rise uh, uh, to put the opposition's full support uh, behind this motion uh, from the Greens. And again, it is uh, fantastic to stand as one for the role of this chamber in our parliamentary democracy. And once again, we've seen Senator Watt have to do Minister King's dirty work, shuffle ashamedly as a Queensland senator into this chamber and put uh, an infrastructure minister that is not across her brief, who seeks to treat this chamber with disrespect and the taxpayers' money that she's in charge of, because we just asked a simple question. You're the government. You can make decisions. But you've got to tell us, and if you're going to actually um, claim public interest immunity in this place, there are certain reasons how you can claim that. It's going to prejudice the relationship between the Palaszczuk Labor government in Queensland and the Albanese Labor government in, here in Canberra. I find that pretty hard to believe. But one of the things under the standing orders of the Senate is you've got a right to the state that you're claiming that about and say, do you have a problem with us releasing this? Do you have a problem with us talking about it? Ask them. And the minister came in and cannot actually once again answer that question. And if you look back on their time in opposition, the number of times they crowed about how they would approach accountability and transparency. Senator Gallagher, the Senate should not accept it. We should stand up and actually demand transparency and accountability for government. They get on the Treasury benches and within nine months they are running as far as they can, uh, can from their own public decisions. I was on ABC Brisbane this morning about this exact issue, and the listeners in Brisbane uh, capital are absolutely incensed about this. And I, I think earlier contributions make clear they're concerned about the impact that this redevelopment will have on their local community. They're very concerned with the lack of consultation, and they're incredibly concerned about the cost. And I just want to read some of the comments that Brisbane listeners to the ABC on this. Leave the Gabba alone. It would be a short-term disaster for the Olympics, especially with Cross River Rail. The Olympics needs to propose a built facility for the major global event, not a retrofit designed to show the management of companies seeking to run both Brisbane Live Venue and the Gabba after the Olympic. Um, doesn't know anyone in the promised business plan speaks volumes. The fact that we're commit potentially committing to a project uh, that there is no business plan to. Uh, another caller. We don't know anyone in our area in favour of the Gabba development for the Games. We'll keep the messages going uh, to our reps in parliament. 4,000 Lions AFL members—it's not always friendly country for the AFL up in uh, Queensland, but there's 40,000 Lions AFL members and Gabba members are uh, you know, absolutely defeated by the silence from the Palaszczuk and the Albanese government. Another comment. Anyone unfortunate enough to drive through the road surrounding the Gabba should be asked their opinion. The Olympic Committee could, should come up with another more feasible stadium. Now, just on that, we know the Gabba redevelopment wasn't part of the Olympic bid. Was not part of the Olympic bid. And the former coalition government had a process in place with the Palaszczuk government. We'd fund 50-50 of that infrastructure. Uh, and we'd have an oversight body so we could both be assured that 
The public spend would be in both the state and the national interest for taxpayers and deliver legacy projects for the people of Queensland that were great for our athletes, great for the hundreds of thousands of spectators that are coming to see the Games uh, in eight years' time, but that would importantly leave a legacy for the citizens of Queensland and the broader Australian community. And this federal Labor government cannot make a decision to save themselves. Nine months later, and the whole process has stalled. And you've got public schools concerned, parents concerned, students concerned, because Catherine King and Annika Wells me, can't um, get their act can together. I, Minister uh, King and Minister Wells cannot get that their act together. It is very disrespectful when you don't refer to people in the other place with their correct title, so I will remind you of that. Thank, thank you. Senator. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I am um, absolutely respectful for the people concerned about this project in Brisbane. And, and the, the quote, though, that I think really sums it up on ABC Brisbane this morning was, I've previously voted Labor at a state level in Queensland, but if the Gabba construction goes ahead, my vote will go elsewhere. They need to listen to the people. Senator Chisholm, this is your home state. This is your Labor state government. This is your federal Labor government. I don't blame the Palaszczuk government. I blame federal Labor for stalling this and the disrespect they treat this Senate with by coming in and saying, um, you know, we don't have to actually give you any information on this particular project. Well, it turns out you are, because it's going to cost the federal taxpayer <laughs> billions of dollars. And people don't feel they're being consulted. They think, look, they're concerned about a Gabba redevelopment that wasn't even part of the Olympic bid. And what the international community that I've been speaking to is concerned about isn't the Gabba redevelopment about the Olympics build. It's how do we get hundreds of thousands of spectators out to events, the road and rail projects that need to be built for this Games to be successful, and we want it to be successful, haven't even been started. There's an eight-year lead time. They need to be planned, they need to be tendered, there needs to be construction. It's going to look like Rio if you don't get your act together. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to support Senator Ormond Payne in her courageous efforts to try and get more information in relation to what is happening in relation to the Gabba redevelopment proposal. And it is astounding, it is absolutely astounding that the minister attends here today and says because it may damage relationships between the federal government and the state government, we can't give you any information, but they haven't even asked them. That's right. They didn't even ask them. Why don't you pick up the phone? Pick up the phone and ask Premier Palaszczuk, do you mind? The Senate, the Senate is keen to get this information. We think there should be transparency. We think people have a right to know. Do you mind if we hand this information over to the Senate in accordance with the resolution of this Senate, the House of Review? But they didn't even pick up the phone and ask. How do they know it's going to damage relationships when they don't even ask? Maybe they, didn't, maybe they thought they'd get an answer they didn't want, so they didn't ask. They didn't ask, so they can just come in and glibly claim parliamentary um, public interest immunity. Maybe that was the whole strategy all along. Don't ask the question if you think you might get an answer you don't want. Absolutely shameful. Absolutely shameful. Oh, I had the pleasure of taking my good friend Minister Rustin for a walk around the Gabba, and we had a look at East Brisbane State School. This is one of the oldest state schools in my home state of Queensland, constructed in 1899. It is actually on the Queensland Heritage Register. And you can have a look. I'll give you the reference number. Anyone here? I'll give you the reference number to go on the Queensland Heritage Register, 601476. That's the regis registration on the Queensland Heritage Register. Why is it on the register? Because the place is considered to have great significance with respect to the development of Brisbane. Why is it on the register? Because of its aesthetic value. And if you see the red brick buildings done in an arts and crafts fashion, it is a beautiful, beautiful school. 
in the middle of a beautiful community. And those parents and that community want answers. They want answers. What is going to happen to their school? Because it's such an important part of their community. And those of us who watch carefully the track record of the Labor government in Queensland, their first estimate, their first estimate with respect to the Gabba redevelopment, which would abolish this school, was $1 billion. $1 billion. Now, what do you get for $1 billion? You get 8,000 additional seats. So, by my math, that's $120,000 per seat. $120,000 per seat. Does that make sense to anyone in this place? Now, that was their first estimate. The estimate has now gone up. We're up now at about 2.5 billion. Two and a half times more. 2.5 billion. No wonder they won't show us the documents, because if I was sitting on that side of the chamber, I'd be saying, well, how do you expect me to sign up 50 per cent of the funding for this redevelopment? when the cost has gone from $1 billion to $2.5 billion in less than 18 months. It's astounding. The people of Queensland deserve to have all the information in relation to this proposal. There are parents and their children today in that community who are concerned about the future of their school. There are people, and I've spoken to people, who have gone to that school decades ago, and they've raised concerns directly with me about what is going to happen to that school. It is part of Queensland's heritage. It is on the Queensland Heritage Register. And the people of Queensland deserve answers, not flimsy claims of public interest immunity, which are not in the public interest of that local community in East Brisbane, and they're not in the public interest of the people of Queensland who deserve open government and transparency. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, sadly, this is the second time I've stood here today um, to draw the attention to the people who are listening and the people who hopefully will be reading the contributions that have been made by my colleagues, uh, both here and um, senators, um, Senator um, from the Greens, uh, in relation to the absolute refusal of this government to be transparent about the expenditure of taxpayers' money. That's right. So all we want to know is we want to know what the government's intentions are in relation to the funding of infrastructure for the 2032 mm. Olympic Games. Australians are so proud of our sporting culture. We are so proud of our sporting reputation. Uh, and we're so proud of the fact that invariably when we put on international sporting events, we become uh, they, they are heralded around the world as some of the, the best when it comes to putting these events on. So it comes with a great deal of concern to us, and Senator McKenzie and I have been speaking about this for some time now. Um, it comes with a great concern to us that at this stage, um, only nine years out, and I know nine years sounds like a long time, but it's not a very long time when you're building uh, the kind of infrastructure and trying to build the kind of event that the Olympic Games will need to be to showcase Australia to its best and to enable our athletes to be able to stand proud on the international sporting stage uh, for Australia. So what we want to know is we want to know why this government will not provide us in this parliament and the Australian public with the assurances that they have everything in hand. And as you just heard uh, from both Senator McKenzie and from Senator Scar, um, there's a whole heap of things that seem to be floating around in the media between discussions between the federal government and the state government of Queensland that don't seem to be part of any agreements that were officially struck in relation to our hosting agreement for the 2032 Olympic Games. We, uh, when we were in government, we were very clear um, about the decision that we uh, would put in place, a 50-50 funding agreement um, on, based on the IOC host agreement uh, for infrastructure build. And as Senator McKenzie said, the GABA redevelopment was not contingent on that host agreement, and yet we now seem to see that this is being put into the public narrative as if it somehow was. But what we said was we wanted an independent joint inf oversight um, authority to oversight the delivery of infrastructure. Now, successive governments in this place have always placed a great deal of importance on Infrastructure Australia. Um, to be a body that actually had oversight of the expenditure of hundreds of millions and billions of dollars of Australian taxpayers' money. And we've always considered in this place that that was an important thing to do. And that was why we put in 
uh, to say that our 50-50 agreement with funding with the Queensland Government would be contingent on the establishment of such an authority. I do not understand why the current government will not tell us whether they're going to establish that authority and to provide the level of oversight that taxpayers of Australia rightly should expect for expenditure of their money, why they won't tell us what the funding agreement is between the Commonwealth and the state government of Queensland, why they won't tell us what is included in that agreement. And it comes as a great deal of concern following um, what has not been the greatest reputation of a government in Australia around um, you know, uh, jobs for their mates, payments to unions, allocation of deals without transparency, allegations of corruption in the behaviour of the Queensland government. You would think that this government, uh, the, the current Albanese Labor federal government, would be very concerned about handing over some sort of blank cheque to the Queensland government. Um, I hope, I very much hope that they're not going to do that, and I very much hope that they're going to stick to the same sort of accountability, governance, and transparency measures that we have uh, come to expect. Uh, because handing over a blank cheque, um, or for that matter, refusing to reveal what is actually going on with these agreements, leave us with two suggestions and two assumptions that we can make from this. Either they're failing to reach an agreement with the Queensland government. And that would be a very, very serious concern to Australians because, of course, it jeopardises our ability to be able to put on a games. Um, and uh, I think Senator McKenzie has been on the public record as saying we need to make sure these games are the best games ever because the last thing that we want to see happen is because of a fight between the Commonwealth and the Queensland government that we end up with a Rio-type games. We can do so much better than that. We deserve to deliver for the Australian public so much more than that. And the refusal of this government to provide any information around this particular arrangement leaves us with a great deal of concern. The other, obviously, um, the assumption that one could jump to, if it's not uh, that, that they haven't been able to strike a deal, is that they have struck a deal, but they just don't want to tell us about <laughs> it. Um, and one would suggest that if they've struck a really good deal, they probably would want to tell us about it. So once again. As we saw with the, uh, the, the request for information in relation to the correspondence between the South Australian government and the Commonwealth government uh, about the, uh, the, red, the infrastructure build in my home state of South Australia, the minister comes in here and drops a public interest immunity, public interest immunity claim um, without any justification as to why he believes that the, the revealing of this particular information is not in the public interest. Um, once again, I'll put on the record that we absolutely support the value of public interest, interest immunity as a mechanism by which we can protect commercial in confidence information and, uh, and other things such as relationships. But there is absolutely no evidence that's been provided by this government or by this minister as to why their relationship with the Queensland government would be damaged by the release of this information. And so, we are absolutely supportive of the motion that has been moved by the Greens to demand that this government come clean with this information. Because, um, as Senator Scar said, you know, we, we were told initially that the GABA redevelopment was going to be $1 billion. Notwithstanding the fact that the um, IOC hosting agreement did not require the GABA to be part of uh, the um, infrastructure build for the Games, my understanding was that Suncourt Stadium was supposed to be uh, the stadium that was going to host the opening and closing um, ceremony. Uh, and then only in a matter of a blink of an eye, we see it's now $2.5 billion. Who's conning who here? Mm. Um, you know, is this uh, just a wonderful cash grab uh, from the uh, Premier Palaszczuk to try and see if she can sucker this government into providing Australian taxpayers' funds to upgrade a facility that is not being required for the delivery of the games. Um, but I suppose the thing that remains the most concerning to me is we are talking about billions and billions of dollars. We're talking about the reputation of Australia as one of the, if not the best host of international sporting events in the world, um, is being jeopardised by a lack of transparency by this government. So, if it does not seem like a reasonable thing to everybody in this chamber that the Australian public has got the right to know how billions of their dollars are going to be spent, um, then I think that just shows great contempt by this government for this place and the people of Australia. 
Um, we sent here to do a really, really important role. And I can remember being lectured day after day mm. after day by those opposite when we were sitting on that side, um, when we came in here uh, and, and at any time tried to suggest that there was some piece of information that shouldn't be released. We, well, I certainly know I always used mm. to try and make sure I had a very sound reason behind why I wasn't releasing a piece of information. Mm. But to just, with complete contempt and arrogance, come in and say, we're not going to give you anything at all about the spending of billions of Australian taxpayer dollars, but we're also not even going to really tell you why. It's just apparently going to damage a relationship between a Labor federal government and a Labor state government. I mean, I just cannot understand how the minister, um, clearly who is under instruction from the minister in the other place, who is the substantial minister for infrastructure, he could just come in here, dump this and run. Um, Clearly, there is um, you know, a level of transparency and accountability that is missing from this government that is so extraordinarily hypocritical when you consider that was the mantra that they took to the Australian public when they sought for the Australian public to elect them to this place. So it seems to me this government is all happy about all the headlines, all the promises, make all the nice lines, tell the Australian public everything that they want to hear, that they're going to do everything that the Australian public rightly should expect them to do. But when it comes to actually delivering, well, sorry, we're not going to tell you anything about it, or maybe we just won't do it. So I would say to those opposite, have a very serious think, because we're going to keep coming back to this. Um, and I thank the Greens, because obviously they are as equally interested in transparency as we are. We're going to keep coming back into this chamber, and we're going to keep using the power of this chamber to demand transparency of this government, the executive government of this country, on the decisions they make that affect Australian lives and the expenditure of Australian um, hard-earned taxpayer funds. We'll keep doing that, and if you want to keep being contemptuous to the Australian public by refusing to answer it, we'll keep telling them that you are contemptuous. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I rise to make a contribution to this de debate on uh, what is an important um, taking note of the minister's response or effectively non-response to the order for production of documents in relation to uh, the GABA project. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I think constituents in Senator Scar's state of Queensland, Senator Ormond Payne has raised um, this order for production of documents specifically in relation to the school, but I think that people have genuine concern to be uh, genuine case to be concerned about this circumstance. Uh, we, I, I, I quote the words of Minister Grace Grace in relation to this project, describing the GABA project, saying we do not know the footprint. We do not uh, know the design. We have a schematic sketch. We are still stabbing in the dark. You confidence. Uh, and we know, and uh, uh, as as then Minister for Sport, when uh, this project was sprung on the previous coalition government, um, only a few days after having received a list of proposed projects for the Olympic that the government wanted funding for the Olympic bid, um, this sudden announcement of the GABA project that appeared. Um, and that's why, that's exactly why the then government said, well, we're prepared to support a 50-50 funding deal for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics, but on the condition that there is a process of discipline put in place to provide oversight to protect taxpayers the expenditure of billions of dollars so that the Commonwealth had a say as a part of that process. Now, as has been uh, said by my colleagues, uh, there is no indication of whether the current government intends to continue with what was the core element of that 50-50 deal, that there would be a body put in place to provide the Commonwealth and the state, but particularly the Commonwealth, some protection for taxpayers' funds in, in the planning and the, implement, and, and the construction of those projects. A very, very sensible discipline to be put in place to protect Australian taxpayers in the expenditure of billions of dollars. And I suspect the reason, the real reason, 
that this government doesn't want to provide this information is not to protect the relationship between the Australian government and the Queensland government, but to protect both of those governments for embarrassment at the situation that exists right now. Thank you, the Senator Colbeck. The time for debate has expired. The question before the chair is that the motion to take note of the explanation provided by Minister Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. A proposal from Senator Lambie has been received under Standing Order 75 as follows. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted for Senate discussion. Australians have the right to know who's funding Australia's political parties, even if the parties don't want them to. Signed, Senator Lambie. Does the proposal, is the proposal supported? Thank you very much. Thank you, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Australians have the right to know who is funding Australians' political parties, even if the parties don't want them to. I shouldn't have been surprised last week, which I wasn't. You think I would be surprised by this place and the greed, but here we are. We, we've just found out how much money everyone took from the big business and corporations during the elections. We're finding this out eight months after the election is done and dusted, and yet we're talking transparency. This is great. Too bad for the Australian public if there's any nasty surprises. They'll have to wait until after their elected people get elected. Australians deserve to know who's funding political parties, even if the parties don't want them to, especially if they don't want them to. The major parties don't want you to know who's funding them. That doesn't pass the pub test. What have they got to hide? You deserve to know who is buying political influence in this place. And when someone claims to be independent but then accepts thousands of dollars from big business, you have to ask what strings are attached to that. Who are they really here to represent? We all know these donations aren't usually made from the goodness of their hearts. They always want something in return you owe them. Candidates have got to be kidding themselves if they say those donations don't come with conditions attached. Let's be honest. No one wants to upset the person that bankrolls their seat. Australians should know whose purse strings are backing the candidate before you head to the ballot box. The Jackie Lambie Network released our donation information during the election, and we've got a much smaller team than they do, so why can't they do the same job? Well, I can tell you why we stick to our guns and we don't take money from the big boys. Tasmanians deserve to know that no one is buying our seats. Every donation that comes through the Jackie Lambie Network comes from small individual donors. It came from the little old lady on the street who gave me five bucks for a coffee. It came from our volunteers who dreamed of a better future for Tassie and better representation in Parliament than we have now. And I'm so grateful for every single person who gave me and has always given me those five and ten dollar small donations because I can tell you they add up and I'm very grateful. Because of you, we got Tammy elected. We earned it. We earned it. We didn't buy it. Tammy went out there, she spent every weekend, every bit of time she had off, she went out there and she wrote, kept going round and round Tasmania when she could possibly, and she earned it, just like the network is supposed to. Like everyone else, I'm sick to death of hearing about these fundraisers that buy, buy seats for thousands of dollars in the name of fish and chip lunches, let's be honest. Last year, over $137 million was donated by just 10 individuals, 10 people. That's 77 per cent of all political donations made during 2022. Influence. It is influence. That's 10 very big influence you have now influencing parliament. Honestly, the lengths these parties go to to pull the wool over your eyes about their donations is ridiculous. Currently, any donation over $14,500 needs to be disclosed. But don't worry, have no fear, because every day you can give $14,499 every day of the year, and that doesn't have to be disclosed. No, no backing it up together the next day. You can do that every day of the week if you want. If a business or union is giving you lots of $10,000 for a political party, you should know about it. It doesn't take Blind Freddy to see what we need to change donation rules around here. And the major parties continue to drag their feet on it, but I'll drag them kicking and screaming to get things changed. 
real-time donation disclosure, and there's no excuse not to have it, lower thresholds and aggregate donations are just the tip of the iceberg, but they'd make a huge difference, and I'm, I'm sure that Australians would be very happy to see this transparency going on. Some people have asked why, we're, why there was no information on Jackie Lambie Network from the Australian um, Electoral Commission donation disclosure. Well, I can tell you why. We stick to our guns and we don't take money from the big boys. Tasmanians deserve to know that no one is buying our seats. We've actually earned them. That's what we do. I've always promised you that and we do that. That will never change. You will never, ever be able to buy or influence the Jackie Lambie Network. Otherwise, my time in here is up. I'm so grateful every single person, once again, that's given us a five or ten dollar small donations because it's come from the people who really believe in what we do and know that what we're doing is right. And because of you, once again, we got elected. We got, we did get Tammy elected, and that is great. And I'm very grateful for that. And we will continue on that line because we will do that to lead by example and hope that just, just one day before I leave this place, that political donations are not sitting there to buy, or when you have doubt that they are buying influence in this chamber. That is where we're at, and that is a lack of trust in the Australian people. You guys were coming in for transparency and trust, and so far, nothing about political donations. Nothing at all. Seriously, start with that. Then you'll start with your transparency, you'll get your trust. Simple as that. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, and, and before I go on, get into the, um, the, 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 the full topic at hand on, on a slight tangent, I, um, Senator McAllister, stop looking at me like that. So, <laughs> so like, but I, I do. I, I, I want to. I want. I want to talk about the. Um, Someone's listening. Uh, yeah. Someone is listening. It <laughs> makes a, makes a change. Um, so, um, um, I do want to talk about, and it is related to, to donations uh, in relation to, and it's related to the upcoming uh, referendum. And I'd like to say I, I welcome uh, the government's uh, change that it will. Uh, uh, support a, a yes and no pamphlet uh, being uh, sent out to every Australian household. Uh, regardless of on your position or on the voice, it is very important that any constitutional change is carefully considered. And, and, and that, to us on, on this side of the chamber, uh, means three particular things in relation to that, that bill that, that Labor have proposed. And the first is there should be a yes and no pamphlet. Because that goes to people's households, and uh, evidence supplied by the, the electoral commissioner said f up to 40% you know, of Australians during the election campaign get election information from written material that's sent out by the electoral commission. And the second second area is there should be an official yes and no campaign to help uh, with the compliance that comes with receiving donations. Uh, political parties, which are uh, professional bodies, but, but contrary to, to sometimes you know, popular uh, misopinion, uh, are not particularly well staffed, uh, don't have hundreds of people working for them. Indeed, my own LNP in Queensland has about 10 people working for us, uh, you know, three or four in the compliance section. And sometimes political parties do, do make mistakes when they are lodging their returns. Uh, that's always um, unintentional uh, mistakes, um, and, and the ECQ and the AEC understand that. And that's why it's very important for the upcoming referendum that there is an official yes and no body that can assist with the receipt of donations and to ensure that the donations received comply with the federal laws that cover donations, and in particular in relation to ensuring that foreign donations are not received. And the third, third area that we, we, we do think uh, that, that, that there needs to be a change to the government's legislation, which also comes in under the aspect of, of donations, and, and that is that there should be equal public funding for the yes and no case. It would be disappointing that, that a government that, that talks about goodwill and talks about a country coming together would, would a cynic suggest, try and seek to gerrymander uh, a result uh, by trying to restrict people's access to information so they, caref they can carefully consider uh, the changes to the constitution. You know, a, a document that essentially is 
um, uh, the backbone, backbone of Australia, and we need to make sure that any changes improve Australia uh, rather than, than leave, leave to deleterious um, uh, changes as such. Now, the, the, the position of, of the Liberal National Party is we obviously do, you know, do support the current uh, regime. We do support uh, the, 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 the view that Australians should see where donations come from and that they should be, uh, the rules should be complied with in a timely manner. Uh, we don't see the need to change the, the, the current uh, regime. Uh, people who donate money are over a certain, certain threshold. Uh, they are publicly identified. Uh, most political parties, and my, my experience in Queensland is that is probably similar to, to Senator Lambie's, and she, she may not necessarily believe this, that it is uh, my party is funded by, by the good old raffle. Uh, every every meeting you go to, and Senator Scar is the same. If, if, if we don't turn up with if we don't turn up with a raffle prize, uh, will we get in trouble? Uh, and you can't win the you raffle. You've got, you've got to redonate it back, redraw, re redraw, and you've also got to make sure you've got cash on you. Uh, and, and that's off. That is how that is how branches are ac actually actually run. And what we should be doing is make it easier for people to get involved in the political process, easier to support the political movement of their choice, uh, rather than making it harder. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Chacon. Very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. And I to rise to speak on the matter of public importance that's been raised here in the Senate. Um, and before I talk about some of the history of the political uh, donations reform at the outset, I want to say that I and Government senators completely reject the assertion that's been made here by Senator Lambie that all political parties have the same history and approach to uh, political donations. Um, over many years, um, uh, when we were in opposition, we obviously took an, a number of re reforms to this place uh, to try and make the, the system of donations a lot more accountable and, and transparent. Um, but also the assertions too that somehow. You know, the, the members in this place and those op in, in the other place too uh, engage in some form of corruption as well. Um, you know, I think Senator McGrath made the point about the engagement with the local branches and, and the members of our respective parties, uh, whether it be raffles or sausage sizzles or other forms of political donations and how we raise money in the lead up to an election campaign. There's no secret about that. But I know so many hard-working candidates who unfortunately weren't able to be elected at the last election who will put their hand up again, you know, put six months of leave on the table to go out and, and run for the party because they believe in the movement, they believe in the cause and they believe in representing their local community. Uh, and they'll do so by having raffles, they'll do so by having sausage sizzles, they'll do so by going to the local community groups and raising money. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. But dif different political parties do have different approaches and histories on this issue of political donation. Uh, and indeed, um, um, so I'd, I'd suggest, um, Senator Lambie, that you know, we should not all paint all political parties with Senator the same Chacon, brush on the Senator issue of political Chacon, donations. Pursuant to an order agreed earlier today, the Senate is about to move to the consideration of disallowance motions, but will return to this matter at the conclusion of that consideration, and you will be in, cons in continuation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, a disallowance standing the name of Senator Pocock, and business of the Senate, notice of motion number five, a disallowance motion standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move the motion. The climate wars have left us with a very piecemeal climate policy here in Australia. There are more than 80 different pieces of legislation that relate to energy and various elements of climate policy. Clearly. <laughs> A price on carbon would be a better way to do this, better for business, better for the environment. Uh, disappointingly, that is politically unpalatable. Uh, so we have to make the most of what we have. 
Uh, we have to ensure that we empower businesses to seize the opportunities of decarbonisation. We need to build as much certainty as possible and, crucially, as much integrity as possible. Proposed changes to the safeguard mechanism uh, mean that there will be an even greater reliance on carbon offsets. So it's more critical than ever to ensure that the methods to create carbon credits have integrity. Carbon credits are necessary in the hardest to abate sectors. Uh, they also have the uh, potential not only to capture carbon, but also to bring secondary benefits such as land restoration and increased biodiversity. They have the potential to reward land managers across the country for the work that they are doing in caring for and restoring the areas that they live and farm. But carbon offsets are also a high-risk environmental policy instrument. It's easy to create uh, false abatement, to create credits that aren't actually sequestering carbon or avoiding carbon emissions. Uh, and rarely will we have absolute confidence that carbon storage is real, additional and permanent. But we can get pretty close. And we should aim high to make a real impact to reduce the change in our climate. That brings me to the method that uh, I've lodged a disallowance for. And it relates to uh, schedules three and four of the carbon uh, credits methodology determination 2022. Forestry is clearly a valuable uh, an incredibly important contributor to our economy. We should all be grateful uh, to those in the industry who work to create the materials that construct our homes, build our furniture, and countless other valuable things. We do need to incentivise and encourage tree planting and the plantation forest industry to keep, um, to keep up with demand. As it is key uh, to many in our communities and our economy, and it will be there for many years to come. And to that end, the first two schedules of the plantation forestry method are not pro problematic. They uh, appear sound, and in consultations, uh, experts in this field are happy with, with the way that they have been uh, constructed. They provide credits for establishing new plantations to store carbon and for, for converting short rotation plantations to long rotation plantations. Trees are obviously a good way to store carbon and we'll need them if we're going to effectively address the climate crisis. However, I am concerned that projects under schedules three and four would not provide additional carbon storage. Uh, the recent Chubb review considered just three methods used to create carbon credits and in that review, Professor Chubb recommended that no new projects should be registered under the avoided deforestation method. Uh, the Chubb review did not consider the plantation forestry method. Uh, however, schedules three and four of the method are remarkably similar to the method that his review suggested uh, be not continued with. Uh, there are clear shortcomings, and I remain concerned that under these schedules credits would be given not to clear land uh, that would never have actually been cleared. And we have to have uh, integrity in this market. If we allow these sorts of credits uh, to be created, they, they cast uh, doubt and uncertainty on, on all of the great high integrity credits out there. So I really urge senators in this place to disallow these two methods. Uh, and to add to the integrity of our carbon credit market. Thank you, Senator Pocock. I call Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. The Greens are seeking to disallow the rule and the methodology for carbon capture and storage under the Emissions Reduction Fund, which, of course, those instruments are hangovers from the Liberal government climate policy, if you can even call it a climate policy. Um, and for clarity, Senator Pocock is seeking to disallow the plantation forestry method, um, and we'll be supporting him um, in that disallowance. But I'll speak primarily to the carbon capture and storage uh, instruments. 
Um, the Australia Institute released a report last year demonstrating how that carbon capture and storage methodology was developed. Mr Angus Taylor, hand in hand with the fossil fuel industry and the big emitters, who are growing increasingly reliant on F offsets to justify their lack of a transition plan, got together and agreed upon it. This CCS, uh, CCS methodology would allow Australia's biggest gas companies like Santos, Woodside and Chevron to generate credits for burying just a tiny proportion of the gas that they extract. So this instrument is just another in a very long line of fossil fuel subsidies that should not be supported by the parliament, which is precisely why the Greens are seeking to disallow this Morrison hangover um, con of a climate burying methodology. Now we know that carbon capture and storage is a con. It's used as a distraction by the coal and gas barons while they keep on extracting more of the products that are destroying our children's future and, frankly, barely pay any tax while they're doing so. Over $4 billion has been committed by governments to date on this technology, and there is almost nothing to show for it. There is only one commercial-scale carbon capture and storage project in Australia. That's the Gorgon LNG complex. and They have had exemption after exemption from their pollution obligations from the West Australian EPA. This technology has continued to break down on virtually an annual basis and will never sequester anywhere near as much pollution as was claimed by Chevron when they sought to get their environmental approvals. Uh, the third instrument that we're seeking to disallow was a good old cash handout for coal and gas donors. The Industry Research and Development Carbon Capture Use and Storage Hubs and Technologies Program Instrument of 2021, which gave $250 million to companies who invest in carbon capture and storage projects. Now, in November of 2021, we moved to disallow a very similar fund, a $50 million CCUS development fund, which both of the big parties joined together to oppose our disallowance of that money. But I'll note that since this dis disallowance was lodged, Minister Bowen has reclaimed the $250 million from this program to put into their powering the region's fund. So why not kill the other two instruments that just give yet more cash to coal and gas um, and credit dodgy methodologies while you're at it? Um, now, I might just speak briefly to Senator Pocock's disallowance of the commercial forestry method. We're taking this position to um, support the disallowance because it's easy to credit false abatement um, or to overcredit actual abatement under this method. Um, in other words, it means that one tonne of avoided emissions doesn't always equal um, one tonne of actual avoided emissions. Under the government's safeguard mechanism, the expansion of coal and gas will be enabled through the purchase of credits like this. And frankly, this method does not provide us with high enough confidence that the emissions abatement is real or additional. This is important because basic science says that there's no better abatement than leaving coal and gas in the ground when we are in a climate crisis and all the relevant scientists and international bodies are begging us not to open new coal, oil or gas fields. If this parliament were to allow credits like this, we would simply be allowing coal and gas to be extracted while these big tax-dodging polluting companies greenwash their way to net zero. So for these and numerous other reasons, we are moving to disallow the, uh, the three CCUS methodologies listed in the motion and will also be supporting Senator David Pocock's disallowance of the forestry methodology. Thank you, Senator Waters, and I call Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the government doesn't support either of the motions before the Senate, and I just wish to take a few brief moments to speak about why that is so. Um, in relation to the matters raised by Senator Pocock and the disallowance moved by the Senator uh, uh, around Schedule 3 and 4 of the Carbon Credit Carbon Farming Initiative Plantation Forest Methodology, uh, perhaps I can start with this. We've obviously been through an extended um, review of the arrangements for the creation of uh, offsets undertaken by Professor Chubb, and he had this to say in particular about the land sector. He said this, after experimentation and speculation for decades, the only pathway known to science that has the immediate capacity to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere 
at scale is photosynthesis, the mechanism by which plants and some other organisms use light, CO2 and water to create energy stored as sugars to fuel cellular activity and growth. Science and technology may well develop effective and scalable options to meet the twin challenges of greenhouse gas removal and secure long-term millennial storage, but to start at scale well before 2050, the land sector will have to carry much of the immediate load starting now. I appreciate the points made by the senator in relation to the significance of integrity in this sector. Um, and indeed, the government shares the senator's interest in ensuring that the credits created under the, through the ACU scheme uh, are of the highest integrity and that the public may have confidence in those credits. That's precisely why we commissioned the review and it's precisely why we've committed to implementing the arrangements, uh, the recommendations made by Professor Chubb. In, in relation to the specific mechanism, the plantation forestry method, it allows uh, forest growers to generate Australian credit, credit units by storing carbon in plantation forests. Uh, the current method builds on an earlier version. It includes two new activities for keeping forests on land where plantations would otherwise be converted back to non-forest land. The method provides for additional abatement because evidence shows that plantation establishment rates are very low and existing plantations are being replaced with other land uses. Projects using the new activities also need to meet several specific tests to show that they are additional. These tests include providing a declaration and independent financial analysis showing the plantation would otherwise be converted to a more financially attractive land use. Now, the review undertaken by Professor Chubb did not consider the plantation method specifically, but it did conduct a serious review of the scheme, its governance arrangements and the offsets integrity standard. And it was this offsets integrity standard that was used to develop these new schedules to the plantation method. The review found that the offsets integrity standard for developing ACU methods are appropriate and are consistent with good governance, well regarded by stakeholders and experts, and support confidence in the integrity of ACUs and the scheme. Specifically, the review found that the overall scheme arrangements are sound and robust, with appropriate checks and balances at the scheme method and project level to protect the integrity of the scheme and the credits created under it. I will say this, though. The panel made some important and sensible recommendations to improve the scheme, including around transparency and governance, especially given that we are now at uh, beyond 10 years of operation of this scheme. In particular, it recommend, the review recommended that the standards should be clearly defined and supplemented with ACU scheme principles to support consistent application and it made recommendations on how questions regarding the application of the offset integrity standard and method variation should be considered and undertaken. Uh, recommendation 6 specifically addresses an opportunity to improve by stating that the offsets integrity standard should be clearly defined and supplemented with principles, and we have accepted all of the review's recommendations in principle. We are working through implementation now, but it will produce changes in scheme governance, and we would expect that the ACU scheme would continue to examine all of the methods to ensure that we are using best practice and doing everything we can to ensure the integrity of the scheme and to indeed enable the confidence um, that Senator Pocock referred to in his opening remarks. Um, I will say, though, that these new structures present or offer us the best way. As Minister, your time has the expired. best opportunity. <laughs> Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And uh, if I can also make a contribution to the debate on these two disallowances at the outset, I'll say the opposition will be opposing both of the proposals uh, put forward here. Um, in brief, and you know, I appreciate the uh, remarks made by the minister around the scheme and the purpose behind it. Uh, look, I, I mean, if I start with the forestry, uh, the plantation methodology, um, as someone who had a hand in uh, going to the clean energy regulator and seeking a review of what was in place uh, in the early parts of 2021. 
Um, if I can give some historical context there, it was because, as has been well canvassed in Senate estimates and in this place and in the public domain, uh, there is great difficulty in growing our forest estate to meet the demand that we actually talked about in question time to today. And so this was one of those levers, policy levers, the then government and obviously the current government uh, thought was a good um, lever to have in place to be able to incentivise investment in uh, plantation forestry to uh, get us on a pathway to meet demand. Now, um, I appreciate, as uh, Senator McAllister did, the um, points that have been made by Senator Pocock and the reason for him moving this disallowance, and I accept um, the arguments he's put forward. I mean, the thing we have to do here is balance up uh, our responsibilities. Um, we import so much timber into this country, a huge amount of it, much of it from places that don't do forestry well, that in fact rip it out of the ground um, and don't care one iota for their environment. Um, now, I know there will be some people in this chamber who don't agree with the uh, point I'm about to make, which is we do it to world's best standard. Um, and on the way through, we create jobs um, in many regional communities where they're most needed. Uh, and so this methodology, um, as it was drafted in 2001, uh, 21 rather, uh, was about trying to grow that sector, create more jobs, create more resource, suck in more carbon, lock it up forever in beautiful timber products and, uh, and uh, incentivise that investment and use of this material. Perhaps um, displacing concrete and steel and perhaps other uh, more carbon intensive materials as well. So that was the purpose behind it. Now, uh, as I say, I understand the points that are made, but for the purposes of um, seeking to grow this industry and noting that it was uh, many of the um, key stakeholders in that sector who said this is one way we will be able to unlock that investment. It is one of the key hurdles. We're having farmers who uh, we normally contract with who are saying, upon harvest, we now want to turn that into pasture because there's more money and easier returns in growing uh, certain types of crops or uh, heading into dairy, for example, in certain parts of Tasmania. So, uh, you know, obviously it takes a while to see the fruit born from this scheme, but uh, I remain confident that it will do what we intended it would, um, but for that reason we won't be supporting that disallowance. And on the other, on the uh, uh, disallowance motion moved there by Senator Waters, of course, um, I mean, I, I, I don't agree with the assessment that. Uh, um, that under this new safeguards mechanism proposal put forward by the government there will be this sort of flurry of seeking to uh, grab ACUs to cover over the emissions because there won't be enough ACUs. There just will not be. All the modelling is suggesting there will be a massive shortfall even with schemes like this in place. Uh, so in the end I'll just end up paying this massive tax that's going to be imposed instead. So look, the disallowance is a bad one. Uh, in this regard, and uh, we won't be supporting that one, but uh, appreciate the work that's been put in, and um, that's the opposition's position. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. The time. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on either of these motions? Senator Scar. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I just want to bring one point to uh, the attention of the of the chamber. And there were some remarks made around carbon capture and storage. And I'll just note this, and all senators, uh, I think of all of us should be looking at what's happening around the world, etc., in terms of all the different ways, the different methodologies to address this issue. And I refer senators to a press release on the European Commission's website on 12 January 2023, um, which is entitled State Aid Commission Approves 1.1 billion euro Danish scheme to support rollout of carbon capture and storage technologies. Now, this technology is moving very quickly around the world. I think we have to be open-minded with respect to the technologies that we bring to bear in terms of addressing these issues. Thank you. So there are two matters simultaneously before the chair. I propose to put the first one for you, Senator Pocock, and then follow as we did in the speeches with you, Senator Waters. So the question that is that the motion moved by Senator David Pocock be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The second question for this uh, part of the debate today is the question. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by 
Senator Waters be agreed to? Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I no. think the noes have it. Uh, is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim for the ayes and Senator Scar for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 13, noes 33. The question is resolved in the negative. Um, senators, the Senate will now be returning to uh, the matter of public importance proposed by Senator Lambie. And I call Senator Ciccone in continuation. And if senators who are not involved in the MPI debate could depart quietly, that would uh, assist the efficient movement of the chamber. Senator Ciccone. Thanks a lot, uh, Acting Deputy President. I'm just trying to remember now where I left off. But um, I think where I was saying um, was that different political parties have different approaches and histories on this very issue. Um, so I would suggest um, that we should not paint all political parties with the same brush on the issue of political donations. But I do thank Senator Lambie for providing the Chamber with an opportunity to at least reflect on uh, some of the, the proud history, I guess, that Federal Labor has on, on this particular subject matter. Um, you know, it was certainly back uh, in the 80s that when former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, who first introduced political donation disclosure uh, regime reforms, it was Prime Minister Hawke's government that established an electoral commission independent from government that now publishes details about how political donations uh, are, are managed and via transparent register. Under the political donations regime established by Federal Labor, donations over $1,000 had to be declared. It was subsequently a Liberal government that increased the threshold to $10,000 and, and, and linked it to 10000 and that's how we've ended up with the current disclosure threshold of $15,000. Uh, it was also Labor's amendments, while we're in opposition, that linked public election funding to ex campaign expenditure. These amendments uh, prevent political parties from, profit, from profiting off our electoral system. And of course, it was Labor who acted to protect our democracy from foreign interference, forcing the then coalition government to ban foreign political donations. But we know our task is not uh, done on political donation reform. I think a significant uh, theme out of the federal election last year uh, was Australians deserve um, far more integrity and far more transparency in our political system. Obviously, a significant component of how Labor is delivering on this front uh, is the National Anti-Corruption Commission, but further political donation reform is also important. And I think that is, has been acknowledged by um, uh, the Special Minister of State, um, Senator Don Farrell. In opposition, um, it is important to note that we did bring forward legislation before the Senate to lower the uh, disclosure threshold back to a fixed $1,000 and require donations to be closed within seven days. This would have brought our donation laws in line with community expectations and given uh, every Australian the opportunity to see who donates to politicians before they go to the ballot box. The Albanese government understands that political donation reform isn't just about uh, doing what's popular in any given sitting period. It's about setting up an effective system that meets community expectations and can also withstand the ine inevitable political shifts and changes that occur in this place across Australia more broadly. And that is why this kind of reform is most effective and most sustainable when it is implemented with broad support of this parliament. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Watts. Thanks very much, Sorry, Acting Waters. Deputy President. Well, last week we finally got to see how the 2022 election was funded and who filled the coffers of the big parties. And it shows what it always shows. Big money is running politics. While Clive Palmer's multi-million dollar donation to his own party dominated the news, the Labor, Liberal and Nationals also raked in $240 million in funds. Donations to political parties continue to reap rewards for the donors. It's why we've got weak safeguard laws and more coal and gas projects are being opened in a climate crisis. It's why reforms to hold the financial sector to account or to regulate gambling keep stalling. It's why governments continue to spend millions on consultants at the expense of the public service. In some ways, a bigger story about the donations that we uh, know about, a bigger story than that, is the donations that we don't know about. The source of at least 30 per cent of donations to political parties remains unknown. Now, that's just not good enough. Our current laws are full of loopholes to avoid transparency. Donors can contribute hundreds of thousands of dollars as membership fees to party-affiliated business forums and not report that as a donation. 
donors can donate to affiliated bodies who then funnel the money to the party without disclosing where it came from. Shame. Donors can spend thousands of dollars on a dinner with the minister, but it's not a donation if they think they got value for money from the event. It's very easy to see how fossil fuel companies getting in the ear of the minister and getting massive public subsidies to keep destroying the planet think that they're getting value for money. Donations below $15,200 don't need to be disclosed at all, which inspires a lot of donors to make out their cheque to $15,190. And donors can make big donations to political parties and voters don't find out until 20 months later, well after the election. We urgently need donations caps to get big money out of politics. We need election spending caps to put an end to the arms race that makes parties so reliant on political donations. And we need reforms to ensure that all donations over $1,000 are disclosed in real time so that people know when they go to the ballot box who's pulling the strings of the parties that they're voting for. The Greens have been campaigning for decades to clean up our democracy, and we urge Labor and the crossbench to join us in supporting reforms to make sure the politicians work in the public interest, not the interests of their corporate big donor mates. Thank you, Senator Waters. I call Senator White. Uh, Acting Deputy President, Labor has a proud history of political donations reform. Uh, uh, as Senator Ciccone has mentioned, it was the Hawke government that established an independent electoral commission to publish details about political donor donations. It was the same Hawke government that in first introduced a political donations disclosure regime, and under Hawke, political donations of above $1,000 had to be declared. This was the status quo until a coalition government got into power and decided to link the disclosure amount with the rate of inflation. This caused the disclosure threshold to blow out to the current rate of over $15,000. What can I say? I'm not surprised at the coalition, but I am disappointed. Nevertheless, Labor maintains its proud tradition of electoral reform in the pursuit of integrity uh, and accountability in government. And it is this proud Labor tradition that I point out to Senator Lambie and others that the donation issue she is talking about is in fact one part of a much broader and deeper suite of reforms that the government is currently considering. These include man uh, mandatory disclosure of do donations over $1,000, real-time reporting, reforms to the funding of elections, including donation <coughs> caps, and public funding of parties and candidates. All of these matters have been considered by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters and are things Labor has been talking about for quite some time. Let us not forget that we took electoral and donation reform to the election in 2022, and we won. Um, as the Special Minister of State has explained repeatedly. For our government, electoral reform is about greater integrity and transparency for the Australian people, but it's also about consensus. The government wants to bring the Australian people and the parliament along with it when it comes to electoral reform, and in this, that spirit of consensus, neither myself nor any other government centre is going to preempt the recommendations of the Electoral Matters com uh, Committee. That is what the committee is there for, to review issues like the one Senator Lambie is pointing to, and the report back to the parliament with its findings and recommendations. Once that in-depth process is complete, we have the policy work done, we can and will act on these matters. But you don't have to believe me, you just have to look at the record. It was Labor that forced coali the coalition government to ban foreign political donations in order to safeguard our democracy from foreign interference, and it is the Australian Labor Party that goes above and beyond what is currently required by the rules. Our party discloses all don donations federally, federally above $1,000 because we respect transparency and accountability. In opposition, we brought legislation to the Senate to fix the disclosure threshold to $1,000 and uh, require those donations to be disclosed within seven days. Of course, as is often the case with the Coalition on Matters of Integrity, they chose not to support transparency and accountability. Instead, they chose to keep the matter. I'm sorry. It's not personal. It's just political. Oh, a matter of political donations hidden from the public. But the Coalition are not the only ones standing in the way of electoral form. Clearly, 
there is a major issue when Clive Palmer, a person that Senator Lambie is no doubt familiar with, um, can spend tens of millions of dollars on false and misleading advertising in a brazen attempt to undermine our last two elections. Clearly there is an issue when a sitting Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, can donate $1.7 million to his own party in an election campaign and not have to disclose that fact for over a year. So it's clear that reform is needed around the issue Senator Lambie has pointed to, not just around donation reform but spending caps and truth in advertising laws too. But it's got to be done right and it's got to be done thoroughly, not piecemeal, not rushed. And so Order, I look forward to that report from the Electoral Matters Commission and seeing what it recommends in relation to all these issues. But because I know that the federal government, just like the Labor Party in every state and territory, takes donation reform and principles of transparency seriously. Just look at my home state of Victoria. The Andrews government, the Labor government has introduced donation reform there. Donations from in individuals and organisations are kept on a per annum and four yearly basis. Foreign donations are banned. There is a regular and transparent reporting system and the Victorian Electoral Commission is properly funded to manage the increased compliance obligation. I'm not saying that the Victorian model is perfect in any way, but in every way, but what should apply to the common and it sh that it shouldn't necessarily apply to the uh, Commonwealth because I'm not going to be preempting the the committee process. Rather, I bring up the Victorian example to show that it is in fact Labor governments that lead on election and donation for reform. Actions speak louder than words. Let's remember who put in who uh, legislated for the National Anti-Corruption Commission, and that's why it will be the Labor government that takes the next step in delivering our proud on our proud history of electoral Senator reform Blake, to ensure integrity and trust in our political expired. system. I call Senator Steele, John. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Our community expects and deserves uh, to be able to access a GP and access medication that they need without having to break the bank. We also expect that democracy works, where politicians work in the interests of the people who elect them, um, not the corporations who fund their campaigns. Our public health services are as anyone who is paying attention would be able to tell you, in crisis. The AMA predicts that the elective surgery waiting list will grow to 500,000 by June. That's nearly one in 50 of our community who will be waiting for an elective surgery. Private health insurance has become, a, in many ways, a necessity in this country. If you need a dental care appointment, if you need mental health care, if you need even basic care in a timely fashion, uh, then you often need private health insurance or you will be waiting and paying thousands out of pocket. While many of us are despairing at the current crisis, there is one group of people and individuals who love the system just the way that it is, private health and pharmaceutical companies. They love the system. Uh, that so, so much, in fact, that they gave nearly $2 million uh, to the Australian Labor Party and to the Coalition uh, in the last couple of years alone. It isn't hard to join the dots uh, between our public health system being under-resourced and private health insurers and pharmaceutical companies lining their pockets uh, of the major parties. The Greens want to see uh, this place ban corporate donations so that companies like Medibank, Private and Bupa don't get to influence the direction of health policy in this country. Let us have a health system for people and not for big corporations. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, I call Senator David Pocock. Yes. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I welcome this MPI from Senator Lambie. It is indeed a matter of public importance. Spending at the recent federal election was a record, $439.4 million. And political donation reform is something that Australians want to see happen. I welcome the the review that JSCM is, is um, uh, undertaking and the government's commitment to dealing with this. Clearly, we, we have to deal with this in Australia. Australians want uh, more transparency around political donations. They want to have trust and confidence in our political system, that decisions that are being made in this place and in the other place are in the best interests of Australians, of 
all of us and not vested interests. And when you read through the uh, returns, which we get months and months after the election, uh, it certainly raises some questions why there are such large sums of money coming from gambling, alcohol, the banks, fossil fuel companies, and tragically, even tobacco is still a donor to the nationals. This, this, this needs to stop. We can stop it. It is within the power of the parliament to put in place um, changes that ensure that there are things like low disclosure thresholds, real-time disclosures. Technology has moved a long way, and it is possible for people in a reasonable time frame to see who is donating to elections while they're happening, not after the fact, uh, you know, sometimes six months after the fact. Thank you, Senator Pocock. I call uh, Senator Babette. Thank you. Now, the Prime Minister warned on Sunday in a speech at the Chifley Research Centre. He said that democracy was fragile and so it needed to be nourished, protected, cared for and treated with respect. That's what he said. Now, those were his words and I agree wholeheartedly with the Prime Minister. But the PM's words beg the question, how, Prime Minister? How do we nourish, how do we protect democracy? Our system of government, where people consent to be governed, is fragile because it is built entirely upon trust. People give their consent to be governed because they trust that their elected reps will be acting honestly and with integrity. How do you nourish trust? How do you build faith? The answer is transparency. Trust can only exist to the degree of transparency that is given. Now, the United Australia Party believes in full disclosure of all political donations, no matter how large or how small. The UAP has one donor, just one, and we all know who it is. You can like it or you can not like it, but at least you know. He's an Australian citizen. He loves his country. There's your transparency. That is not the case with the major parties. Not the case at all. Some donations may not even be declared. Non-disclosure of donations, what does it do? It raises questions and it creates room for doubt, suspicion, mistrust the very thing that undermines our system of government. If the Prime Minister truly wants to nourish and protect democracy, he will move to ensure that all political party donations are declared and are on the public record. Transparency creates trust. Trust strengthens democracy. If the PM meant what he said on Sunday, then full transparency with regards to political donations is something he should embrace without hesitation. Any reluctance to do so increases doubt, suspicion, mistrust. Let's Thank not you. undermine democracy. Thank you, Senator Babette. Uh, call Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. One Nation supports greater transparency and more disclosure of corporate donations. However, we are concerned that moves to reveal small donations and po political party membership will discourage greater participation by the Australian people in politics. It is often the case that even a passing association with conservative parties will see individuals, businesses and organisations attacked by the woke and the loony green left. For the left, anything to do with the right is illegitimate or downright criminal. They are incapable of tolerating any view which departs even the slightest from the orthodoxy and will try to destroy or ruin those who do. The Marxist Greens are the worst perpetrators of this intolerance. And what I have found from businesses who do support One Nation, they are in fear of giving donations because if they are exposed to donations, then they will lose government um, jobs, contracts, or are affected by the, uh, the other side of politics, whether it's the coalition or whether it's Labor. So there is Thank a dilemma Senator out there Hansen. for the public. Your time's expired. Indeed, the time for discussion has expired. The Senate will now be moving to the urgency motion. The President has also uh, received the following letter from Senator Hume. Uh, Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency, the need for the Senate to reaffirm its commitment to the Coalition's personal income tax plan that upon full implementation will mean around 95 per cent of taxpayers are expected to face a marginal tax rate of no more than 30 per cent, which Australians need now more than ever, thanks to faster bracket creep and greater pressures under Labor's cost of living crisis. 
signed Senator Hume. Is the proposal supported? Uh, thank you very much, Senators. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Uh, I call Senator Hume. Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy President. We hear a lot in this chamber around the debate around stage three tax cuts, but it's important to understand exactly what this means because these tax cuts have to be understood in the context of the other two stages that preceded them. The former coalition government passed the personal income tax plan to deliver lower, simpler and fairer taxes for working Australians. Now, these are legislated tax cuts. They are reflected not only in the coalition's budgets but also in Labor's pre-election costings and in the October budget last year. Now, the final stage of the personal income tax plan will commence in 2024, on the 1st of July. And at that time, 30, the 37 per cent tax bracket will be abolished entirely and the 32.5 per cent tax rate will be reduced to 30 per cent. Now, once fully implemented, this means that 95 per cent of Australian taxpayers are expected to face a marginal tax rate of no more than 30 per cent. This is a significant reform. It's been such a long time coming. Lower, simpler, fairer taxes. Under the personal income tax plan, an apprentice on $60,000 would pay $1,455 less in tax every year from 1 July 2024, whereas an experienced tradie on, say, $80,000 would pay $1,955 less tax every year from 1 July 2024. 2024. More money in the pockets of working Australians is more important than ever, particularly now as we look down the barrel and buckle under the weight of Labor's cost of living crisis. More money to help Australians with the expenses like mortgage repayments, like groceries, like energy bills, all of which are going up under this government. And while those opposite would like to talk about just about anything else, this is the number one issue for ordinary Australians right now. Last April, the Treasurer said that this is a full-blown cost of living crisis. He used the words full-blown cost of living crisis. That was last April. Now, since that time, inflation is at its highest point in 30 years, real wages are going back backwards and are forecast to continue to go backwards for the entire term of this parliament. And interest rates are at their highest point in over a decade. However, even with these facts in front of them, the government still will not admit that they are presiding over a real cost of living crisis while they are in government. Last week at the Cost of Living Committee, Woolworths gave evidence that Australians are beginning to change their consumer behaviour and that they are having increasing demands from their charity partners for up to 20 per cent more in food donations. Customers are beginning to leave things at the checkout on the aisle uh, rather than putting them into their bags because their food bills are going up. At the same time, we know energy prices are going up. Can you name an Australian that hasn't received a bill that has said that their energy prices are going up, their electricity prices are going up, their gas prices are going up? Ordinary Australians are feeling the pinch. This is despite a promise, a commitment by those opposite to reduce electricity prices by $275, a number they will not even say now that they are in government. They will not repeat the words $275, and that's because energy bills are skyrocketing under, the, skyrocketing under their watch. Just last year, late last year, Anthony, uh, the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has promised a $230 reduction in energy prices and, again, another promise that has disappeared already. Last week, the Cost of Living Committee heard from the energy regulator that, in fact, investment in energy, is, energy projects is disappearing entirely disappearing entirely, threatening long-term supply, and its massive interventions in the market are actually causing prices to go up, not to go down. 
This is a problem for all Australians, but the biggest one, of course, is Labor's addiction to spending. Because Labor's addiction to spending, the $23 billion of extra money that was spent just in the October budget alone, is one of the reasons why the RBA is being forced to over and over and over again raise interest rates, affecting mortgage holders, affecting, uh, affecting borrowers, affecting ordinary Australians every day. They are feeling this in their pocket. We know that it's inf inf inflation, that interest rates are both going to go higher under Labor because Philip Lowe told us that they will, and Australians will pay more. In this environment, a personal income tax plan, the Coalition's personal income tax plan, is more important than ever. It is more important for ordinary Australians to keep more of their own money under a simpler, fairer and, uh, and, and uh, under a simpler, fairer tax system. Thank you, Senator Hume. I call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President, and I too rise to speak on this urgency motion before the Senate today, submitted by Senator Hume on uh, tax and the cost of living. Uh, and first, let me say that our priority when it comes to tax reform is ensuring that multinationals pay their fair share of tax here in Australia. Uh, multinational corporations will pay an extra billion dollars in tax as we clamp down on excessive deductions and profit shifting to other countries. Uh, and cracking down on multinational tax avoidance is absolutely key uh, to our government's revenue agenda. Uh, and so too, of course, is cracking down on the waste and the rorts that have contributed to a trillion dollars of debt left to us by those opposite without any economic dividend to show for it. It is the waste and the rorts of those opposite uh, that we are setting about fixing. Uh, it is the waste and the rorts of those opposite that have left a hole in the budget that it's been left to us to repair. The sports rorts. The car, park, the car park rorts, the airport land rorts, remember those. Um, the rorts of a former government who spent taxpayer money like it was a Liberal Party slush fund. And just stop to imagine uh, where we'd be today if those opposite had actually thought about how to invest in the Australian people and in the Australian economy instead of in their own failed re-election plans. Imagine if they had invested in any forward-looking plans to address any of the structural economic causes of the cost of living crisis today. If they had invested, for example, in renewable energy generation and transmission. If they had invested in manufacturing and securing our supply chains if they'd invested in the security of Australian women and their ability to participate fully in our economy. Imagine if those opposite had spent 10 years investing in social and affordable housing, where we would be today in the cost of living crisis affecting Australians. Imagine if they'd invested in the skills crisis that is holding business back right now today and holding Australians back as well from achieving their full potential. The former government was asleep at the wheel. They were asleep on climate and energy. They were asleep on jobs and skills. They were asleep on securing manufacturing supply chains. They were asleep on understanding how gender equality drives economic growth. And they were asleep on housing supply, absolutely asleep at the wheel. And so much could have been done to strengthen our economy for the future in the last decade. So much should have been done. And the fact that so little was done to position our country, not just for the challenges ahead, but actually for the opportunities too, is a complete dereliction of responsibility. You trashed any notion of good government. You trashed any notion of good economic management. And it, it is Australians who are paying the price now for a decade of missed opportunities and messed up priorities under the former government. What we are doing is getting on with delivering the meaningful investments that Australians need, that maximise our economic impact and that meet the needs of the community today. 
We understand that cost of living is hitting Australians hard. And so our economic plan is a direct and deliberate response to the challenges facing the economy that you left behind. And that's why one of the very first acts of this government was to successfully argue for an increase to the minimum wage to keep pace with inflation. And we are proud to be getting wages moving once again in this country after a decade of flat wages brought by those opposite. And our October budget focused on cost of living relief that didn't put extra pressure on inflation. And that's the most important thing. Tackling inflation Order, is our please. top priority. And that, of course, has been noted by the rating agencies reaffirming our AAA credit rating, pointing to our responsible economic management. We are delivering the economy that Australians need. We are getting wages moving and we are dealing with the cost of living pressures that you left behind. Uh, thank you, Senator Walsh. I'm about to call Senator McKim, but I just will note that Senator Hume was heard in silence, which is the convention of good practice in the Senate. And I'll ask for order from senators. Senator McKim. Thank you uh, very much. Well, here we are in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Food, petrol, medicine, transport, rent, electricity, insurance, mortgage, repayments, you name it, the price of everything is going up. However, while workers Students, mortgage holders, small businesses are all getting smashed. Corporations are making record profits. Real wages are going backwards, but company profits are at record highs. Inequality is increasing before our very eyes. And yet here we are today, here are the Liberals today, asking the Senate to endorse a $9,000 a year tax cut for billionaires. I mean, how out of touch can you get? Tax cuts for the super rich that will further fuel inflation, that will further fuel inequality and, making the, and make the cost of living crisis worse for everyone except, except for those who are already very wealthy. But that's what you expect from the Liberals. But the real issue here is the Australian Labor Party, once the party of the workers, but now just another political party for the asset-owning class. Labor senators know stage three is bad policy. Labor has actually never once run the argument that stage three tax cuts are good policy, never once, because they know that they're not. They only supported the stage three tax cuts for the very wealthy to neutralise the issue to give them the best chance to win the election. Make no mistake about this, Labor's policy on the stage three tax, cut, tax cuts boils down to this. They're not going to do the right thing because they promised to do the wrong thing. That's Labor's policy. They would rather turbocharge inequality and, for that matter, gender inequality than change their position. A quarter of a trillion dollars in tax cuts, three quarters of which go to the top 20 per cent of income earners, and twice as much of the benefit goes to men than to women. If Labor had the political will, they could unlegislate the legislated tax cuts. The numbers are there in this parliament, in this Senate and in the House, if Labor was prepared to do the right thing by this country. But they're not. That's why the stage three tax cuts are no longer the Liberal stage three tax cuts, they are Labor's stage three tax cuts. Because if they're not prepared to ditch them, then they're going to have to own them. Senator Hughes. Acting Deputy President. Well, the last six months have been interesting, embarrassing at times, but I really do think today is seeing a new low bar being set. It is just extraordinary, both from Question Time and some of the contributions that have been uh, made by those now in government, where they are in almost denial of a cost of living crisis that the Assistant Minister or Assistant Treasurer, I should say, has now declared that the RBA is going to stop raising interest rates, so the crisis is over. No need to, to look here. 
the constant blaming, whining, carry on, looking back to the past, passing the buck as Australians continue to feel the pinch more and more every single day. I think it is really time for those opposite to grow up, understand they're in government, that that means actually making decisions that are going to be better for Australians, not worse. Obviously, that memo got missed uh, because every single Australian since the Albanese government has come to power is now worse off. And the, the, tax, the, the tax cuts under stage three that were legislated, that we're they're, they're almost, not quite, almost at Voldemort's status, like the 275, the number that shall not be named. They're not quite at Voldemort's status, but they are getting very, very close, because we know 97 times we were told power bills were going to go down by $275, where we know they're going to go up, and they're probably going to go up by more than $275. So the stage, stage three tax cuts are going to be so required for all those tradies that are going to see almost 2,000 in 80, on 80,000, almost 2,000 back in their pocket each year, because they're going to need it because their mortgages have gone up eight times since this Labor government came to power. Now, if you compare that to the Liberal government, where there was one increase, <coughs> we now have interest rates and a cash rate that are the highest it's been in 10 years. But we're not seeing this government pull any policy levers that are moving towards reducing inflation, because every step they take, every move they make, they are making a bad situation worse. I know I could be a little lyricist there, Senator Scar, but every time they make a decision, they're making the situation worse. We've got these Frankenstein energy legislation that came in last year that everyone, including the ACCC, has said time and time and time again, this is going to push up power prices. Well, guess what, guys? That contributes to inflationary pressures, which then leads to the RBA taking action on interest rates. There is actually some rhyme and reason to why these things occur. They do follow suit. And this new uh, carbon tax, because we know the, the Labor Party is just obsessed with the carbon tax and now proposing one at three times the level that the Gillard government tried to legislate and pull in, into place. The impact that that's going to have, I, I just am amazed that those in government are absolutely, completely unaware the impact this is going to have on businesses, on manufacturing. Look around this building. We're, we're all sitting in a building here. It's got an awful lot of concrete in it. Concrete uses a product called clinker to be produced. It is about to all go offshore because if this carbon tax comes into place, there will be no Australian cement manufacturers. That means we lose our sovereignty. We put ourselves at risk. One of the most common products that's used in every building, every road. How are you going to get over a river? It was put to me yesterday when we were looking at some of this stuff. How do you build a bridge? Well, we know that they don't want to build some of that stuff if it's in a Liberal seat or in Mayo, but you know, others will still want to build things. And you're about to implement a carbon tax that is going to send all of this manufacturing offshore. We're talking about hundreds of jobs are going to be lost. And it is going to increase the cost of absolutely everything. And that's just one industry. We also know that these uh, new gas supply issues are seeing investments go offshore. And th there is a high likelihood we're going to see blackouts this year. And this is something that's going to have ramifications for decades as investment is leaving this country. It is going elsewhere because those in the resources sector know that this government now cannot be trusted to put policy settings in place that allow them to safely invest in Australia and continue to grow our nation. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I'm somewhat um, taken aback by the rhetoric of those who find themselves now in opposition um, it is an urgency motion, but I, I, I note that they had a decade in office, uh, which can only be described as a decade of wasted opportunities and warped priorities, that left Australians, who now this opposition seem to think they should stand up for, 
left Australians with real, falling real wages, cost of living pressures and a trillion dollars of debt without an economic dividend to show for it. So um, any claim that they make in this argument about being good managers of money and good with the economy uh, has to be absolutely seen for what it is, a, a, an attempt to continue the con of the last 10 years. I rise in particular to speak to the motion put forward by Senator Hume. And let me just say for the record, despite the uh, great confusion uh, that's trying to be created and whipped up, drummed up by those in opposition, our policy position hasn't changed since we arrived in government. We support responsible, responsible cost of living relief because Australians need that and they need us as our government to respond to them. And we will focus on multinational tax avoidance in order to improve the budget bottom line and improve the outcomes for Australia, for our national economy and for the benefit of all Australians. Now, we'll do this in a calm, measured and considered way. And that is the way in which the Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, has been talking to the Australian people. And by his careful action, his careful words, he's considered government, not the chaos, panic, deception and lies that have been uh, the hallmark of the last 10 years. Treasurer Chalmers has taken action to ensure that we've maintained our triple-A credit rating, and the rating agencies acknowledge that Labor's budget, the first one in December uh, last year, uh, sorry, in October last year, uh, did not add to inflation. Now, the Albanese government has already passed a series of measures to improve the household budgets of everyday Australians who expect their government to respond. And that's what we've done. We've focused on responsible cost of living relief. And that's the kind of relief that doesn't put extra pressure on inflation. That's a really important thing. We understand that is a critical economic indicator that we have to really pay close attention to. Now, the Albanese government is and will deliver on critical things that impact people's lives in a way that will assist them to manage their budgets. Cheaper childcare. That's happening under the Albanese government. That is a cost of living measure that is responsible. Expanded paid parental leave, promised as part of our commitment leading into the election. Cheaper medicines, the most significant change in the cost of medicine in 75 years. That changes pressure on families. We know that that's sensible assistance. Of course, more affordable housing and my colleague uh, Minister Collins in the other house is introducing legislation to fulfil our commitments about housing because that is a massive problem that was created by 10 years of inaction by those opposite. And of course, wage growth. And we're just starting to hear now that companies that refuse to negotiate with unions around this country, refuse to negotiate on, on wages, are actually coming back to the table to bargain, and wage growth will begin for Australian people. These things matter, and they don't occur in a vacuum. Inflation is a global issue. The war in the Ukraine, started by the brutal kleptocrat Vladimir Putin, has impacted supply chains right across the globe, particularly in relation to energy and food. Now, Australians understand that we did not create those challenges, but Australians also elected us to responsibly take on those challenges and address them as they present, and we are addressing those challenges. So I stand here very proud of a sensible government committed to addressing multinational tax avoidance to improve the bottom line for Australians and to provide them with non-inflationary uh, best possible help to manage their cost of living challenges. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too rise to make a contribution in this debate on cost of living and the legislated tax cuts. And I'll start in that position. These are legislated tax cuts. These are tax cuts which are in place at the moment. People are 
expecting them to be delivered, no matter who's in power. People are expecting to keep more of their own hard-earned money, no matter who is in power. And people are expecting, they're hoping, for a government that actually knows how to manage the economy, how to tackle the inflationary crisis, not to keep blaming solely the war in Ukraine for something that is much deeper than that, something that is a much more significant uh, uh, and embedded in the Australian economy than that. We are seeing currently an annualised CPI of around 7.8 per cent. In my home state in the last quarter of last year, that reflected a uh, CPI rate of 3.6 per cent. 3.6 per cent in one quarter. Annualised, very easy to see that that is that's not uh, that's not 7.8 per cent. That's well in excess of uh, 14 per cent. So we are in a situation where the average families out there, average mums and dads, are facing an extraordinary level of pressure on the family budget in terms of increasing petrol prices, 2.2 per cent rise in the December quarter, increasing electricity prices, 8.6 per cent in the December quarter, and forecast to further increase this year. Health services going up at 4.2 per cent per annum. And that is just the start of the pressure that's facing Australian families. Australian households. That's just the start, because we've also seen the fastest rate of um, uh, 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 cash rate rise uh, uh, in history. Uh, we've seen uh, cash rates, mortgage interest rates, rise at a faster rate under this government than we've ever seen before. Uh, and the track record on interest rates from the respective parties of government is pretty clear. I went through this last night. I'll, I'll just go back to some of the key points again. Uh, since the RBA has been publishing data since 1990, so that's a 32-year that's a period, that's a decent sample size, I think you'd all agree, we've seen, we've seen a, 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 a data set that shows us that the Labor Party has delivered the highest interest rate in that period of 17.5 per cent compared to the coalition's highest rate of 7.5 per cent. We've seen the coalition deliver average cash rates, so this is not mortgage rate, this is cash rate, so add 2 or 3 per cent for your mortgage, of 3.7 per cent, whereas under Labor the average rate has been 6.2. 6.2 versus 3.7 over a 32-year period. This is not just some statistical anomaly. This is not just some blip. This is uh, the comparison of a party of government, the coalition, the Liberal Party, that knows how to handle money, that knows how to manage the economy, that knows how to balance the needs of growth with the needs of uh, what society demands from government, uh, compared to the Labor Party, who simply does not. And they're demonstrating that again now. The, the things they cite in this place as examples of how they're providing uh, 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 relief to households are, quite frankly, very small, very limited in the number of households they help, and simply do not go to what people need. People need to see a government with a plan to actually tackle the inflationary crisis that we're currently under. These are not sustainable levels of inflation, and they are actually undermining wages of Australians. Real wage growth is plummeting. Have you noticed that those opposites never talk about real wage growth anymore? Because they know that with inflation where it is today, we won't see real wage rises for many, many years. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Uh, I, the question is that the motion um, moved now be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those, of, those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is: the urgency motion is moved by Senator Hume be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Pratt as teller for the noes.
order, there being 27 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We would now normally move to the consideration of documents, but I'm reliably informed that there are no documents today, so we will move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. I believe it's Senator Askew. Um, thank you. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I, thank you, Mr Acting De Deputy President. I understand that this was the uh, place for me to table a non-conforming petition. If I'm um, wrong about that, please correct me. Okay, thank you. Please. I'd like to seek leave to table a non-conforming petition to fully fund Trove, the National Library of Australia's critically important online archive. As of today, this petition has over 28,500 signatures. That's a, that's a lot. I understand the whips have agreed to give leave to this, and I table the petition. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator Steeljohn. Seek the leave in this portion of the agenda to table a non-conforming petition. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I table a non-conforming petition in relation to the extension of the National Home Doctor Service to daytime uh, for the purposes of improving accessibility for disabled people. Uh, the the, um, the uh, petition has 7,943 uh, signatures. I seek the leave to table. Thank you. Leave is granted. Senator Askew. Thank you. On behalf of the Chair of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Dean Smith, I present Scrutiny IGS 1 of 2023, together with ministerial responses to committee correspondence, and I seek leave to have the Chair's tabling speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I'm going to give you a whole heap of others. Uh, Senator Scar. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak in relation to the Scrutiny of Bills report, and I want to make three points in relation to the scrutiny of Bill's report. The first is this. On page 10, there, from page 10, there are a number of scrutiny issues, multiple scrutiny issues, which are reported with respect to the Treasury Laws Amendment Energy Price Relief Plan Bill 2022. That's what happens. That's what happens, colleagues, when a bill is introduced in this place, as it was last December, at short notice, Members in this place only received a copy of the bill at 8.25 p.m. on the night before the sitting, and then it was debated in this place without the benefit of going through a scrutiny process. So we are now in a situation where in early February, in early February, for the first time, for the first time, this Senate is looking at the carefully considered scrutiny issues with respect to that legislation. That is unacceptable. It is an unacceptable way to make laws in this country. Unacceptable. And these are major issues that are raised in this report. First, principle four, significant matters in delegated legislation when they should have been the legislation. Principle three, broad discretionary power. Section 96, Commonwealth grants to the states. And it goes on. Exemption from disallowance, that old bugbear that keeps coming up. And yet the scrutiny, the scrutiny issues carefully considered by the Scrutiny Committee, are first presented in this place in February, after the, the bill was debated in December. And I've been watching the commentary from people in this place, senators in this place, not of my own party necessarily, but others, the crossbench and elsewhere, who raise surprise and concern at some of the ramifications, some of the flows of money under that legislation, after it was debated, after it was passed, but before, before it went through an appropriate scrutiny process. It is unacceptable that that should occur with respect to such a major piece of legislation. 
The second point I want to raise in relation to this uh, digest is we keep getting the same issues. When is there going to be change with respect to some of these fundamental scrutiny concerns? I point to the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2022. The scrutiny concerns include exemption from disallowance again and again and again. Bills are introduced into this place with important regulation-making power, important instrument delegated legislation-making power, and they are exempt from disallowance. And what does that mean for those sitting in the gallery and for those listening to the debate? It means you have a bill passed in this place, then the minister has discretion to, part, to introduce a regulation. That goes through, and even if a majority of the senators in this place disagreed with it, we've got no process to stop it. We've got no process to stop it. It defeats this institution as a de democratic institution. We're meant to be a house of review, and yet our ability to review is gutted every time delegated legislation is made exempt from disallowance. The third point I wanted to point to in this scrutiny, uh, in this scrutiny digest is with respect to the Crimes Amendment Penalty Unit Bill 2022. Now, a number of scrutiny concerns were raised in relation to that bill. And we're now in a situation where the bill's passed and, and the committee raised scrutiny concerns as to how was it calculated that the criminal penalties under a whole raft of legislation should, should go up by 24 per cent. And the actual basis for that was queried by the scrutiny committee. And this is what the attorney tells us. The attorney general also noted that the bill had already passed both houses of the parliament at the time of writing. Isn't that wonderful? The bill goes through before fundamental scrutiny concerns are actually considered by senators in this place. The scrutiny processes in this place are of the utmost importance to protect the rights and liberties of the Australian people. Absolutely, it's an important check and balance in our democratic process. But if legislation is pushed through before the scrutiny process can even begin, as in the case of the gas price control legislation, or at such a pace that scrutiny concerns aren't reasonably answered and the relevant minister simply says, well, the bill's been passed, what's the point? That is unacceptable. It undermines the democratic institutions of our country and it impedes the Senate's role as an important house of review and a check and balance on the executive. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator White. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I present Delegated Legislation oh, sorry. Monitor number two of sorry, 22. Senator White, I, I didn't put the question. Um, I, the question now be put that uh, the, the Senate take note of the tabling of co committee report as tabled by Senator Askew. So those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator White. Uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, I present Delegated Legislation Monitor number two of 2023 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated uh, Legislation. Thank you. Senator Scarf. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> now we want to talk about the other scrutiny committee the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation Committee. And first, I want to compliment my colleague, Senator White, in relation to her chairing of the committee. She does an outstanding job, an absolutely outstanding job, <coughs> and she, I think, is continuing the bipartisan or nonpartisan role of that committee. Again, as an important check and balance in, on the executive in relation to the— in relation to the no, there's nothing. That, more compliments. That's all that's coming, Senator Ciccone, more compliments. Uh, so I'll take that interjection. <laughs> <laughs> now let, let me give you an example for those I'll listening back. to one of the sorts of issues we grapple with on this scrutiny of delegated legislation committee, and it's dealt with in this digest. This is the sort of nonsense that this scrutiny committee has to put up with. The sort of nonsense we have to put up with. So legitimate scrutiny concerns were raised with respect to the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission Amendment Code of Conduct and Banning Orders Rules 2022. And let me read from the Digest, paragraph 1.6. Section 23BE of the instrument provides 
that if an investigation is undertaken in relation to compliance under section 23BD, the Commissioner may open quotation marks, take any action. Close quotation marks. That's what it says. Take any action to deal with the outcome of an investigation that they consider appropriate. That's the power that's invested in the Commissioner. Now, the Scrutiny Committee, it should not come as a surprise to any senators here, raised the obvious uh, point that maybe take any action that the com Commissioner considers appropriate is too wide a power. It gives him too, her, he or her too great a discretion. That perhaps there should be some boundaries, some guardrails, some guidance as to what action the Commissioner can or can't take. And again and again, the department resists. The department resists common sense amendments that would actually provide appropriate limits with respect to discretionary powers. Why do we need to continue debating these issues again and again and again? The same issues continually arising. The last point I want to make on this, I did. Um, I do really want to uh, compliment members of the scrutiny. Uh, committee with respect to their collegiality. From time to time we become somewhat exasperated with the views of uh, departments when they write back consistently uh, in the terms in which they do. And, uh, it reminded me of an essay which was uh, written by uh, Max Weber, who was a European Social Democrat. Um, and I'd be very disappointed if any of those opposite on the other benches haven't heard of Max Weber, um, a, a very famous German Social Democrat. And he, wrote, uh, he wrote an essay called Politics as a Vocation, which was published in 1919. Uh, and this is the last paragraph. And this is what we've got to keep in mind when we're dealing with these sorts of issues, in my view. Politics is a strong and slow boring of hard boards. End quote. <laughs> now he's not saying you're disinterested in my speech. He's saying it's the slow, slow, strong and slow boring, as in drilling through hard boards. And it go he goes on. It takes both passion and perspective. Certainly all historical experience confirms the truth that a person would not have attained the possible unless time and time again he had reached out for the impossible. So, end quote. so maybe is it impossible? Is it impossible that we will actually get a regulation or a bill presented to the Senate which doesn't trigger a fundamental scrutiny concern? Is it possible? that our words will actually be heard somewhere in the depths of the bureaucracy, that again and again we get legislation which is infested, infested with exemptions from disallowance, with inappropriate discretionary powers and with a lack of checks and balances on the executive. We can only hope and we can only seek guidance from those such as Max Weber in terms of his encouragement to keep on boring. Thank you, Senator Scott. Um, Senator Ciccone. Oh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Some very wise words there by Senator Scar. I'm sure Senator Carr would have been very proud of what you had to say tonight, given his uh, long-standing contribution on such matters. But on that, um, mm -hmm. on a different note, um, Acting Deputy President, oh, I wanted to present a report. Report, or um, are you speaking to the, the previous one? I, I present the report of the legal and constitutional. Sorry, well, I need to put the question oh, first. Go for it. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the motion put by the Senator. Those who agree say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, I present the report of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee on the National Emergency 2022 New South Wales Floods Declaration of 2022. Together with the accompanying documents, I move that the Senate take note of the report. So the question is that the Senate take note of the motion put by the Senator. Those who agree say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Committee, I was just going to make a few comments in, in the relation to the report. Um, can I compliment uh, Senator Green? Uh, in relation to her chairing of uh, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Uh, there are serious issues of scrutiny in relation to uh, the National Emergency Declaration Act 2020, in relation to uh, issues relating to 
temporal proportionality with respect to declarations of emergency, the scope and proportionality of ministerial determinations, uh, and a number of other matters. Those are detailed in the report. There was a previous committee report in relation to this legislation where comments were made uh, by members of the Labor Party, then in opposition the Greens uh, and also coalition members. I've spoken um, about these issues quite widely. Senator Ciccone referred to Senator Carr, uh, and Senator Carr and I were of exactly the same mind in relation to these issues that any legislation dealing with declarations of emergency needs to be carefully uh, considered and have appropriate checks and balances, and that includes oversight of executive determinations. And this place, the Senate, also has a role um, of oversight in that regard. So I really wholeheartedly uh, support this uh, report and compliment uh, all the members of the committee with respect to their diligence in relation to its preparation. Thank you, Senator Scar. Are there any ministerial statements? Uh, Senator Chisholm. Uh, I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning budget process operational rules and the National Reconstruction Fund. Uh, are there any? There are no committee memberships. Uh, move to messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the private health insurance legislation amendment, medical device and human tissue product list and cost recovery bill 2022 and two related bills for concurrence. Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and now be read a first time. So the question is that the bill be read a first time. Those who agree say aye. Those who against say no. I believe the ayes have it. Clark. Private health insurance legislation amendment, medical device and human tissue product list and cost recovery bill 2022 and two related bills. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansart. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, I move that the debate now be adjourned. So I put the question that the uh, debate now be adjourned. Those who agree say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, we're now moving to business of the Senate. Notice of motion. I call on the clerk. Business of the Senate. Notice of motion number seven. Standing in the name of Senator Lambie. Disallowance of the superannuation industry supervision amendment. Annual members meetings notices regulations 2022. Senator Coney. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I draw to your attention the state of the chamber. Quorum. Please call quorum.
All present. Senator Lambie. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I'd also like, to, if I can, to add um, Nick McKinn to the motion to co sponsor, please. Do you I, leave? It's okay, yes. Um, Acting Deputy President, I move the motion. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. The last time the Senate considered a motion to disallow these regulations, the Greens did not support that motion. As we said at the time, this was not to be interpreted as the Greens endorsing the new government's regulations. Our view is, and was at the time, the previous government's regulations are no good, but the new government's regulations are not much better. In particular, neither the previous government's regulations or the new government's regulations include dividends or other flows of money for profit within the scope of reportable transactions. Now, from the outset, the Greens have stepped back and asked this. What would be most useful for superannuation transparency? We spoke to super funds. We spoke to consumer groups. We've asked questions of regulators. We've been constructive and we've done the heavy lifting on this issue. And really, we've done the government's job for them. Because the minister didn't do much of a job of explaining the shortcomings of the old regulations when he sought to strike them out. And he didn't propose a solution that put the issue to bed, which left plenty of room for the opposition to attack. And it also left plenty of room for Senator Pocock, who, I have to say slightly disappointingly, took context-free numbers out of annual reports to try and wedge the Greens, which actually had the effect of highlighting the problem with a binary choice between the old regulations and the new regulations. To date, the debate about this issue has been superficial and at a volume far in excess of its importance. So yes, let's have superannuation transparency and Let's get it right. But to say that disallowing these regulations would be a big win for transparency, as Senator David Pocock has today, is just not right. We're not going to resolve these issues here today, even though the solution is actually very straightforward. We need an annual super transparency report. It needs to be published by the regulator APRA, it needs to include tables of all the relevant expenditure, including for political purposes and for profit, for all super funds in the one place, so consumers of superannuation products can make comparisons across funds and so that other people, including journalists, can easily make those comparisons. In good faith, the Greens have given the minister the time to put in place this proper solution, while this disallowance motion and a motion tabled by the Greens remained on the notice paper. But I'm here today to say that the time is up and the minister hasn't sorted this issue out. We haven't seen new regulations that would provide a holistic, a holistic fix. Instead, what I have is the minister's word that he intends to do so. Which brings me 
to another issue. As we all know, as we all know, late last year the minister reached an agreement with the Greens to include within the financial accountability regime fines for executives who breach their accountability <coughs> obligations. We had an agreement that that occur. But within 24 hours of that agreement being made public, the minister reneged. After a day of very overt and, I have to say, shameless lobbying by the banks, the minister went back on his word. So I say to the minister today that there needs to be consequences for this. If the government expects the Greens to be reasonable, then the government needs to demonstrate that we can work with them in good faith. And they need to do better than just roll over to the banks. Last week we found out that the major banks donated over $400,000 to the Labor Party during an election year. When the minister folded on including million dollar fines for dodgy bankers into a bill that was supposed to be all about stopping bankers who get paid millions of dollars from being dodgy, that was the banks calling in a favour ode. It was institutionalised bribery, but it was out in plain view, out in the open, for the whole world to see. And that's the way the banks wanted it. They wanted to send a message to this parliament that actually they are running the show in here, not the democratically elected senators. It was a shameless and overt display of power that was designed specifically to send a direct message to this parliament, in particular to the MPs who are members of a party once led by Ben Chifley. The message to Labor MPs from the banks was this. If you're thinking about curbing bankers' power or tilting the scales in favour of consumers, then think again, because we, the banks, have you, the Labor Party, on a very short leash. So this is the question that I now put to the minister and the government. What is more important, donations from the banks and doing as instructed by the banks on one hand or doing the right thing by the Australian public and consumers of banking products on the other hand? Because if the government wants to be confident of the Greens' vote and support on matters like this in this place, then the government will need to do better than be patsies for the banks. And the government will need to make it very clear and demonstrate that we can work with the government in good faith. And in case anything I haven't said, in case anything I've said is unclear, I'll finish with this. The way that I would suggest that the government and the minister can demonstrate that they can work with the Greens in good faith is to come good on what they already agreed to, which is to include million dollar fines for dodgy bankers in the financial accountability regime. The Greens will be supporting this disallowance motion. Senator Bragg. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, I'm pleased to be able to make a brief contribution here on this important matter. Um, of course, this all predates this parliament and it goes back to the last parliament when the former government sought to enact laws that would make the super funds work in the interest of their workers and the members rather than work for their vested interests which own the trusts. And of course, that has been necessary because the funds collect over $30 billion a year in fees. They are guaranteed to get this money. They open the door, the money falls in, they take the high fees. And one of the things that they have done over the long term has been to pilfer and find other ways of transferring monies into their favourite related parties. Now, if you're a bank fund, you find ways to send money to the bank. If you're a industry fund, you find ways to send money off to your favourite employer group or your favourite union. And the reason that we enacted a regulation after we passed the enabling law, which was opposed by the Labor Party, opposed by the Labor Party, 
um, couldn't bring themselves to vote for a structural reform which would have made the funds work for the workers. Um, the regulation required that all these funds would have to disclose all of their related party payments. Now, um, perfectly reasonable, no consumer group unhappy. I can't find any third party that's unhappy with that level of transparency. But of course, the first order of business for the new minister in the government for vested interests, Mr Stephen Jones, is to remove that transparency by making a regulation late on a Friday afternoon back in uh, September. Now, of course, this followed an exposure draft of an identical regulation. Senator Bragg, I have Senator Ciccone on his feet. President, um, look, forgive me if I misunderstood, but I thought that the, um, the honourable senator referred to the minister by his incorrect title, and I asked that uh, he referred to the minister by his correct title. I will ask the senator to do so. I will certainly. So, of course, this follows uh, an exposure draft regulation. <laughs> there was an exposure draft. There was an exposure regulation that was provided for comment in July. Uh, so, this is the first act of this new minister after having won the election. And that regulation uh, proposed to gut the transparency, to remove the transparency so workers could no longer see when their funds were sending money off to the union or the bank. And uh, so they had a consultation. Uh, the FOIs revealed that they only had a very targeted consultation with one organisation, uh, the Industry Funds Association. And then, of course, they come back in September and make the regulation. And the substantial change in this regulation is very simple. Before, before this regulation was made, you could look at your annual member statement and you could see that this super fund had paid X dollars to X union. So you could see that uh, the first super fund had paid $1 million to the CFMEU. But that was all removed by, Mr. by Minister Jones's uh, regulation. Now, then you fast forward through a lot of extensive discussion, uh, led by the crossbench in many, many ways, um, and we get to last week, and the Electoral Commission comes along, and they decide they will, will release their annual data. And in that release, uh, they provide the information that Minister Jones has covered up from the workers. So the AEC shows uh, the enormous flow of money from the super funds to the unions—$14, $15 million a year, ballooning to $30 million by the end of the decade—$30 million of retirement savings being sent off to the unions for non-commercial purposes, uh, unknown purposes. Uh, very, very troubling. Now, in this fantastic release of data from the Electoral Commission, we find that one fund in particular has been very generous in its payments, and that fund is called First Super. It's rather a small fund, and they, in the last financial year, provided a payment of $2.5 million to the CFMEU, a tiny fund sending that money off to that union. Now, we only know that information because of the AEC. Surely this information is of great interest to the public. I have to say I'd be very surprised if many members of the public trawl through the AEC disclosures. But I'm certain that many members, many workers, will be very interested and would actually open their member's statement that they receive in the mail each year. So I don't want to detain the Senate for too long, but the substantial points are that we enacted a set of laws and regulations which guaranteed that workers could see where their superannuation money was going because it's a compulsory scheme and it's the least we can do. The Labor government came in, the government for vested interests, and they worked through the list of grievances and rubbish that had been churned out by their favourite vested interests at the class action law firms and the unions and the super funds. And order number one was to gut the transparency from the super laws. And that's what Minister Jones did. He put it out as an exposure draft. He made no changes, and then he made the regulation in September. And then, of course, last week the AEC made an absolute mess of the minister's policy by showing that this very significant sum of money would be disclosed elsewhere. So here we are back at the Senate, and before finishing, 
uh, I just wanted to say that I think the crossbench have done a really great job here uh, in putting this forward. Um, Senator Lambie, Senator Pocock in particular, but also Senator McKim uh, have all played a really constructive role. And it's, it's kind of unbelievable that this has taken so long uh, for the Senate to stand up for transparency uh, in a system that this parliament has put in place. These, this system only exists because of Canberra. We force 10 per cent of people's wages and salaries into these schemes. The least we can do is show these people where their money is going, and I very much welcome the, uh, the impending division on this matter. Thank you very much. Senator Pocock. David. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you to Senator Lambie and Senator McKim for uh, lodging this disallowance. Uh, it's regrettable that it's taken so long to come to a vote. It would have been much better for uh, everyone who has superannuation, which is most, uh, most people in Australia, had this happened before the um, member statements were due last year. We would have been able to see where all this money went, as Senator Bragg pointed out. But we finally got there. Senator McKim uh, has ummed and ahed for a while and is finally uh, wanting to send the government back to the drawing board to put transparency at the core of superannuation uh, disclosures. Members absolutely have a right to know where their money is going, how their funds are spending their money. And after this disallowance, I encourage the Assistant um, Treasurer to ensure that any new regulations do just that, because Australians, as we've heard today from, from all sides of, this, um, of the Senate, Australians want more transparency. They are demanding more transparency, and it's on us to ensure that the government delivers that. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Senator Scott. <laughs> it's been a long day, Senator Scott. <laughs> oh, I'll accept that. Uh, I'll now give a speech. You'll never be able to forget my name again. You always do, Senator Scott. <laughs> I would, uh, at the outset, uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, I really want to convey uh, my regard uh, for the work that Senator Pocock, Senator Lambie uh, and Senator McKim have done with respect to this matter. This is, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. This is what we're meant to be here for. This is what we're meant to be here for. It's good stuff, um, and it's a really positive note uh, to end uh, what has been a lengthy day uh, of, uh, of proceedings. Um, I'll just make two other quick points. Um, first, for goodness sake, government, if you're going to do something like this, introduce a regulation like this, don't insult our intelligence. Don't insult our intelligence. The most flimsy arguments were put up by the government to support this regulation. The cost of compliance. Can I tell you, as, a, as someone who served as a company secretary of an ASX company for 12 years, uh, the argument about the cost of compliance imposed on, on multi-billion dollar organisations that have, that have actual obligations to keep accounts, to keep records, was one of the flimsiest arguments I've seen to, be, to put forward to defeat the, the principle of transparency, that the members have a right to know. The members have a right to know where their money is going. The members have a right to know where their money is going, because after all, it is their money. It is their money. So one dearly hopes that a lesson has been learned from this debacle, from the government's perspective, and, and we won't see a repeat. The only other point I want to make is, once again, to put on the record, as I've done, as I've previously done in this place, that when Senator McKim came into this place and said he believed, in his view, a deal had been done, I took that on face value. I took that on face value. And uh, hopefully uh, those in government uh, might reflect uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the results of what has unfolded uh, from this uh, what can only be described as, 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 as a debacle, to be frank. Um, it is a shame it's taken this long to get to this stage, but it's good we got here. And congratulations 
Senator Lambie. Um, congratulations, Senator Pocock, and congratulations, Senator McKim. This is a good result. This is good stuff. Thank you very much, Senator Scar. Senator Smith. Just very, very briefly, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to echo the sentiments of my coalition Senate colleagues and just uh, recognise, like others, that this is an example of the Senate operating at its best. Non government senators working across the chamber to bring integrity and bring transparency when the government chooses not to. And just to reflect on Senator Carr's remark, I can't help but think no. about that Scar's <laughs> remark. Uh, there are a lot of big personalities in the Senate, um, in the 46th Parliament and in the 47th, but I reflect on that wonderful quote from Edmund Burke, who said that sometimes our patience will achieve more than our force. So I would just like to reiterate that you know, the Albanese Labor government tried to reverse a requirement for super funds to disclose how they spend super members' funds on sponsorships and payments. No line items, no transparency no accountability. These payments from super are for the things such as million-dollar footy sponsorships, corporate boxes, union kickbacks and lobbying. Australians deserve to know how their retirement savings are being spent. The changes that the government wanted to pursue go against recommendations from the Productivity Commission and the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority. If we do want to have a serious conversation about transparency for a $3 trillion industry, it shouldn't start with supporting the winding back of measures designed to let the sunlight in. All of those senators that have been elected on a platform of integrity must support this disallowance. Where I started, it is great to see non-government senators being able to work in such a cooperative manner to bring real benefits to Australians. With that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, if there being no other senators who want to contribute to this motion, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. All of those opinions say aye. Aye. Those against say no. Oh, Senator McCarthy. Sorry, um, just been a swap over of our front bench here, but I do believe the the government has to respond. Um, so I've just. Yes. got a few words to say Minister. on behalf of the government. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Albanese government is committed to delivering accountability, transparency and good governance in every part of our financial system. And these regulations clean up red tape to ensure that members can access meaningful, useful information about how their money is being spent, not pages and pages of minutiae. We remain committed to working with senators and members to improve reporting so that members have better insights into their retirement savings. In addition to these regulations, the government will deliver an annual superannuation transparency report to hold trustees to account. Furthermore, we have legislation before the parliament to require superannuation entities to prepare and lodge annual financial reports with ASIC, aligning their reporting obligations with publicly listed companies and registered schemes. The regulations introduced by the previous government were an ideologically motivated make-work exercise and did nothing to improve the outcomes of super members. Thank you, Minister. And the question now is that the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. All of those that, that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, if, as the division is required and it's past 6.30, uh, the division will be held tomorrow. Uh, we now proceed back to government business. Clark. Government business order of the day, Migration Amendment, Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023, in Committee of the Whole. The committee is considering the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023, and the question is that the bill stand as printed. I call Senator. Is any Senator wants to speak on that, Minister? Okay. 
Um, the, have we got a minute? Um, so Senator Lambie might be seeking her amendments. Senator Lambie, are you seeking the call to move your amendments? Oh, yes, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Are you seeking leave to move them together, Senator Lambie? Um, I, uh, no, I've just got the one acting. Deputy, Madam Acting Deputy Perry, is it present? For me at the moment, um, amendments one to three on sheet 1810. And um, I understood you're going to seek leave I do. to move them together. So yeah, you're seeking I leave? I am seeking leave, thank you, Madam is President. Is leave granted? Sorry, no problem. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I, I move to uh, move um, one to three on sheet eight one zero. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I leave. Uh, I move the amendments. Uh, the motion is that the amendments be agreed to, Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President, uh, and thank you, Senator Lambie, uh, for um, talking to us about these amendments. We note your amendments, but we, the government will not be supporting them. Uh, the Albanese government is taking a common sense approach to visa cancellations, placing a priority on keeping the Australian people safe. This is a reasoned approach that appropriately deals with cancellation considerations for those who have lived almost their entire lives in Australia, uh, which for some includes their formative years. The department will now also, importantly, consider the impact that a visa cancellation may have on children in Australia and the limited connection that some may have to their country of citizenship. Where individuals pose a significant risk to the community, the Australian government will continue to cancel their visas and remove them. What we are looking at now is a common sense approach for dealing with cancellation considerations for those who have lived almost their entire lives in Australia and have limited connection to their country of citizenship. The new New Zealand Prime Minister uh, Mr Hipkins has praised the Australian government for prioritising a common sense approach. As I've said previously, the Australian community has a reasonable expectation that non-citizens who seek to enter or remain in Australia are of good character and are law-abiding. Similarly, they expect any non-citizens who are not of good character to be refused a visa or have any visa they hold cancelled. This bill does not change the framework within which the character test operates. Uh, many of the other points I was going to make I've made already, so for those reasons we will be opposing the amendments moved by Senator Lambie and Tyrrell. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith? No? Senator Lambie? Madam Deputy President, um, I just want to uh, make it quite clear that uh, for those that are not quite sure what our amendment is, that our amendment makes an ex exception for New Zealanders who have a special category, category visa, anyone with a special category visa will not be subject to visa cancellation under this amended power. The minister says this is a simple bill, and so is this amendment. I said it before, we need to protect our Anzacs. The minister said earlier that New Zealanders living in this country can get their visas cancelled on character grounds. He said they have an option to appeal a decision. How long do they get before they're deported? How do they get access to a lawyer? Why should they be cancelled at all? What if they were brought here as a kid and have lived here the last 30 years? They're not technically our citizens, but they didn't become criminals under New Zealand's watch. It was ours. We have a special bond with New Zealand, and that's already recognised in our Migration Act. And we should also treat our New Zealand neighbour with respect. The government talks up how we shouldn't worry about this bill, just returns things to how it used to be. But how things used to be was pretty ordinary. And now is a chance to not just take things back to how they used to be, but to make them better than before. That's why we why we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do here. After all, if we can make something better, we do that. And if it means that we can have better diplomatic relations, especially with our ANZAC counterparts, we need to move heaven and earth to make sure that remains. New Zealanders on a subclass 4-4 visa are often Australians in every. Uh, are often Australians in every way except their citizenship status. They're part of our community, they've lived here their whole lives, and now they're at risk of being sent to a country that they don't know from a bar of soap. This amendment to the bill stops that from happening. It's just common sense and it's good political relations with our New Zealander counterparts. Thank you, Senator Lambie. 
If there are no further speakers to Senator Lambie's amendment, uh, I'll put that amendment. And all those in favour, I say aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, as a division is required, that motion will come forward for a division tomorrow. Uh, now can I move to the Australian Greens amendment? Senator Pocock, are you moving that? I think I need to draw the um, uh, are you Sorry, can I draw your attention to the uh, state of the chamber? A quorum required. A quorum is required. Ring the bells for four minutes. The question now is the Australian Greens Amendment uh, 1 on sheet Okay, quorum uh, is present. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Chair. I appreciate uh, uh, the assistance of the Senate. Um, <clears throat> I move uh, the amendment. Hang on, sorry, Senator McKim. Oh. There's uh, a lot of noise in the chamber. <laughs> you have ten minutes. Uh, ten minutes to wait for funds. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. I move um, the amendment standing in the name, in my name, and the name of the Australian Greens on sheet 1809. Uh, this amendment will ensure children and people who, for all intents and purposes, are Australian, cannot have their visas cancelled on character grounds. This amendment will achieve this aim by legislating that no one who has either lived in Australia for more than 10 years was under the age of 10 when they migrated to Australia, arrived in Australia before the age of 10 or was under the age of 18 when they offended, can have their visa cancelled on character grounds. These new laws have led to thousands of people, over 6,500 since the Migration Amendment Character and General Visa Cancellation Bill 2014 was enacted, uh, many who have lived most of their lives in Australia having their visas cancelled. And they have often been cancelled for minor offences like drink driving and after they have paid the penalty for, uh, for those offences imposed by the courts. These people often uh, have histories of trauma, uh, of disability. They are often refugees or stateless people. They are then uh, sent either into detention or to countries they do not know and where they have no family or social support networks. These are punishments for entire families sometimes that are unjust, that don't fit the crime and, frankly, are un-Australian. 
The character test laws have seen a disproportionate amount of New Zealanders deported from Australia. Close to 3,000 New Zealanders have been deported on character grounds within the last decade, when former Immigration Minister, now Opposition Leader Mr Dutton, significantly broadened the scope of the character test under Section 501 and introduced mandatory visa cancellations under Section 5013A. This is well over a third—in fact, it's nearly a half—of all Section 501 deportations are back to New Zealand. Up until 1998, when the Howard government introduced a character test into Section 501 of the Migration Act, any migrant who had spent 10 years in Australia or more was protected from deportation. A similar system that recognises time spent living in the country still operates to this very day in New Zealand. As New Zealand Prime Minister Ms Ardern, or I should say former New Zealand Prime Minister Ms Ardern, told former Prime Minister Morrison during her trip to Australia in 2019, while expressing what she described as her concern and disappointment with Australia's visa cancellations policy, and I'll quote from Ms O'Dern, we have seen cases where there is almost no connection of an individual to New Zealand who have been deported. There are some examples that will not make any sense to a fair-minded person. I consider that to be a corrosive part of that policy, and it's having a corrosive effect on our relationship. Colleagues, let's be clear about this. This is having a corrosive effect on Australia's relationship with New Zealand. New Zealand shares many, many cultural attributes with Australia. Many Australians would describe uh, New Zealand as uh, a sibling country to Australia, and yet, according to Ms Ardern, these matters are having a corrosive effect on our relationship. Prime Minister Ardern finished her comments with a request, with a request for Australia to, and I quote, send back Kiwis, genuine Kiwis, but do not deport your people and your problems. With this amendment, that is exactly what we are attempting to achieve, and we call on the government to support it. Uh, thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Greens have moved a series of amendments that have previously been moved to this bill. The Australian community, as I've said throughout this debate, has a reasonable expectation that non-citizens who seek to enter or remain in Australia are of good character and are law-abiding. Similarly, they expect any non-citizens who are not of good character to be refused a visa or have any visa they hold cancelled. This bill does not change the framework within which the character test operates. It allows for the continued effective administration of the powers in the Migration Act by ensuring aggregate sentences are considered sentences, thereby restoring the ability to rely on substantial criminal record as an objective measure for the purpose of the character test. This government is taking urgent, common-sense action in order to keep our community safe. We're not here to debate the broader character framework. We're here to clarify the powers in the Migration Act. And for those reasons, the government will be opposing the amendments moved by the Greens. Thank you, Minister. Are there any other speakers on this amendment? Uh, that being the case, the, uh, motion the, the motion is that the amendment uh, by the Australian Greens on sheet uh, 1809 be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I seek leave to move uh, Amendment 1 on sheet 1811 circulated in the chamber. Uh, thank you, Senator Pope. Leave is not uh, required, so you can move, uh, go straight to moving the amendment. Whilst I ag agree with uh, what the minister is saying about the expectation of Australians, I do think that in this uh, debate we need to be able to talk about getting that balance right, because you know, re reading this. Uh, legislation 
wholeheartedly agree, heartedly agree that the Australian community should be protected from people who have committed serious crimes. But when we're dealing with a person who is a refugee or a stateless person, they don't have anywhere else to go. They, they've got nowhere else to go. And indefinite immigration detention seems like a very heavy penalty for a crime that carries a 12-month sentence. Uh, does the government have a plan to make sure that we aren't locking people up for years and years? You know, should their sentence come to come to 12 months? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, as I think you're aware, the government notes your amendments but will not be supporting them. Uh, I understand uh, Minister Giles' office has uh, had some engagement with you about these issues already, and Minister Giles is certainly happy to engage with you separately on this bill as to how Australia can meet our international obligations in the way that you're seeking while maintaining the safety of the community. Um, as I've said a number of times, this bill doesn't change the framework within which the character test operates, uh, and it really is a matter of uh, clarifying powers which were always believed to exist in the Migration Act until that recent court decision. But happy to have some further engagement with you about this. Senator Pocock. Okay. Uh, there being no other speakers uh, for S Senator Pocock's amendment on sheet uh, 1811. The motion is that the amendment be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Uh, it being after 6.30, the division will be held tomorrow. Uh, it being almost 7.30 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. It being 7.30 p.m., the committee reports progress. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. And of course, Senator Farrell. Thank you. Somebody else can yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Madam uh, President, uh, I rise tonight with a very heavy heart to pay tribute to um, a very beautiful woman, Nessa Delaney. Nessa was the wife of the former Irish ambassador to Australia and New Zealand, Mr Noel White, uh, who was in that role from 2012 until 2016. And I'd like to acknowledge the, present of the presence of the current Irish uh, ambassador, Mr Tim uh, Moore, and his uh, wife Trish, uh, here tonight to pay their respects to, uh, to uh, Nessa Delaney. Sadly, Nessa passed away on uh, Sunday, the 30th of October, 1922, at uh, Dublin's Black Rock uh, Clinic, at the age of 58, after a very long battle with cancer. In his eul eulogy at her funeral mass uh, in Ireland, Noel told the congregation that Nessa favoured brevity in public speaking and I'll do my best to live up to her standards. Nessa's own extremely impressive career including, included time as a senior official in the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, serving in Dublin, Ottawa and Paris. She also served for, for many years in a senior capacity at the uh, EU Council of Ministers in Brussels. And I recall a terrific visit with Nessa and Noel in Brussels. We stayed at the Irish Embassy and were given a personal tour of the site of the Battle of Waterloo uh, before a wander through the magnificent uh, chocolate shops in Brussels with her and Noel. At her funeral in Ireland recently, Noel spoke of the many tributes to Nessa that poured in from around the world. Many of those tributes to which uh, he referred came from here in Australia, and rightly so. Listening to Senator O'Neill's tribute to Nessa last night, I was reminded that Australia has benefited over the years from the enormous contribution uh, to the nation from Irish people, particularly Irish women. Nessa Delaney embodied that tradition. 
It's no surprise that Nessa shared a friendship based on mutual respect with another great Australian, fiercely proud of her own Irish uh, heritage and well known in this par uh, parliament, our friend and former colleague, the late Susan Ryan. Nessa Delaney engaged with this country, its history, its landscape, arts and its culture. She was curious about Australia and fascinated by it. Nessa loved its people, its cultural and artistic heritage and the natural environment. She revelled uh, in what she once described as the shimmering emptiness of the Hay Plains, as she and her family, husband and three boys and a dog, undertook the long road trip uh, from the ACT to South Australia. Nessa loves South Australia and in the past my wife and I uh, were very pleased to host Nessa and Noel at our vineyard in the Clare Valley, of course named after that famous Irish county. Nessa was particularly inspired by our Jesuit neighbours in the uh, Seven Hill Monastery um, and the deeply spiritual Wycott Cottage where Mother Mary MacKillop, uh, Australia's only saint, once resided. Nessa was a loving and much loved wife and mother and during a recent trip to Europe I was able to offer my condolences in person to Noel and the boys, Daniel, Joseph and Patrick. It's also appropriate that we pay tribute in this place that we acknowledge her contribution to Australia and to Ireland's relations with Australia. We are deeply saddened by Nessa Delaney's untimely departure from this life. Her death has deprived her family of a loving wife and mother. It has deprived Ireland and Europe of a dedicated public servant and of Australia of a great friend. I offer my deepest condolences to Nessa's extended family, especially her sister-in-law, sister Mary White, who is an intensivist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and her family, as well as all of, all of Nessa's friends and all of those who knew her. May she now rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, uh, thank you President. Uh, towards the end of last year, I welcomed the opportunity to join the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong, the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Mr Conroy, uh, the Shadow Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Mr McCormack, on a bipartisan delegation to the Pacific. In international affairs, Australia is at its strongest when we speak with one voice, and the bipartisan delegation to three Pacific Island nations was a tangible demonstration that Australia's friendship with Pacific Island nations transcends domestic politics. We visited Vanuatu, the Federated States of Micronesia and Palau. It was the first bipartisan visit to Pacific Island countries since 2019 when such visits uh, were disrupted, particularly by COVID, uh, and I welcome very much the resumption of those visits. And I acknowledge and thank uh, Senator Wong for the invitation to participate in it. A place on record, particularly the thanks to all of the leaders, political, traditional and community, who we met with during our visit. I particularly acknowledge the work of leaders across nations for their partnership across the Pacific Islands and note that that partnership is continuing to yield more dividends and success with their individual and collective efforts, helping in part to secure the return to Kiribati to the Pacific Islands Forum, which occurred shortly after our visit uh, and has been, I know, an effort of many Pacific Island leaders. As we all know, our region faces increased geostrategic pressure and a united Pacific Island Forum and family of nations is crucial to ensuring stability within our region and the resilience to withstand other pressures. It was particularly pleasing to be in Vanuatu for the signing of the bilateral security agreement, the culmination of work which was instigated during the Prime Ministership of Mr Turnbull in 2018. The agreement signed by Prime Minister Kausakao of Vanuatu and Minister Wong reaffirms Vanuatu's commitment to Australia as its principal security partner. Our delegation participated in activities reflecting our deep partnership with Vanuatu from contributing to environmental rehabilitation with mangrove plantings, opening of a renewed wharf and inspecting a new police vessel, and discussing Pacific labour mobility in Vanuatu's largest village, Melee, we had also the honour of meeting Gloria Julia King, a new member of Vanuatu's parliament, the first woman elected in 14 years, and she is doing incredible work and in providing new, thoughtful, powerful and, I hope, inspiring leadership for many other women to follow in her footsteps in Vanuatu and elsewhere across the Pacific. In the Federated States of Micronesia, we marked 35 years of diplomatic relations between our countries. 
and our engagement with President Panuelo highlighted how he is a key leader with a strong commitment to the security and stability of the Pacific. It was a delight to see also Australia's education and health projects changing lives for the better at the Omaini Elementary School, where our delegation was given a maths lesson by some of the students. In Palau, Minister Wong and I were present for the official launch of a new e-health system being provided with Australian support, along with visiting the massive construction of a solar farm supported by the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific. These were practical demonstrations of Australia's friendship and commitment to Palau, and I thank President Whips and his ministers for their generosity with their time with our delegation. Last month, I visited Papua New Guinea as part of a separate cross-parliamentary delegation, visiting Port Moresby and nearby towns of Kariva, Korea and Pari, as well as Garoka and Asaro. Australia is PNG's largest trade and investment partner, while also being the largest destination for Australian development assistance. As the closest of neighbours and the deepest of partners, this visit was an invaluable opportunity, my first as Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, to better understand the relationship between our nations and how we can secure the best outcomes for our work together. I particularly thank the Pacific Friends of Global Health and Save the Children for their support in undertaking this visit. Our delegation's engagement spanned issues across maternal health, family and sexual violence, water safety and the prevention and treatment of tuberculosis, malaria and HIV. I pay tribute to the health and community workers whose constant and tireless efforts are making a difference, but equally I acknowledge that there is a need for continued support, continued vigilance, new effort and programs to ensure the effectiveness of programs that can and will save the lives especially uh, of children and women across Papua New Guinea and help to lift their development standards and progress. My previous visit to Papua New Guinea had been as Trade Minister and it was a very welcome opportunity on this visit to engage with Papua New Guinea's newish Foreign Minister, their Deputy Prime Minister and other senior leaders and to discuss other aspects of our economic and security ties. The Pacific is a region we share and together we all play an important role in its security and prosperity. I thank those who helped facilitate these visits and on behalf of the opposition pledge our continued friendship and support to all Pacific Island nations. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Grogan. Uh, thank you, President. Um, I rise this evening to mark a momentous point in South Australia's history. With my great state set to become the first Australian jurisdiction with a First Nations voice to Parliament. The Malinousis Labor government this week introduced the First Nations Voice Bill 2023, and I am deeply proud to be a South Australian and see that occur. This bill has been the result of years, years of hard work and advocacy by the Indigenous community of South Australia and including my good friend Kaya Ma, who is the Attorney General and the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, who has worked tirelessly to progress the issues around truth, treaty and voice for over 20 years. This South Australian bill presents a major step forward in acknowledging and recognising the unique and important place that First Nations people have in our society. Policies and services for First Nations people and communities will only ever work and will only ever give us the outcomes that we require when those First Nations people have a say in those matters. The introduction of this bill is not only significant for First Nations people, it, but it is for all of us, and it sends a powerful message to the rest of Australia and to the world. <clears throat> By taking this step, South Australia is setting that positive example for the rest of the country and showing that it's committed to creating a more inclusive and just society. As a nation, we have an opportunity to progress voice, treaty and truth simultaneously. All three require dedicated action, and there is no need to choose one over the other. This year, we will all have a choice across the whole of this country a choice to vote yes on the federal voice to parliament referendum, a powerful step towards reconciliation. It will be a clear statement that we as a nation are committed to acknowledging and addressing the injustices of the past and creating a more equal and inclusive future. Constitutional recognition through a voice to parliament, it's a body enshrined in the constitution, 
would enable First Nations people to have their voices heard and their perspectives considered in the decisions that affect their lives. And that has got to make a difference, a difference that we must see in how our society operates into the future. <clears throat> to quote my colleague Senator Dodson, why shouldn't First Nations people secure a formal structure through which it provides advice to the parliament and the government on matters which affect them? When you put it like that, it really does seem like a very simple and very essential question. And I ask, why shouldn't they? And what an honour it was on the weekend at the Chifley Conference to listen to Senator Dodson. His speech highlighted the progress of the Voice to Parliament referendum and the importance of the success in unifying the nation. And his lesson in history of the pathway to get to where we are today in terms of that recognition started in 1937. I would highly recommend anyone who gets the opportunity to read that speech. It's well worth a go. His powerful speech served as a reminder of the significance of the referendum and the need for Australians to respond generously to the Uluru Statement from the Heart requests. A successful referendum will signal a new and unifying era for Australia. For many, this has been a decades-long mission of reconciliation, and for all, it's been hundreds of years of injustice. With the continued struggles faced by First Nations communities, including poverty, high incarceration rates, child removals, it has never been more urgent than to take this critical step. I salute my South Australian Labor colleagues for the actions they've taken this week. To Kyam, to the Malinowskis government, each and every one of you, you are setting an example for the rest of the country. And it's time for the rest of Australia to see that this is doable, this is essential, and to get it done and follow. Let us work together towards reconciliation. Let us show the world that we are a nation that values inclusiveness and equality. And let us respond generously to the Uluru right, Statement from you, the Senator Heart. Senator Grogan, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Uh, just recently, Vaughan Gregory Johnson passed away, and I wanted to read the Vale to Vaughan as published by the Queensland Trucking Association on the 24th of January this year. On Sunday, the 22nd of January, we received the tragic news that a great friend and supporter of the road freight transport industry, Vaughan Johnson, OAM, had passed away. Vaughan was certainly a character and on occasions could be controversial but was authentic in every way and enjoyed many friendships across the parliament and Queensland generally. He was born on the 20th of July 1947 in Burke, New South Wales, but before long his family had moved to Quilpie, where he established his political career on the local council before winning the seat of Gregory in late 1989. Vaughan's first speech to parliament was on the 7th of March 1990, where from the outset he set out his purpose to represent the best interests of country and regional Queensland. When Rob Borbidge became Premier in 1996, Vaughan was appointed Minister for Transport and Main Roads on 26 February 1996, and he set about his ministerial task with great enthusiasm. A feature of his time as minister was the passage of legislation to adopt speed cameras in Queensland, which was assented to on 9 December 1996. Vaughan's leadership and enthusiasm in road safety paved the way to launch the very successful Campaign 300, along with the Fatal 4 message, which was a fully integrated campaign with the Queensland Police Service, media outlets, local government and many key stakeholders. These reforms had an extraordinary result for Queensland road safety as the road toll reduced from 385 in 1996 to 279 by 1998, the lowest toll in 35 years at the time. In June 1998, Vaughan returned to the backbench after the Borbidge government lost the election, and he undertook a number of roles over the years as the opposition spokesman in several different portfolios. 
other key achievements in his political career were being appointed the Deputy Leader of the Opposition from March 2001 to February 2003 and being the Government Whip during the Newman Government. He retired from the Queensland Parliament in 2015, and in 2020 he was awarded a medal of the Order of Australia and the Australia Day Honours List. And on a personal level and as an industry, we enjoyed a great friendship with Vaughan for almost 30 years. Many of us shared trips and social occasions where the subject was almost always centred around country Queensland. As a friend or as your boss, as a minister, or when briefing him on an industry issue, he was unfailingly respectful and principled in his approach. He was a diligent and committed supporter who always made himself available and did his best as a champion of the bush. His word was a bond he would not break, was great company, and he was as reliable as the sunrise to be persistent in any cause he pursued. What more could you ask for? We are deeply saddened and pass on our thoughts and condolences to his family. Now, on a personal note, uh, I knew Vaughan, and he was uh, a man of fierce loyalties, of exceptional courage, and he fought for his communities through his political career and later on. Uh, I considered him a friend. It was always a highlight to hear him speak. Uh, he would use fantastic expressions that are no longer uh, heard much. A like country so rich, if you planted a feather, it would grow a chook. Um, he had a handshake that would crush most, most men's hands and, uh, and just a terrific person. I recently spoke to Dick Wharton, who was the Director General of the Queensland Transport Department when Vaughan was the minister, and he said he was just a great bloke. Uh, he was determined to build an outcome. In this case, it was the M1. Uh, he worked on facts, not emotion, that he would fix problems, uh, he would um, ensure that the project was delivered for Queensland, but if somebody had a genuine concern, Vaughan would listen and fix that as well. Uh, there is also a rumour that abounds that the square Bundaberg rum was developed after feedback from Vaughan Johnson that the round ones would roll away from your swag. I don't know if that's true, but it is a mark of the kind of man that he was, that he was practical, he, was, uh, he persevered, uh, he was a great champion for the bush and at his service where his three children spoke so well, over a thousand people turned out to tribute a truly great Queenslander. Thank vale you, Senator Vaughan Johnson. Your time has expired. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. So today I rise to speak about government intervention in the housing market. Now, as senators, we are elected to improve the lives of every single Australian man, woman and child. Now, the pandemic housing bubble and subsequent loss-making construction boom are perfect examples of how government intervention, no matter how well-intentioned, ultimately make things a whole lot worse. Now, during 2020, our federal government panicked. It acted out of fear and decided to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at our economy. Now, their excessive and often unchecked spending was a reaction to pressure from both domestic and international forces who were united in their campaign to break every single rule in our tried and our tested pandemic handbook. Now, JobKeeper, JobSeeker, construction and renovation grants are key examples of the waste which total hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, the housing sector, obviously, was the immediate beneficiary. Combined grants provided by federal and state governments totaled up to $55,000 in some cases. Now, that's $55,000 of, of hard-earned taxpayer money just being gifted to a select few people. Now, anyone, anyone with a basic understanding of economics knows that handing out large sums of money will destabilise and it will manipulate the market. That's obvious. Now, to make matters worse, many of these grants were conditional upon recipients borrowing an, ex an excessive amount of extra money from their lenders at a time of record low interest rates. Now, the government effectively used the Australian people as pawns, that's what they did, as pawns, to bail out our economy in the very short term. Now, fast forward a few months and we begin to see both land and build costs skyrocket. A year later, 
we saw massive workforce shortages, and two years later we saw unchecked inflation leading to a construction sector overwhelmed with work and going baroque due to combined inflationary pressures, materials and worker shortages. Now, these issues have been created not by the pandemic but by the, the former government's unnatural, uh, unnatural reaction to the pandemic. Now, the United Australia Party, we took to the election a platform of lower taxes, lower government debt, a focus which should, if I'm honest, be bipartisan in our, demo in our democratic nation. Our fiscal policies were based on the known macroeconomic consequences of government debt accumulation. Empirical evidence shows that a more sustained public debt accumulation will lead to long-term interest rate rises. Never again can our country run up such an irresponsible amount of debt like the former government did. Now, we know that it is our children and our children's children who will be left to service this debt, and by then the cost of these funds will almost certainly be more expensive, which will lead to higher tax rates just to pay the bill on the interest. Now, our states also have their thinking upside down. Now, in my home state of Victoria, developers are going to be hit with a windfall gains tax, a massive 62.5 per cent on all uh, property that is rezoned over $100,000. Now, none of these measures do anything to help struggling Aussies achieve, achieve a dream of home ownership. Now, every dollar that the government injects into the housing market manipulates the natural cycle. Every new tax imposed on builders, developers and investors reduces supply. The answer is actually very simple. Less stimulus, lower taxes. If governments remove, if governments remove financial barriers, the market will naturally provide adequate supply at a price acceptable to consumers. For too long, the focus has been on government incentivising the demand side of the equation with taxpayer money. It's time to focus on the supply side. Now, the most effective way, the most effective way to increase supply in the market is to reduce taxes, levies and duties which stand in the way of progress. Government dictates and socialist ideology will not solve our housing supply problem. Government must instead focus on bringing down barriers. Only then can the market meet demand. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babette. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9 a.m.